Introduction During the summer of 1877, a railroad appeared at the doorsteps of Tryon, North Carolina, and a business decision was made to extend the tracks up the mountains, which was referred to at the time as Melrose Mountain. Times were different back then, when decisions could be made in short order, and work would begin in earnest. Within six months, railroad men cut a 21-mile steep trench up the mountain and through the wilderness to Hendersonville. When the grade was completed, a rail system was used to bring coal down from Andover, Virginia, through Saluda, North Carolina, to Spartanburg, and then finally on to Belmont, North Carolina, where a Duke power plant was waiting. Most of the 620-mile round trip was considered routine, but the Saluda grade was far from it. Under safe and controllable speeds, the 14-mile stretch from Saluda down to Tryon could be done in around 20 minutes. But the ghosts of lost men that accommodated the now infamous points along the track might attest that their trip was much faster. The stretch of rail strengthened the definition of the word steep. In fact, the grade, which today is known as the Saluda grade, set a record for being the steepest standard gauge railroad track in the entire United States. It was so steep that several horrendous train wrecks described both human beings and livestock being driven into the earth with such force that it took days and even weeks to exhume their burnt and demolished remains. The trains which traveled the track were dreadfully long with some measuring more than a mile, pulling more than 13,000 tons of coal. The massive trains, armed with three lead engines, would crawl into Saluda Station, where they set their dynamic brake systems, checked the safety mechanisms, and said their prayers. A road foreman of engines from Hendersonville, dedicated to piloting the massive amount of machinery down the grade, would take over the controls and do whatever he could do to prevent a freewheeling ride into eternity. According to officials of the Southern Railway, Saluda was considered a train engineer's nightmare, where each train would struggle over a 1.4% upgrade and then contort each car one by one over an apex destined to a maximum 4.9% downgrade plunge. According to Norfolk Southern track officials, Rail cars were known to snap apart at the couplings as the men in the caboose watched in horror and radioed the road foreman a mile ahead with the bad news. Mother Nature created another railman's dare when torrential rains washed out an area of the track at the climax of an 11 degree curve, earning the danger name Sand Cut. It was not until enough lives were lost through this crude trial and error that Norfolk Southern finally installed expensive safety features. At first, the railroad employed full-time switchmen who were posted at runoff points to listen for blaring train horns, screaming for help as they charged out of control and down the grade. Signalmen manning the spurs would pull a switch just in time to keep the train from tumbling into doom. Later, high-tech CTC Signaling systems were installed, armed with automated timers and switching circuits. But even with advanced rail technology, train wrecks continued to occur until the mid-70s. Slaughter Pen Cut became a household name after a crash took the lives of more than 35 cattle and several men. The notorious location made railroad history when in 1903, at least two out-of-control trains entered the same curve at speeds between 60 and 100 miles an hour. Everyone from engineers, firemen, cattle, and hobos were demolished in the mangled wreckage. Today, the tracks sit dormant, with most of the railroad equipment covered in fabric, smashed, and weathered out of commission. The railroad was the lifeblood of Saluda, because without it, there probably wouldn't even be a town. The railroad was also the primary transportation route for the summer population who ventured in from hot climates elsewhere. For many years, a thriving pediatric hospital operated within the town of Saluda. 
the ozone-rich air was proven to have a medicinal effect on children who suffered from chronic lung problems. During the summer, there was also an onslaught of physicians who ventured in for educational conferences, relaxation, and, of course, square dancing. Between the summer vacationers, who were primarily female, and visiting physicians, the town's population tripled in size as the town locals became passive observers. Please note, this novel is a work of fiction. No reference to any real person, country, organization is intended or should be inferred. This is what I like about writing fiction. You can make things up. To square dancing. It was just good, honest fun. The Summer Girls by Kirk Goldzer Mother, Father, Me, and Him Prologue I'm not quite sure how to start. It was just so bizarre. But, well, here goes. I woke up to the sound of a car door closing. It was barely light, and I thought it was much too early for my father to be leaving for work. I lowered my feet to the floor, edged over to the window, and gazed down on the driveway below. A county police car was facing our house with only its parking lights on. I spotted my father speaking with two police officers, one in uniform and the other in a suit. I'm wondering if a neighbor had called in about an intruder, a thief or something. They finished their conversation and returned to their patrol car. Slowly the automobile backed out of the driveway and drove away. My father re-entered the house and all was quiet. I considered going back to bed, but something just was not right. Why would the county sheriff be here rather than Gudger Knowles, our local sheriff? If it were just a bunch of kids causing a disturbance, the county wouldn't be here. Gudger would. I left my room and quietly walked down the hallway to the top of the stairs. My father was standing by the window in the foyer, staring out. Is everything okay? I asked, breathing through the silence. He was in deep thought and said nothing. I paused for a moment in respect. What's going on? Is everything okay, Dad? Why were the police here? Come down here, son. We need to talk. He slowly sat down on the chair by the window and looked down at his hands. He appeared troubled, but strangely calm. Did something happen to one of the neighbors? He adjusted his robe, crossed his leg, and allowed a slipper on his right foot to dangle, just as he was allowing me to dangle as well. Well, that all depends on what neighbor you're referring to. He seemed clued into something, but taking his time and letting me know. Rainy Ray, he said, speaking through the darkness. Your mother is in a bit of trouble. Mom? What do you mean, trouble? Is she okay? Is she here? No, son, she's not. Well, where is she? What's going on? Rainy Ray, your mother's been arrested. What? For what? Are you kidding me? No, son, I'm afraid I'm not joking. Well, what for, then? What, what was she arrested for? Your mother was just arrested for the murder of Victor Rathers. That son of a bitch, I thought, reeling with frustration. They found his body down by the tracks at the bottom of the grade. It's a pretty gruesome sight. He must have really done something really wrong. Well, why do they think Mom did it? That sounds crazy. 
What was he doing at the bottom of the grade? Mom couldn't even get down there. That's what they're trying to figure out. Yep, that's going to be the order of the day, he said, standing up. I'm going to put on some coffee, and then we're going to go meet Uncle Bud at the police station up in Hendersonville. They want you to come up there with me too, Rainy Ray. Well, I expected that, I answered louder than I should have. My Uncle Bud was a criminal defense attorney who practiced in Asheville. Thinking about some of the cases he's handled told me that we were in for a big one. Go wash your face, son, and put on a nice shirt and a clean pair of pants, because it's going to be rough around here for a while. Chapter 1 My name is Rainy Ray Holford, and I was one of those Melrose boys. I was nine years old when I caught my first glimpse of the summer girl population invading our town of Melrose, North Carolina. It was as if they were falling out of the sky from some other planet invading our quiet community with a vengeance. The old folks used to say, there's plenty to go around there, boys, so play nice. Most came by train from Greenville, Spartanburg, and Columbia, but it seemed the majority came from Charleston and along the coast. I'm told it was dreadfully hot in the low country, so they came up here to cool off. But the temperature here went way up, because those summer girls weren't just pretty. They were gorgeous. They came from wealthy families and were usually accompanied by their mother and grandmothers. I don't remember ever seeing any summer boys, and for that matter, I didn't care. All I wanted to see were those pretty girls. Their fathers came up here for a night or two, but soon left after they arrived. They had to tend to their big businesses on the coast. They were from another class of society, wearing their wealth proudly on their forehead as they strode through the town with their noses held high and their defending eye on their offspring. Most had large seasonal homes that were closed during the winter and reopened in the summer. As a rule, the summer girls were not allowed to date the Melrose boys, and we were restricted from going over to their homes. I guess they thought we might spoil their seeds. They were wise. Oh, we might be able to go over there and sit on the swing and have a glass of lemonade with them, but soon their grandmother or mothers would appear on the doorway and say, Come along in, darling. It's getting pretty late. Oh, it might be only 9 or 10 o'clock at night. The only time the community ever saw the summer girls was at the square dances, and that's when both classes came together. During the winter months, Melrose withered down to a boring shell of a town with nothing to do but dream about the summer months when those pretty girls returned. The town folks kept to themselves and pretended to pay little attention to anybody else's business. Fact was, everybody was so tuned in to everybody else's business, it was ridiculous. I remember the older kids breaking up with their high school sweethearts in order to be free and clear when them summer girls came back. It was also no surprise to the local girls either. They knew what was in store for them. And for that reason, the Melrose girls resented the summer girls. As I think back on those past summers, I'm convinced that our entire town's population went completely crazy. Everyone was so excited upon their arrival, but so resentful when they departed. On this summer, the excitement level turned explosive, and the resentment became sinful. This was the summer I came of age and discovered manhood. It was also the summer that I learned more about myself than I ever wanted to know. We were mountain people with limited education and very little communication with the outside world. My father's name was Wilford Holford, and he was the proud owner of Holford's Grocer which is right next to the Western Union office in the center of town. And I can't remember not working there. While the summer girls bragged about their worldly vacations, we Melrose boys couldn't relate. If we were not in school, we were working. For as long as I can remember, I worked in my father's store. My father was an average-sized man with a large personality. He was also very kind and even-tempered. He was not a demonstrative person like so many others in town were. He didn't hug everybody that walked through the door and get into their business. He'd leave people to their own, and I believe that people appreciated that about him. 
the rest of the retailers in town made it a point to be excessively caring about everybody. Every single time they passed through those doors. Most especially Victor Rathers, the king of caring. How's that beautiful mother of yours? Oh Lord, your daddy's one lucky man to have a woman like that. You know, you're looking pretty good, Rainy Ray. You got a girlfriend yet, Rainy Ray? You know, every time I look at you, you remind me of myself when I was a kid. I love you, Rainy Ray. What the hell did he mean by that comment? Yuck. Every time I saw that man, he told me how much he loved me. My father, on the other hand, was a soft-spoken man with a large face and a wonderful smile. Rarely did I ever see my dad wear anything other than a blue dress shirt under a red vest with a full pocket full of pencils and a large ring of keys hanging on his belt. He always wore tan pants and black shoes with thick rubber soles. He was usually running the store from his elevated office, which was built high above the registers. He could watch the entire store from his tower, from the meat department to produce to the cashiers and even out into the parking lot. My mother's name was Elaine, and quite honestly, the most beautiful woman in town. Side by side, my parents looked like the odd couple. She had long blonde hair, which was usually fixed in a ponytail. Everybody said she had a gorgeous figure and a fresh smile. She was taller than my father and was often confused as my older sister. It was weird growing up with a mother like that because she was a true looker. Men used to flirt with her often and it pissed me off. Often I wanted to jump over the counter and smack the shit out of them. I think constantly guarding my mother from the men caused me to become more of a defensive person at a very young age. Well, I guess now is a good time as any to confess to you that my mother was a summer girl, and I'm a direct descendant of the summer girl invasion. Yep, she was a summer girl from an island south of Charleston called Wadmala. Her father owned and operated a tea plantation down there. And of course, during the hot summers, her mother would bring her up here to Melrose. She met my father at a square dance and fell for him. Somehow, he talked her into moving to Melrose, claiming that she would absolutely love it here. Well, that didn't quite happen, though, he figured. When she came here, she hated it. I'm told it took her a very long time to adjust. For about a year before she married my father, she lived in her parents' summer home and dated my father during the cold months. After her father passed away, they sold the house and it later became the Melrose Inn. I would have been born in that house if my father hadn't rejected the idea so much. He claimed that the summer homes were poorly built and not insulated for winter months. My theory was that my father believed that he would become a laughing stock of Melrose had he married a summer girl and then moved into her parents' home. My parents tried to have more kids, but couldn't because she had some sort of infertility problem. My father confessed to me one day that the reason I was called Rainy was because I was conceived during a rainstorm. For many years to come, every time it thundered outside, they'd look out the window and say, Well, here comes Rainy. My mother was the voice of the store and the community as well. She helped with the bookkeeping, worked the registers, and kept a protective eye on my father. In many ways, my mom was the face of the store next to my father's quiet disposition. When I say she kept a protective eye on my father, I meant it. She was usually the one that nabbed the shoplifters and kicked the troublemakers out of the store. I'd like to pause here for just a moment and reflect on an observation I made several years later. I've come to the conclusion that most kids didn't really know their parents as much as I did. And for that matter, they really couldn't appreciate them as much as I was able to. The reason that I knew my parents so well was because we worked together every single day. Six days a week we worked together in that store. When my school let out at 4 o'clock, I'd be at the store until 8 p.m. My parents were wonderful people. And I can say that I loved them from the bottom of my heart. When I was 13 years old, few of my friends had ever ventured north of Hendersonville or south of Landrum. The only connection we had with the outside world was Victor Victrola and the Melrose Monitor, which was a small, very opinionated newspaper. 
When my father was a child, the rest of the world had radios. Melrose didn't even know what they were. It wasn't until Lester Thompson, the owner of our filling station, built one out of spare parts and scared the crap out of the old people. My father told me that people were convinced that Satan's voice was talking through a box. Soon everybody gathered at the Thompson station and listened to the news of the day and the game of the week. Our town was finally connected to the outside world. There were seven different churches in our community, not counting the black church, which no one counted. That church was in colored town. Everyone went to church back then, because if you didn't, you were considered a sinner, and a world of bad spirits would hunt you down and ruin you for the rest of your life. The Melrose grade was the steepest standard grade railroad track in the country, with a history of train wrecks on the southbound. It was owned by Norfolk Southern Railway as part of the W Line, and most of the town's people worked for them. Melrose wouldn't even be a town had it not been for the trains, which required a need for manpower to maintain the track systems and help guide the southbound locomotives safely down to Tryon. As kids, we surfed the train cars at the bottom of the grade to the town below us, which was Tryon. We often got a milkshake at a drugstore down there, and sometimes caught a movie. And then we'd catch another train heading back up to our boring little town. Rocking was the community sport for not only the kids, but also the adults, even though they'd never admit it. Everyone threw rocks at black kids back then. Those poor kids were rocked every single day they passed by our school. For the record, I only threw one rock at a black person and I regretted it ever since. I never had an arm for baseball, but on that fateful day my pitch was perfect and a direct hit against the side of Reverend Wainwright's sweet daughter's head. It was one of the saddest days of my entire life when I witnessed that little girl falling backwards on those hard steel rails. I remember her screaming as her blood and tears painted her school clothes and her friends pulled her further down the tracks. None of my peers seemed to care about my dreadful crime on that day. Even the sheriff chuckled under his breath as he drove me over to Reverend's house to deliver my apology. You got a good arm there, boy. You hit that little nigger girl dead on. You know that? You should try out for our summer league. Tears of sorrow poured from my soul as I gazed at the terrible cut on the left side of that girl's face. But as she stood next to her father, she seemed to be more concerned about my well-being. Ironically, at the complete displeasure of the sheriff, the preacher seemed to pity me. He took my face in his warm and truly caring hands and said, You better than that, Rainy Ray. You know that boy? I said, You are much better than that. The preacher killed me with kindness that day as we drove away from Blacktown and back to the normal side of town. Hattie May later told me that she and her sisters had planned a counterattack with their own arsenal of stones until her father, in his kind way, convinced them not to. I've never been able to distance myself from that guilt as I walked those lonely tracks down Melrose Grade. The Holford family was one of the few families that were not kin to the two other dominant families in Melrose. Until the summer girls invaded our town, the females and the other two families were our only hope of producing any future offspring. Upon taking my first square dance class in the seventh grade, I discovered girls and I was awestruck. But it wasn't until the summer of 1969, following my ninth grade year, that I discovered women. And this is where my story begins. Chapter 2 Jonathan Roy was my best friend back then. His father was a local surgeon and his grandfather was a Methodist minister. While I was an only child, the rest of the families in Melrose had an average of seven offspring. John was one of seven kids and their household was always alive with excitement. My house always seemed quite boring to me, so I couldn't wait to be over there. John and I spent as much time together as possible, because he had such a big house and plenty of things to do with a million brothers and sisters, it seems. 
He had BB guns, go-karts, tractors, and more food and snacks than anybody could imagine. His parents always seemed to give us full reign of whatever we wanted to do except smoke cigarettes. If John's dad ever caught us smoking, John would catch holy hell. John and I also had a secret world of our own, and that was on the rooftops of downtown. We'd run across the rooftops on the buildings on the main street, snatching Christmas lights and exploding them on the streets below. Most of the buildings were connected in one big line, and few required a running jump to get to it. We knew more about the rooftops downtown than anybody in town. Often we'd enter those buildings through unknown hatches and spy on the shop owners. Once we watched the sheriff drink himself silly on corn liquor. Another time we saw more than we ever bargained for when we peeked through the base of the chandelier at the woman's dress shop. An eye full of a 230-pound Miss Craft, who was also 78 years old, was quite enough for us. Ironically, we always started at the first building on the south side of town, which was the police station. And there we would easily make our way down to the very last building. At that point, Victor's business, which was called Railhouse Diner, was Caddy Corner and across the street. Once, after we made sure that the sheriff was gone, we pried open a maintenance panel and slid down a water pipe to the floor of the police station. I surveyed the vacant vault while John was bold enough to snatch a pair of handcuffs from the supply cabinet. So about the vault. The police station had once been the Melrose Savings Bank, and the original vault was later turned into a cell. The vault had earned a reputation as being not only the most secure jail in North Carolina, but also the most terrifying. The vault was also quite large and able to accommodate up to a dozen inmates at a time. Often federal prisoners traveling by train on their way to St. Louis spent a night in the vault. I'm sure those layover evenings were times those prisoners never forgot. The vault door was heavily fortified with six-inch holes cut in the center and rectangular slot for food trays. The wall was made of 18-inch concrete panels. When they closed those doors to the vault and locked them, some prisoners were known to scream all night long. The next building over was Western Auto, where they sold everything from bicycles to lawnmowers to train sets to Barbie dolls. John and I found a way in there once, but barely tucked the floor when we realized that the owner left his two German Shepherd watchdogs there overnight. Johnson's candy store was our gold mine. Now, John and I never considered ourselves burglars. We were more like penny candy thieves. I always grabbed a pocket full of malted milk balls and a nice supply of bitto honey. John went for the beef jerky and bottled cream soda. And then up to the rooftops we went for our banquet. We had our own feast on the top of our town as we watched the town crazies act out on the street below. Usually, we'd watch Gudger bring in drunks from the pool hall and once saw the minister from Fox Mountain Baptist Church get hauled in with a prostitute. The day school let out, I spent the night at John's house and got ready for the big day at the lake. We woke up to a beautiful summer morning. We grabbed our towels and bathing suits and jumped on my bike, John on the back and me on the handlebars, and pedaled our way to the water. We were on our way to Lake Summit for the first swim of the year and a brand new batch of summer girls. Lake Summit was a beautiful lake where everyone except the black population was welcome. Large summer homes dotted the shoreline, each mostly owned by the wealthy summer families and only a few belonging to the town folks. A roped off swimming area with the backdrop of rock mountains painted the beauty of those rich summer memories. Water slides were there for the pleasure of the kids and diving platforms were there for the more confident swimmers. Our friends and adversaries were already there waiting for the invasion to hit. They were sporting their winter skin and claiming their summer turf. Some kid got his hand caught in an ice cream bar machine and was screaming his ass off. 
while another kid was being stuffed into the back of a police cruiser for stealing someone's bicycle. The same lifeguards had returned from the year before, and we were excited to see them. Jerry Davis, the lead lifeguard, had a body like Tarzan, and he was the best diver at school. His girlfriend, Emmy, also a lifeguard, had a body like Tarzan's Jane, and everybody dreamed that she would swim out and rescue them. John never had hair back in those days. His daddy always shaved off his head at the beginning of every summer, leaving him with an embarrassing white scalp. It never seemed to bother John either. I would have been mortified to start the summer looking like that. The beach smelled of suntan oil, grilled hot dogs, and baked corn cobs as we sat on our beach towels surveying the action around the lake. The Melrose girls camped on the other side of the beach with their eyes glued to us, waiting for their wintertime boyfriends to hook up with the summer girls. One by one, they'd arrive with their mothers in tow. As we sat in our towels with our eyes popping out, it was amazing how beautiful those girls were. While the Melrose girls were so dreary, I explained to John the theory I overheard a man in a store tell another. You know why them summer girls are so damn pretty? No, why? asked the other man. It's because they come from money. They're rich. I thought it was a stupid theory when I first heard that. But when I compared my mom to the rest of the women in town, I sort of agreed. The lifeguards were also aware of the invasion as they oiled up their bodies and flexed their muscles. The lifeguards were doing synchronized dives off the diving boards when two beautiful summer girls, along with their mother, settled down right next to us. We had struck gold as the threesomes laid out their blankets, removed their outer clothing, and displayed their fabulous bathing suits and stunning figures. The mother was tall, a beautiful woman with fantastic legs and striking blonde hair. The two girls appeared to be about our age and were probably not sisters. One was a carbon copy of her mother, while the other one had shoulder-length brown hair and a bit of a tomboy look. The daughter was for me, and the tom girl was for John. Done. While I always considered myself to be a bit cooler than my buddy, John was right on his mark and already making eye contact with the tom girl. I instantly joined in introduction, quickly claiming ownership over the daughter as our Melrose Boy competition advanced on our private camp. Carol was quickly becoming my friend as Jane seemed very interested in John, bald head and all. On that first day of summer, Lake Summit had become Carol Jane Lake for John and me. We were successful in claiming our summer girls, and even the mother seemed to approve. For the next few days, we met Carol and Jane at the lake, us with our white bathing towels, and the ladies with their fancy blankets and umbrella. They even brought lunch, and we got to know them even more, most especially Jane's mother, who was a fountain of information about her disappointing life in Charleston. She described her existence as if she had both loved it and hated it. The mother's name was Martha Middleton Smith, a self-proclaimed blue blood from Charleston and a direct descendant of Henry Middleton. My mother and Miss Martha were both from the low country of South Carolina and each had the same history with Henry Middleton, but so did many others, I considered. When asked what a blue blood was, she described a haughty group of wealthy families with kept names and outdated traditions. Miss Martha continued, I was the belle of the ball, a Bishop England debutante. My family ruled the entire swath of real estate south of Broad Street, and my life growing up on the Battery was both wonderful and wearisome. Miss Martha had one other thing to acknowledge as the five of us sat on the shoreline that day eating fried chicken and watching the activity in the distance. I'm divorced. I'm no longer married. My marriage has been legally dissolved, and I'm no longer Martha Middleton Smith. I am now Miss Martha to you boys, and it's now my time to live. Divorce was unheard of in our Christian community. People stayed together whether they wanted to or not. The only way out of marriage was when either one of them died. I also expect that many couples sat in church on a weekly basis praying 
that their precious betrothed would soon get their wings. My divorce was a great disappointment to the blue blood families in the large community. Why on earth did Miss Martha leave Hainsworth? What the devil happened to that marriage? Was she having an affair? Did Hainsworth beat her? Martha's such a wild child. Just look at the way she flirts with those men. Would you like to know the truth, boys? Well, I'll tell you the truth. And it's all right, because the girls are very aware of this. He cheated on me. And the sad thing was, I didn't give a damn. You know, we were just married too young. I mean, we were stupid. What do kids know when they get married at that age anyway? I was 19 years old when I got married to that man, for God's sake. While it was unheard of for summer boys to spend the night at the homes of the summer girls, Miss Martha welcomed us in with open arms. I think she thought it was safer to invite us in than have us sneak in through the windows. On our first visit, I was horrified to learn that Pearly Ann Wainwright, the mother of my rocking victim, Hattie Mae, was to be their summer cook and housekeeper. I cringed when I saw Hattie Mae helping her mother in the kitchen, still sporting that noticeable scar on the side of her forehead. I was certain that Pearly Ann was going to confide in Miss Smith about my horrid criminal behavior, and I'd be out the door like a bag of garbage. But thankfully, she never said a word. For the next several nights, John and I reveled in our conquest with the beautiful girls which we were becoming very familiar with. Carol was a beautiful Catholic girl with golden blonde hair, delightfully plump lips, and a cute pug nose. She and Jane were cheerleaders and had the energy to prove it. They attended the very same private school their parents did, and I'm sure were very popular among the boys. Bishop England was the name of their school, named after Charleston's first bishop, John England. According to Carol, it didn't matter what denomination you were, if you were accepted in, you became a Catholic. While our town seemed to have more churches than stores, we never even met a Catholic. Our Christian community would never stomach the idea of paying too much attention to a blessed virgin woman. We demanded our faith and prayers to be sent to a white male redeemer. And my father always told us a funny joke about Catholics. He'd say, do you know the difference between Catholics and Baptists? The Catholics would say, they ain't no hell. The Baptists would say, the hell they ain't. Carol and Jane clearly were more educated than we were and much more cultured. You could tell by the way they described things. The year before, they had spent the summer in France and even learned how to speak the language. <laughs> John and I would never been to the ocean, and my foreign language skills were limited to a Spanish class, which I failed twice. Why these girls paid any attention to us was beyond me. We enjoyed dinner with the threesome almost every night, never speaking a word of it to our parents or anybody else. Each day, John and I would joyfully pedal the back roads to their majestic lake house, singing out loud with excitement, We don't care what the neighbors say. We're going to go there anyway. Swing your left hand. You people on the side, y'all can clap. Come on, man. Swing your partner. Our couples move on. Chapter 3 The first square dance of the summer was held on the first Friday of June at the Melrose High School. John and I were to meet the girls at the dance and we were both excited but highly protected of our prize dates. Melrose was a sea of sharks and the girls were nothing but live bait. Cars were lined up from the police station, past the school, and beyond to the ball field. The area in front of the gymnasium was packed with people waiting to get in. A poster on the door read, 50 cents for boys, and the girls dance free. When John and I finally made it through the doors of the gym, it was already uncomfortably hot. Anybody who could get on the dance floor were already there, claiming their position in a large circle around the floor and the room was full of brand new summer girls. Boys and girls alternated one after another. They clung to their partner's hands and danced to the strict orders of Bear Miller, the caller of the dance. 
Bear was calling the dance, and he was our least favorite. He took his role way too seriously than any other callers. He expected perfection on the dance floor. I personally thought he was a jerk. We learned to dance at the old library when we were just children. So when we approached high school, we'd be ready to come to the big dance. Adults of all ages danced with whomever asked them. It really didn't matter who you were, adult or kid. If you messed up on the dance floor, Bear would call you out on it. He was serious, too. That's why they called him the Bear. Bear had been known to lose his temper and quit mid-dance, walking out and leaving the building altogether. The music would stop and someone would say, Where's Bear? Someone would say, He's done got in his car and left. It really didn't matter anyway because there were so many others in the crowd who could call the dance without losing a step. It was beginning to get hotter by the minute as the dancers twirled to the music of the Green River Boys. Even the girls were sweating as they rushed by us with their perfumed body odor wind. Red River Valley was the one song that had to be played at every single square dance. It was the song that formally kicked the evening into gear. It was the beginning of that very song that John and I realized that we were too late when we spotted the girls already in the dance floor with the sharks. On the other side of the gymnasium, we noticed Miss Martha standing next to the window, looking nothing short of ravishing. She was surrounded by a cadre of male admirers with her long hair up in a French braid. She was wearing a beautiful cotton dress, low-cut silk blouse, and a winning smile. There was our school principal, Doc Jones, desperately trying to engage her in conversation, followed by our banker, Willie Ward. He always wore a three-piece suit, no matter how hot it was. Then, like clockwork, there was Victor Rathers, the proud owner of Rail House Diner. Well, there's Rainy Ray. How's your gorgeous mother doing? I just want you to tell her hello from me. You're turning out to be a big man these days. I'm going to have to keep an eye on you before you capture one of them summer girls. <laughs> I'm just janking your chain. I love you, Rainy Ray. If Victor was in line for something, Victor usually got it. He'd always act too nice and would never take no for an answer. He always acted as if he was the spokesperson for the church. Whether they gave him that right or not is unknown. His long, narrow face, piercing eyes, and cunning smile sent a different signal to me. The huge ring of couples stretched and strained as the music got louder and Bear's orders grew sterner. This was one of the most challenging times for the couples to hang on to their prized dates. For if the circle broke, you'd be on one side of the gym and your date would be on the other side with the sharks. Bear was hanging on to his last nerve as the line finally broke and the dance fell apart. In the distance, we noticed Victor claiming the hand of Miss Martha, and they were back on the floor for the next dance. Our girls were snatched up by Fletcher White and his stupid big brother. Both brutes frowned at us, daring us just to make a move on our girls. Hopefully, it would just be a matter of time before the girls broke away from them, because those two idiots stunk more than anybody else in the town. They sometimes reeked so bad that their teachers had to leave the classroom to keep from vomiting. Now, outside of the gymnasium, and down around the ball field was the only place to get to know the summer girls. And let me tell you, the competition there was fierce. It was also very easy to score beer, some corn liquor, and cigarettes. And it was a great setup for problems later in the summer. On this first night, Gudger had to arrest two boys for fighting and take one Melrose woman home to her parents. John and I kicked around there for a while, hoping the girls would come out, but... We finally gave up and walked back down the hill towards home. As we reached the train tracks, we heard the girls calling us from the top of the hill, and our hearts raced. We were soon back at Miss Martha's house, relaxing in the dark living room, with Carol and I on the couch, and John and Jane back in the corner, on the floor with pillows. We had the entire house to ourselves, each thinking it was time to kiss and make out. Music was softly playing on their expensive radio as we folded into our private romances. At about midnight, we accidentally fell asleep in the arms of our lovers and found out that Miss Martha wasn't even at home. The four of us 
were in deep slumber when the voice of a female god came raining down on us from the heavens. You boys better get your business and get on out of here. Good God, y'all. It was the housekeeper, Pearly Ann Wainwright, and was she ever upset with us? She was standing directly over me, poking me in the stomach with a broom handle. Hattie Mae was in the doorway, with her eyes wide open, holding the door open for our immediate ejection. I said, you get y'all's skinny asses out of here before Miss Martha comes in and sees you. Good night, nurse. You girls ought to be ashamed of yourself. Now get on up to your room before I whip you myself. Good God almighty, Hattie Mae. Help those girls upstairs into their rooms. Oh, my Lord. With only one shoe on and the other tucked under my armpit, we were out the door. A beautiful sunrise was painting the horizon with lavender, pink, and blue watercolor. But John and I found little appreciation in it whatsoever. We were late getting back to John's house, and I had to be at work in about two hours. We were sprinting across the neighbor's yard when my foot got caught up in a metal ladder that was laying in the wet grass. Down I went, face first, and instantly I knew I needed stitches. Blood was flowing from my chin as we continued our desperate race home. It was about a quarter past six when a car came over the horizon and rolled by us. I was applying pressure to my chin with one of my white socks, praying I could stop the bleeding before I got home, when I caught sight of Victor Rathers at the wheel and Miss Martha in the passenger seat. I'm not sure about John, but I turned my head, praying he wouldn't see us. What? was Victor doing with Miss Martha at this time in the morning, and why on earth was she with him? My mind was spinning with thoughts. Victor was a married man and a pillar of our community, even though many in the community crossed the street whenever they caught sight of him. John and I had just caught Victor in a bad spot with Miss Martha, and that was to be John's and my closely guarded secret. Dr. Roy met us at the driveway as we reached their home. He was sporting a dark suit and a bow tie, and he was on his way to the hospital for an early morning surgery when he saw us. It didn't help matters much when a pack of cigarettes fell out of John's shirt pocket and landed at Dr. Roy's feet. Now, I know you're daddy, Randy Ray, so I'm going to ask you this once. Were you smoking cigarettes, too? Now, I'm not a liar, but I was that morning when I looked him dead in the eye and said, No. John's dad took me into the wood shop and gave me five stitches in the chin and sent me on my way. John, on the other hand, was grounded for two weeks. Getting back to Victor, I could never understand what Amy Rathers ever saw in Victor. She was a very pretty woman that seemed so mismatched for him. They had no children and always seemed happy together. Perhaps that was the reason why. Amy earned a liberal arts degree from Wesleyan College and worked for the town hall as a tax collector. Victor didn't even make it out of the ninth grade when he took over his father's diner. Amy was an attractive woman with a peaceful smile, chestnut hair, and a pretty figure. Along with Victor, the couple volunteered for everything. It was well known that Victor had a prior drinking problem, but he claimed to be sober for the last eight years. He claimed God saved his life. And because of that, he tried to convert everyone he encountered. I always imagined that Jesus, in his infinite mercy, couldn't quite do the infinite with Victor because he was one hard case. Most people couldn't take Victor's bulldozing personality, but the town tolerated him mainly because of his charming wife and the fact that together they helped the town out a lot. If he wasn't talking about religion, he'd be talking about anything else. I've never heard a person talk so loudly about nothing, but when his discussions pertaining to religion became threatening, that's when the church decided to send him on his way. Suddenly, the town was seeing less and less of them as a couple, and more and more of Victor alone. He was also becoming unkempt, with an ever-increasing beard that creeped up the side of his face toward his dark eyes. He was becoming loony-looking. Victor had become an embarrassment to the inner circle of the church, and the church elders suddenly blocked his seat on the table. And for Victor, that was a shock. One Sunday after church service, the pastor and two rather large church members held out a hand to Victor and told him to leave the church entirely. Victor could not accept his rejection from the very same church that he was baptized in as a baby. It was a real blow to Victor, and understandably so. When I heard that Victor was thrown out of the church, I felt bad for him, and most especially for his wife. I also began to look at churches differently then, because Victor 
really had a problem, and they offered no help, prayers, or guidance to him. They just kicked he and his wife to the street as if they were dogs. There we go. Sweeten your opponent lady, boy. Chapter 4 Holford's Grocers mainly catered to the Melrose community. But since my father had a long-standing relationship with Bill Ragg at the Standard Beef and Seafood Company in Asheville, we had meat when many other stores in our region did not. Mr. Ragg moved to Asheville from Brooklyn, New York, and apparently retained strong connections to the mob. He liked my father and mother very much because, according to my father, we paid our bills on time and never used any other supplier. I remember old lady Roser coming into the store one time complaining, I can buy a pound of ground beef and try on for $1.54, so why in the world are you selling it for $1.75 a pound? My dad smiled and asked, Why don't you buy it there? Because they don't have any, she frowned. Well, when I run out, I'll sell ground beef for $1.54 as well. Since we were always well stocked with beef, pork, and seafood, we delivered to most of the restaurants, boarding houses, and stores in our region. Even Tryon, even though they hated the order from us. Tryon was our sister city to the south, and as far as I was concerned, a bunch of snobs. They always claimed to have better schools, they were wealthier, and were much more cultured than the people in our town. Well, that may be so, but none of that ever mattered to me. I have to admit, though, that they had their own movie theater, which we didn't have, and a fancy drugstore that they served fantastic milkshakes. When I reached the ninth grade, I began training as a butcher boy and made local in-town deliveries, even though I didn't even have a driver's license. I guess the police considered me an essential worker. Unfortunately, it was my job to deliver fish and meat to Victor's Diner, which I dreaded. I never ate at the Railhouse Diner because it was filthy, especially its parking lot, which I considered to be a sanitary disaster. It was always littered with chewing gum used toothpicks, spit, disgusting spent plugs of chewing tobacco, and cigarette butts. It was open seven days a week, but only for lunch and dinner on Sunday. No one was open on the Lord's Day until the last Baptist service. Victor cared less about other churches in the area because he probably considered God to be an actual member of his church. The dining room was a large square room filled with four top tables. The uniformed men always sat in the back of the building against the wall. Victor probably forced them to eat back there because they had horrid manners and terrible body odor. Everyone, except for my parents and I, ate there. And I never knew why. My father knew Victor in high school and always considered him to be a bully and an idiot. And for as long as I can remember, my mom seemed to detest Victor with a vengeance and always did everything to avoid him. Victor's a balloon in the wind, Rainy Ray. I'd stay away from him. I'm sure he flirted with my mother in a big way back then, till she probably slapped him down. To order your meal, you would go to the far end of the counter and work your way up to the cash register, where Victor would be waiting for you. You would give your orders to a black man named KC, and he would yell out your orders to the cooks, salad makers, and sandwich makers at their special locations. As you moved down the line, the food would follow you until you came face to face with Victor. For years, I never realized that KC was totally blind, even though he seemed to know exactly what was going on in the entire restaurant. He would know the customer's order before they even had a chance to tell him. And off he'd send you with your metal tray, napkins, and silverware. Victor would be dancing at the register, flirting with the girls, loving on the old people, and asking way too many personal questions of everyone. He would tally up your bill in his head and tell you what the exact total was as soon as you got in front of him. There were tacky pictures on the wall of past sport teams from the high school, vintage cars and cheerleading squads from Melrose High dating back to when my father went there. Victor had a passion for cheerleaders, especially when they came to have their annual photo taken in their dining area. 
Victor was always posing in the center of those girls with a broad grin on his face and his hand on the butts of those girls. Rarely did I ever see Amy Rathers at the diner. I think Victor made it a point to keep her away from his personal playground as he flirted with anyone who would look his way. I arrived with my normal delivery just after the lunch rush as the uniform crowd were paying up and leaving. Everyone wore uniforms back then, from the policemen to the garbage men, paint contractors, and railroad prison workers who sometimes came in wearing ankle chains. Victor saw me pull up and was beaming from ear to ear. He directed one of the busboys to go out to my truck and unload it through the side door. Victor was sporting a brand new t-shirt under his white apron, but his beard looked even worse since the last time I saw him at the wheel with Miss Martha to his right. Rainy Ray, how you doing on this beautiful fine day? Ooh, what happened to your chin? Did you cut yourself shaving? <laughs> that must have been a nasty slip of that shaving blade. But sometimes things just kind of happen, don't they, Rainy Ray? Right, Rainy Ray? I suggest you be a bit more careful with those sharp things. I wouldn't want you to bleed to death. Ha <laughs> ha, Rainy Ray, he said, coming out from behind the corner and up to the pinball machines. Some kid was beating on the glass of the machine trying to make it tilt. The bells were ringing so loud I could hardly make out what Victor was saying to me. Stop it, kid, and go back to your damn table, he viciously barked. Victor's behavior was really becoming bizarre since his departure from the church. He moved right into my space and put his arms right around me and opened his smelly mouth. He smelled of stale liquor and cheap aftershave. Do you have a thing for Miss Martha's daughter? He drilled as he moved in even closer. I love when all those summer girls come to town, don't you, Rainy Ray? I mean, mmm. Mm, they, they beat every dang female in this town, except maybe your pretty mother. I knew exactly where he was going with this line of inquiry, but I didn't know how far he was going to take it. Victor was going to try to intimidate me, but what came next actually frightened me. You know, if I were you, I'd keep an eye on Miss Martha's daughter and her sexy little friend. What are their names? Uh, uh, Carol and Jane? They are two little hotties. It would be a shame if someone in this town... Got a little too frisky with those girls. Wouldn't it, Rainy Ray? I think you and Doc's boy have been getting a bit too friendly than their mother might even know. I don't blame you either, Rainy Ray. I'd probably go after those cute little numbers too, if given a chance. I doubt if I'd even be able to keep my hands off them. His hug was becoming more than a hug as his right hand gripped my shoulder. Look at it from this angle, son. How would it look if something happened to them girls and everyone, including the sheriff, finds out that you boys have been climbing in and out of those windows on a nightly basis? Rainy Ray, you know, I saw you the other day leaving their house half-dressed. <laughs> you didn't even have your shoes on. Now I'm sure you saw me. How about you and Doc's boy? Keep this little secret between us friends. Are you with me on that, Rainy Ray? He faced me dead on and looked me straight in the eye. I said, do you get the picture on this, Rainy Ray? Yes, sir. That's good, Sonny. And with that, he released me. Hey, thanks for dropping by, Rainy Ray. Oh, I almost forgot to tell your mama I said hello. She is one good-looking number. Do tell her I said hello. I haven't seen her in almost forever. I might have to drop by the store sometime and see how she's doing. As I was leaving, I heard him call after me in a very loud voice so the entire cook staff could hear, I love you, Rainy Ray. Oh, and be safe and be careful shaving. I wouldn't want you to bleed out. I had just taken on more than I bargained for as I was backing out of the parking space, feeling a bit lightheaded. I was also surprised at how intimidated I had become when I noticed my hand shaking as I wiped the sweat off my forehead. It wasn't just the level of intensity in Victor's eyes that shook me, but rather his constant interest in my mother. Melrose had three annual celebrations where the town came together in a big way. The first was the annual Christmas tree lighting and gift exchange in the parking lot of the old library, which was across the tracks from the playground. There'd be hot chocolate, apple cider, and tables full of cookies, cakes, and pies. The church folk would sing Christmas carols and hug everyone they saw. Hattie Mae told me that they often found gifts on their front porch. That's when I started believing in Santa Claus. I still have no idea where those gifts came from. The second celebration was during the first week of July when the town held its annual picnic and square dance. 
The entire town turned out for this event, and they were fun. Food vendors sold everything from watermelon to roast corn, apple pie, cotton candy, candied apples, chicken, barbecue pork and beans, and anything else you could imagine. Bands played all day long while the kids swung on the swings and ate ice cream cones. When it turned dark, people lined the streets with their lawn chairs and watched the square dance in the center of the street. Now the third celebration was not a celebration at all, but a desperate last chance to hang on to your summertime girlfriend. It was also the largest square dance in the region, known as the Granddaddy. This dance marked the end of the summer on the eve of a painful farewell to the summer girls, because the very next morning, every single one of those beauties boarded a train and were out of here. It had been two weeks since John and I had been out together, and boy, were we ever anxious to see the girls. John's father and my dad were very happy to be out, too. So he let John off his restriction a little early, and we were happy about that. The streets were thick with people cavorting with one another as John and I strolled through the crowd, eating our chili cheeseburgers and sipping on our root beer floats. The Black Mountain Boys were warming up on stage as the square dance caller using his bullhorn, was instructing children to do the bunny hop. My parents were over by the wine and cheese table, sipping on some wine that came from a vineyard down in Tryon. It was easy to spot John's father with his tall physique, short cropped hair, mustacheless beard, and colorful bow tie. John's mother was a sweet, matronly woman with a friendly smile. She was a quiet person in public, but at home we could hear her calling us from an acre away. My father was wearing a plaid shirt, stiff blue jeans, and cowboy boots and seemed unrecognizable to the way he normally dressed at the store. My mother had on a teal-colored sleeveless top with a white cotton dress and tan sandals. She wore the evening well as men in town admired her. The sky was dark blue and the night was cooling down from the long, hot afternoon. The big dance was about to begin. The square dance caller was on the side of the stage with a microphone issuing instructions to dancers to divide into two separate ovals and begin to start. The excitement level amongst the crowd was palatable as the dancers smiled, laughed, and beamed with anticipation. That's when I saw Miss Martha standing by the edge of the stage with the girls by her side. She clearly came prepared to be asked to dance. Her wavy blonde hair was parted in the center and flowed down to the small of her back and below her belt line. She wore a pink crop top with cut-off denim shorts that revealed her attractive midriff, and boy, did she have pretty legs. She looked the part of beauty and seemed aware of it as she posed for several nearby men, counting the seconds to be asked to dance. Okay, men, I want you to go choose your lady friends and form a circle. From down there, just in front of the light pole, to all the way over there, to the other side of the lemonade stand. Blake Thompson was calling the big dance tonight, and he was raring to go. Blake started calling dances seven years earlier, after he had to give up fiddle because of arthritis. Prior to calling, he was considered one of the best mountain fiddlers in the region. He was a serious man, but a very likable man. Nothing like bear. But he still expected the dance to run properly. The year before was rained out, but this year had a record crowd of about 500 people, and the main street was saturated with people. I suddenly caught sight of Victor, who was struggling to make his way through the crowd in search of something. He looked dreadful, with an unkept beard, scruffy hair, and a stagger in his step. Victor was clearly drunk, with his eyes glued on Miss Martha as she partnered up with Larson Darnell, a local house painter, who seemed happy with his acquisition and not about to let her go. Now I want you to swing your left-hand lady, boys, the caller announced as the big dance was launched. The circle was directed to meet in the center and touch hands with a couple on the opposite side. Victor had a desperate expression on his face that reminded me of a soldier heading into battle. Now circle left and don't be late. The band was building up as Victor drove closer to his objective. Now swing your partners high and low. Everyone seemed so happy and relaxed, except Victor, who reminded me of a rabid hawk swooping in for a kill. Now promenade from heel to toe. Miss Martha had no idea. Victor was about to snatch her up. All young ladies go in the middle and back to the barn. Martha moved to the center with the rest of the ladies leaving her partner stranded. Victor went in for the kill, grabbing Larson from behind by his belt. Larson was out of the dance and burning a hole in the back of Victor 
as the now frightened Miss Martha struggled with her new dance partner. As the gents go in with a right-hand star, Victor followed the caller's order to the letter. Gents swing out and ladies in and hold her tight till you're called again. Victor had claimed his trophy and was not about to give her up to anybody. Neither did he care about what the caller was saying from the stage. Victor was dancing on his own terms now. Gents swing out and ladies in. It's once and a half and you go again. He was holding her close to his body and leading Miss Martha to his own cadence as if he were in a dance-off contest. Go promenade around the ring. Ordered the dance line to rotate, but Victor was impeding the traffic flow. Larson Darnell made his way back to the side of Miss Martha as Victor shielded him from her. One more attempt from Larson Darnell caused Victor to separate from Miss Martha. Mouth wide open, Miss Martha appeared shocked and concerned for her safety as three other men, along with Larson Darnell, captured Victor by his neck and arms and walked him away. Victor's face was raging like a wild animal as the four men carried him off for a beating. Before the next dance call, the momentum was back. People were laughing. Martha was picked up by another dance partner, and Victor was a distant memory. Show me a place where I don't have to worry. That's where I belong And show me a place where I don't have to hurry That's where I belong And give me some time so I can change my mind And it don't matter if I'm wrong Show me a place where I don't have to Chapter 5 That's where I belong stayed at her house last night. John whispered over the phone. What girls? The summer girls, you dumbass. Both of them? No, all of them. What? Miss Martha got beat up. My dad's treating the mom, and then he's going to go examine Carol and Jane. The sheriff was here, too. Well, what in the hell happened? She's not saying, but I think Victor forced himself on her. Who? The girls? No, Miss Martha. You mean he raped her? Well, they're not sure. I suddenly felt flush, dizzy, and sick to my stomach, thinking that Victor's threat was suddenly becoming a reality. Look at it from this angle, son. How would it look if something happened to them girls and everyone, including the sheriff, finds out that you boys have been climbing in and out of those windows on a nightly basis? That son of a bitch never takes no for an answer. I bet he raped her, John. Well, did Gudger arrest him? Nope. He said he didn't have any reason to arrest him. Unfounded information and no witnesses. What do you mean, unfounded information? They must have found some evidence. Well, they're going to try to send her to the hospital for further tests. That's if she goes. God, Victor told me that if anything happens to those girls, he and Gudger would find a way to blame it on us. Rainy Ray, you know, I saw you the other day leaving their house half-dressed. <laughs> you didn't even have your shoes on. Now I'm sure you saw me. How about you and Doc's boy? Keep this little secret between us friends. Are you with me on that, Rainy Ray? Does anyone know how often we go over there? Well, they do now. And I bet the entire town does now, thanks to Gudger. He brought that up as soon as he showed up here last night. I imagine what my parents will think now. Well, how did they end up at your house? Someone called the hospital and asked if my dad could come over there and make a house call. Well, who called the house? It must have been the girls. Nope. They said it was some anonymous caller. That is so weird. I heard the screen door shut as my mother was coming in from the garden. I ended my call in mid-sentence and made a beeline for the front yard in my bike. Rainy Ray? Where are you going off in such a hurry? My mother yelled. I'm going over to John's. Don't you bother those girls, Rainy Ray. I left the house in such a rage that my mom's comment about the girls didn't even register until I was halfway there. How in the hell did she know about this, I wondered. That son of a bitch. I'll kill that bastard. That pretty woman and those pretty girls come up here to paradise to relax and this is what happens to them? I hate this damn town. Dr. Roy always loved to have people at his house. 
the more the merrier, was his motto. All of John's siblings and their friends were there every single night. Even his own grandparents had their own wing of the house. But Dr. Roy went even further than that with the history of taking in people who were down on their luck. It might be a reformed alcoholic trying to get back on his feet again or a wandering female vagabond needing a place to crash. The Roy's house was like one big no-judgment zone. My father was quite different than Dr. Roy. He loved his privacy and loved the fact that he only had one child. Rarely did we even have a house guest, except maybe my Uncle Bud. Let them be, Rainy Ray, John's mother ordered as I blasted into the kitchen. They've had a very rough night, and I don't want you boys up there bothering them. Your mother is on her way over here to help me take care of those poor girls. Well, that explains my mother's comment, I thought. Mrs. Roy could tell that I was concerned about my parents learning about our summer activity. But if they weren't upset with John, then maybe I was okay. John's dad was much more stricter with John than my dad was with me. Where's Dr. Roy? He had to go to the hospital for an ER call. He'll be back in a few minutes. I went out to the shop and waited for John to join me. John's parents always had a keg of beer in their shop for Sunday receptions, and they allowed us to have a glass of beer whenever we wanted to. I guess they'd rather us drink at home than off somewhere else. I pulled out a cold mug and poured myself a tall one. John came in from the garage section and poured himself a draft as well. Oh my God, I said as I took my first gulp and swallowed with some semblance of relief. Well, I guess our big secret's out. Yep. I expect both of our parents even know about the time we fell asleep over there and you busted your chin on the lawn tripping over that damn ladder, John said with a grin. Well, what in the hell happened last night? Did Miss Martha say it was Victor? Well, she was too out of it to say anything. And no one ever even saw Victor there. But the girls are convinced it was him. They said she was roughed up pretty bad and had her shirt ripped off. The girls think Victor went over there after he got the shit kicked out of him at the dance. Oh my God, he's really losing his mind, John. Hey, have you seen his wife lately? No, I haven't, John said, as he took my mug and topped off our beers. My parents were at the house when John and I walked back in. I overheard Dr. Roy telling my dad that Miss Martha refused to have a full examination because she was too traumatized, and Gudger warned the emergency room doctors from doing any further examinations without her full approval. Other than a few minor cuts and bruises, I don't see there's any need for alarm. She could have made this whole thing up. You know the way these rich summer women are. I'm just waiting from some fat cat lawyer from the coast to come up here and start charging everyone for rape. The girls who were asleep upstairs told Dr. Roy that Miss Martha was frightened by Victor's behavior at the big square dance and left for home, leaving the girls to follow along back later. Jane said she remembered seeing Victor cross back over the tracks, away from the big dance. She said he had a bloody nose and a wild look on his face. My guess was that he received a thrashing from Larson Darnell and his buddies, and was desperately trying to get back to Miss Martha to save face. He probably caught up with her, and things didn't go quite the way he planned. On my way back to work that day, I wondered why Miss Martha didn't leave and go back to Charleston after that encounter with Victor. I sure would have. I firmly believe that God had left our little town for parts unknown. On that single day, I formed a distinct abhorrence of Melrose. The friendliest town in the South, sure it was, I thought. We were nothing more than a town of religious hypocrites. Who waited for God to tell us how to live our miserable lives? It was my day to make another delivery to the Railhouse Diner, and I was not looking forward to it at all. My mother was studying me with a queer look in her eye. Somehow, I think she knew that Victor had threatened me earlier. I was backing out of the loading dock when my mother tapped on my window with her knuckles. Rolling down the window, I witnessed a sight of my mother I'd never seen before. Move over, Rainy Ray. I'm going with you. I stared at her in disbelief. Put the damn truck into park, Rainy Ray, and move over and let me drive. There was no stopping her. 
and not a word of conversation on the way over. There was a full lunch crowd at the diner when we pulled up and came to a stop at the loading spot in front of the building. Victor was smiling from ear to ear when he saw my mother to driver's seat. He came out from behind the counter and took off his ball cap and was heading for the door. My mother turned to me, looked me dead in the eye and said, Now you stay right here, Rainy Ray, and do not get out of this damn truck. Do you understand me? I've never seen my mother perch up on her heels like this in my entire life. She opened the door, dropped to the pavement, and met Victor as he was heading out the door to give her a big hug. She was in no hugging mood as she backed Victor up against the glass door and let him have it. Customers couldn't go in or come out as my pretty mother, with her long blonde braid, tight-fitting jeans, and pink tank top, came down on Victor Rathers in a big way. Get your hands off me, Victor. How dare you? How could you do such a thing to that poor woman? I know what the hell you did, you bastard. And if you ever threaten those girls or my son again, I swear to God, Victor, I will kill you. She then pointed directly at me as I sat in the passenger seat of the truck, witnessing her rage. The customers in the diners were standing at the windows watching Victor's verbal ass-whipping as my mom warned him to watch himself for something in which everyone was completely unaware of. Now you get your helpers out here to unload my damn truck this minute. I mean it, Victor. I'm so done with you, she said as she marched back to the truck. To my surprise, Victor seemed pleased that this had happened. I guess any attention from my mother was better than no attention. You're looking good, Elaine. Damn good. You'll see me again, maybe sooner than you expect, girly girl. My mother was now fuming as we drove back to the store, not saying a word. I mean it, Victor. I'm so done with you. Stuck with me. What does she mean by that? I wondered as we drove away from the store that day. How could she be done with something that never was? Or was there something? That evening, as the sun was going down, I was mowing my backyard. I was replaying the scene of my mother coming down on Victor with such anger. I never heard my mother threaten anyone in my entire life. But the way she came down on Victor that day made me wonder what my mother was truly capable of. While emptying the last basket of grass clippings in a mulch pile by the edge of the yard, a distant memory came rushing back to me. I remembered a time when I was very young, when my parents were quarreling downstairs in the kitchen. Mom's voice was more elevated than normal. But it was my father's voice that was prominent in my memory. From my window, I watched as my father walked across the backyard with my mother trailing behind him, seemingly begging him for forgiveness. My stomach wrenched in nausea as I witnessed this rare discord between my parents. How could you have done this to me, Elaine? Why were you with him, of all people? He asked as he removed his wedding band and threw it in the woods behind the house. It was when I just got here, honey. We would barely started dating. For one year, my father didn't wear a wedding band. Until one day, my mother came into the house holding a wedding band in the palm of her hand. She had somehow found it in the woods. She had been sobbing as she studied the golden band in her hand. My father approached my mother and gently took her into his arms, held her close and kissed her on the side of her face. It felt wonderful to see them come together again. It made me feel warm and safe inside. Whatever happened between my parents became history, only until now. Might it be possible that the person my father was accusing my mother of having an affair with was Victor? I shuddered at the thought of Victor having any sort of relationship with my mother, especially one of unromantic nature. Poisonous nightmares invaded my dreams for several evenings until I forced myself to push them out of my mind for what I considered to be forever. And show me a place where I don't have to hurry That's where I belong And give me some time so I can change my mind And it don't matter if I'm wrong Show me a place where I don't Way down, down in the Blue Ridge Mountains Way down where I grow Live my sweet heart of mountain Chapter 6 
As the biggest and last square dance of the summer approached and the first day of school loomed on the horizon, everyone hated to hear the sound of the trains rolling into the station. We knew that just as those big trains brought the summer girls into our tiny community, those same trains hauled them away, with most of those beautiful girls never to be seen again. For many, this was their last vacation with their mothers and grandmothers. They'd be off to their Ivy League colleges like Brown, Columbia, Dartmouth, and even Harvard. This frustrated us Melrose boys badly, because we knew that college wasn't even in our future. We were destined to remain in our dismal little town forever, intended to hook up with some dreary, boring Melrose girl. Our future seemed hopeless, so it was imperative that we made the very best of every single day left. The Granddaddy was the last square dance of the summer and the largest dance in the region. While there were many other dances in the surrounding towns, nothing compared to the Granddaddy. Bands came in from Spartanburg, Tryon, Columbus, Hendersonville, and Black Mountain to not only play for the big dance, but also to compete. Cloggers came in to compete as well, even though the superintendent changed their rules three years prior. The cloggers wore special shoes which amped up their sound in a big way, but also put marks on the gymnasium floor. This year they were told that if they came, they would have to limit their dancing to the shuffle or cadence clogging only. No stomp clogging. The granddaddy was also known for a lot of drinking, cavorting, and fighting. Many church leaders were against square dancing in its general form. They considered it sinful, almost akin to sex. They condemned the granddaddy most of all warning their flock never to attend. Doc Jones, the principal of Melrose High School, informed the Melrose Monitor that he was told by both the Lions Club and the Fire Department that the granddaddy was expected to be larger than ever before, and because of fire codes, the dance was to be moved from the school gymnasium to Main Street in the center of town. Doc, who was not really a doctor of education, but only one by nickname, was very upset with this sudden break in tradition and was blasting Mayor White, who was out of town at a mayor's convention in Charlotte. Mayor White is never around here when we need him, and we're being told now that a bunch of evangelical nutcases armed with Bibles and signs are on their way here to preach about our sinful ways. The mayor's got a lot of answering to do when he gets back into town. The man's never here when we need him. Mayor White also wasn't gaining any popularity points with the town planning committee either, especially when Ernest Juniors and two other pastors stormed the meeting and declared Melrose as a sinful basket of communist atheists. We've come down here to turn Melrose around for God's glory, charged Pastor Juniors of Holy Ministry Independent Baptist Church. It was now one week before the granddaddy, and the town was in a frenzy of flirty summer girls, jealous local females, and out-of-control men. The entire population of Melrose, which had doubled in size, was going completely crazy. Each day there were fights at the lake and on the streets of town when Gudger formally announced that he needed additional manpower and that he was formally deputizing several of his best buddies, including Victor Rathers of all people. The rumor mill was exploding with people talking about the summer girl assault and Victor's alleged involvement. The Melrose Monitor printed a weekly police report claiming the highest number of assaults in the history of the town. As many as 17 rabble-rousers spent three nights in the vault because the Honorable Judge Few couldn't schedule enough courtroom time to accommodate due process. The Monitor went on to say, that the sheriff had every right for additional manpower. These men will assist me in preventing any breach of peace in our town. I'm authorizing these fine citizens, including Victor Rathers, the right to be temporary police officers. We need help keeping law and order in this town. Now, while Mr. Rathers has fallen into some, uh, shall we say, tough times, he remains a well-respected community member, and now he has my approval to make arrests on my behalf. When my mother heard this, she threw her hands up over her head and screamed out loud, This town has gone completely insane. Now we have a sheriff who's a complete nutcase, who deputizes his own cousin, of all things, and there's absolutely nothing 
any one of us can do about this. She was in good company when she made this declaration because everyone in the store agreed with her wholeheartedly. Victor even got his own police cruiser too and immediately went to work arresting troublemakers. Many slept off their drunkenness while others fought it out together in the vault which had only one toilet and a single sink. So I guess it's about time for me to tell you a little bit about our esteemed sheriff, Gudger Knowles. Well, outside of him being a racist, liar, and a drunk, he was also known to do some pretty clever detective work. So for Gudger to say that he had nothing to go on with Victor sounded to me like a bunch of bullshit. The Knowles family was another huge family in Melrose with a history of feuding with one another, mostly over property. Gudger, along with the rest of his family, each shared the same short and stumpy look. After his father kicked the bucket, the feuding got even worse, with the stumpy brothers along with their sweet and stumpy sister fighting over anything that wasn't nailed down. Somehow, Gudger acquired a huge house just above town. How he ended up with a home twice the size of the mayor's always brought a question to the townspeople, especially when it became known that the home wasn't even in the family. My father told me a story about Gudger, and it went sort of like this. One dreadfully hot summer afternoon, two men came walking up a dirt road on the outskirts of town. The men appeared to be very scruffy and looked as if they had stolen the clothes that they were wearing. Some boys were standing by the side of the road eating tomato sandwiches when the strangers approached them. One of the men scowled at the kid and said, Hey, boy, how about helping some hungry men? They frightened the boys so badly that they gave up their lunches and soda pops to the pushy men. The shady characters proceeded up the road, eating the boys' lunches as if it were their own. Come to find out, the two men were escaped convicts from a road gang out of Tuxedo, North Carolina. The kid's mother saw what was happening in their kitchen window and placed a call to the sheriff's office. Now, Gudger mostly drove a squad car. But on this day, he appeared on the scene in his old pickup truck. He also usually donned a uniform. But on this day, he wore a plaid shirt and khakis. So he comes up the road, sees the men, smiles and waves at them, and passes by, out of sight. He then turns around back, stops by the men, and asks, Hey, y'all need a lift? Those men didn't know any better, so they just hopped on the bed of the truck as Gudger slowly traveled into town. Gudger didn't stop until he got to town hall. The men started to get off the truck when Gudger said, You fellas are under arrest. He had captured those men without a gun and never even identified himself until he locked them in the vault. Gudger was clever like that. And yep, Gudger was also Victor's second cousin. John's family had their Sunday receptions for as long as I can remember. My parents, along with John's aunts and uncles and nearby neighbors, came over at about dinner time, and it was always a wonderful time. It was held in their wood shop, where the kegs of beer were. We'd all sit around on stools next to drill presses, band saws, wood lathes, and the workbench, and eat great food, drink wonderful beer, and listen to the talk of the day. The older folks shared stories, as we younger kids just listened in. Dr. Roy never cared if we drank beer either, as I think he considered beer to be just a good old healthy drink. Each Sunday... It would be somebody else's time to cook for reception. And on this night, it was Dr. Roy's turn. He made a huge batch of his famous three-meat chili that he served in stainless steel bedpans, which he had snatched from the hospital. Everybody got a real kick out of them. The girls could not believe the hospitality at the Roy's household, with everyone accepting them in as if they were family. I could also see that Miss Martha and the girls were feeling a little better after their terrible experience a few days before. That night, John and I noticed that Victor had driven by the house about three times, very slowly. As the evening waned on and the adults got into their stories, we found the perfect opportunity to slip away with the girls and introduce them to our secret place on the rooftops of downtown. The girls could not believe our mastery of our elevated playground. We showed them most of our access hatches to the building including above the jail where we saw Gudger working at his desk below. John and I pulled the mother load of candy that night for the girls, with Carol loving the extra-large Charleston shoe. After we consumed our bounty, we moved down to the last building to the north, just across from Victor's Railhouse Diner, and we snuggled in with our dates. Now, I remained a virgin for much longer than most of my friends, 
but that night I explored new heights of intimate romance, especially when Carol taught me a new kiss, which she had learned in France. It was about 11.30 p.m. when a green Chevrolet station wagon came into town and parked at the gas station across from the railhouse diner. A woman got out and quickly walked across the street. As she passed under the street lamp, we noticed it was Amy Rathers. What the heck is she doing here at this time of night? John whispered from the next roof over. I remember thinking that the four of us resembled gargoyles as we silently spied on the dark street below. Amy entered the dark diner and didn't turn a single light on. After a short while, she left the building, crossed the street with something in her hand. As the light from a nearby streetlight illuminated her body, we each saw the reflection of a revolver in her right hand. She's got a gun, John, Jane whispered from their vantage point. She started the car and was quickly on her way back up the road and out of town. The following day, I was cleaning up a huge mess after some brat pulled a large jar of strawberry applesauce off the shelves and onto the aisle below. When Amy Rathers calmly entered the store and asked the cashier for my mom, her demeanor seemed peculiar and reminiscent of a person who had just come from a house fire. Mom lifted her head from her desk and lowered her glasses and glanced down at Amy. Something was wrong, terribly wrong with Amy, and my mother could sense it. Quickly, she was by her side and consoling her. Elaine, take this from me now before I do something terrible with it. What are you talking about, Amy? What's going on? While my mother openly despised Victor, she had a special bond with Amy because of her outward appreciation for me. I never understood why Amy favored me the way she did. Every time she saw me, she always seemed to be studying me. Holding her handbag in one hand while retrieving a huge pistol with the other, she furiously pointed the gun at the ceiling. Customers dropped to their knees as my mother confidently disarmed Amy and moved her out of the store. Take this, Elaine, before I kill Victor. My father came down from the office and retrieved the gun from my mother just as Amy collapsed into my mother's arms, crying. Did he force himself on that poor woman, Elaine? Please tell me. I want to know. Terrified customers watched from the window as my mother brought the entire scene under control. My father re-entered the store and reassured the shoppers. It's all right, people. There's no further cause of concern. Some overly concerned citizen eager to spread more gossip, must have called the sheriff's office, hoping to elevate the activity. And as expected, Gudger was on the scene in a heartbeat with a condescending smile on his face. He approached as if he were separating a pair of frightened hens. Calm down, ladies, before you cause a panic attack here. I could read his lips like a book. He treated my mother and Amy as if they were children. I left the store and stood by the Coke machine and listened in on the discord. Gudger! You had better do something about your cousin before someone takes matters into their own hands. Can't you see how Victor is wrecking this poor woman's life? What is that monster going to do next, Gudger? And why the hell is he not in jail? You better lock him in the vault because he'll be a lot safer there than in this filthy diner. Your cousin is a louse, Gudger. And I'm worried about what crazy thing he'll do next. Oh, calm down, Elaine. Gudger's fake smile was gone and replaced with a frown. You need to stop placing blame on Victor for everything that happens in this town. Victor had nothing to do with whatever happened with that, that summer girl. What do you mean by that summer girl? You never treat those visitors with any respect. That poor woman was assaulted and maybe even raped. Elaine, she was not raped. There was no evidence of that. And plus, there were no witnesses that saw a damn thing. Everyone in town knows just how much you despise Victor over what happened so dang long ago. So why don't you just drop it before I say something I shouldn't ought to? Gudger was advancing on my mother just as I came to her aid. Stay away from my mother, Gudger, before I... Before you what, little man? Rainy Ray, you've been spending way too much time over at that woman's house. Stay in there at the wee hours of the morning. <laughs> For all I know, you might be the one who got a little too frisky with that lady. I know you've been there because I've been checking on that house on a nightly basis. After all this baloney started happening. How dare you accuse my son of anything? You leave him out of this. You make me sick, Gudger. My mother was now on a warpath as I placed my arms around her to keep her from charging Gudger down. Those summer girls come here every dang summer, strutting their stuff around town. 
flaunting their little perky bodies, driving all us boys crazy. The woman's a divorcee and likely here for a good time. So now it's the poor woman's fault. Elaine, don't act like you don't know what them summer girls do to get all the attention of our local boys. For hell's sake, I'll never forget the day you came into town flaunting your daddy's big money and her big fancy red convertible with your short sundress. I could not believe what I was hearing as my mother reached a boiling point. If my father had heard that, I can't even imagine what he would have done. Things were about to explode when I centered myself between my mother and the sheriff. Gudger, why don't you just get on out of here? We've had enough of you. Don't you ever tell me what to do, Rainy Ray. And I'm not leaving here until I get Victor's gun. We know that Amy stole it from Victor. I didn't steal anything, Gudger. That gun belongs to me, and I may use it one day, too. And shame on you, Gudger, for not allowing the hospital to fully examine that poor woman. Shame on you! cried Amy. She dropped to her knees and wept. How do you know Victor didn't hurt that woman? Tell me, Gudger. What makes you so sure? Because Victor was with me after he got all bloodied up by that Larson Darnell and his buddies. Oh, so he was with you. Really? Is that right? Probably drinking corn liquor, too. Now, why don't you get off my property now before I call the county? I'm telling you, you really have overstepped your bounds this time. That evening, after the grueling scene with Amy Rathers and the sheriff, Mom left early and had gone over to the Roy's house to commiserate with John's mother with a glass of wine and most likely a cigarette. Truth be told, my mom was a stress smoker, and Mrs. Roy was known to sneak a few puffs from time to time as well. I felt the worst was over for the day, but was I ever mistaken? we just locked the front door and were walking to the truck when a police cruiser pulled up in the parking lot with none other than Victor alone at the wheel. The sight seemed comical to me, but appalling to my father as he purposely acted as if the cruiser was invisible. Get in the truck, son, he said as he opened the passenger door and gestured me in. Well, hey there, Wilfred. Nice truck you got there. I heard you bought a new one, and whoa, what a beauty that is. I said, get in the truck, son. Do as I say. What'd you pay for them wheels, Wilford? I swear, you must be the luckiest man in town. My father stepped around the back of the truck and opened the door and reached around the back of the seat for something. Oh, come on, Wilford. You and I are friends, remember? There's no need for you to ignore me. I've just come by to pick something up that's rightfully mine. And what would that be, Victor? My father said crossly, turning to face Victor. Within the cab of the truck, he took firm hold of a wooden nightstick. The nightstick was actually an axe handle, and the only weapon my father ever owned, up until the time my mother bought a Smith & Wesson with a six-inch barrel for the store. I never saw my dad ever use that nightstick, but I was convinced he could handle it well. I've come down here to get my pistol that Amy brought down here this afternoon. I swear that woman's hormones are driving me crazy. I think she must be going through some sort of change of life thing. Well, it's not here, Victor, so I guess you ought to ask your wife about its whereabouts. Besides, she told Gudger that the gun was hers anyway. Oh, she did, did she? That sorry bitch. Is that right? Well, it ain't hers, Wilfred. It's mine, and I want it back. For the last time, Victor, it's not here. Amy has it. Victor's face was no longer jovial but was turning a threatening shade of red. I tell you, Wilford, that woman has been getting on my last nerve here lately. She's got this whole dang town worked up about some bullshit about that summer girl getting roughed up the other night. She's got some damn screwball idea that it was me that done it. Well, did you? Did I what? Did you rough the woman up, Victor? Well, hell no. Well, then, Victor, that sounds like a problem you're going to have to sort out with your wife and the law if we have any in this town. Oh, well, that's no way to talk about our sheriff, especially when your wife's been filling everybody's head about this crap about me. I believe you better tell Elaine to cease and desist. Yeah, that's the right legal term for it, ain't it? Victor slowly opened the car door and began walking towards the truck. He was wearing a deputy's uniform that was way too big for him, and he looked stupid in it, except for the gun in his holster. Wilford. If I were you, I'd keep an eye on that boy of yours. He's been spending entirely too much time over at that, that woman's house. I'd hate to think that he had anything to do with this trouble over there the other night. My father's knuckles were almost white as he gripped the end of the nightstick. Ain't that right, Rainy Ray? <laughs> I'd hate to haul you in for questioning and let you spend a fun-filled night in that vault 
Why, anything could happen to a young boy like you in that vault. My father had had enough, and before Victor even knew what happened, he had him up against the side of the car with a nightstick stuffed into his gut. That's enough, Victor. If you ever threaten my boy or wife again, I'll bury this stick in the center of your brain. Oh, is that how it works now? You're threatening an officer's law. I don't make threats, Victor, my father said as he grabbed both ends of the stick and crossbarred it across Victor's throat. I make promises. Did you hear that wrangling? Your father here has just threatened to kill me. You better watch yourself, Wilford, before I'm forced to bring some truth into your happy home. You and I have a lot between us, don't we, Wilford? Maybe it's about time that we let your son know just how much we have between us. My father was boiling over with anger and coming very close to dropping Victor to his knees. When he suddenly released his hold, Victor stumbled sideways and fell to the ground. Dang, Wilford, you got one heck of a temper there, now, don't you? Victor quickly regained his composure and was back on his feet with his hand resting on the grip of his gun. He looked like a cheap version of Wyatt Earp. Your, your wife, your boy, Wilford, don't make me laugh. You're nothing but an actor playing your part pretty well. Victor said as he retreated back to the driver's seat of the police cruiser. Oh, you know, I think your boy's looking more and more like you every single day, don't you? Victor shouted with a mocking laugh as he drove away. The impact of that remark on my father was palatable, so much so that he didn't say anything the entire way home. But the impact on me didn't occur until I finally fell asleep that night. When I was much younger, I was known to be a sleepwalker. Mom and their friends thought it was cute when I suddenly appeared, walked through their dinner party, completely asleep. But this event was not funny at all. I awoke standing in front of the mirror, which hung on the wall above my dresser. The reflection I saw in the mirror was not me at all. The image startled me so much, though, that I cried for help. My father came into my room, followed by my mother, who was terrified. What's wrong, son? My God, Rainy Ray, you're sweating, Mom said as she embraced me in her arms. He was in the mirror, not me. Who, son? My father asked. Who was in the mirror? Victor was. Victor, Victor was in the mirror. Oh, he's got you all upset, son. Now let's all look in the mirror together, shall we? Look. See, honey. Everything's okay. There's no Victor. It's just us, dear. Mom? What happened between you and Victor? She pulled my damp forehead against her face and pressed her lips against my cheek. I felt her shudder and noticed her staring at my father's reflection in the mirror. Never you mind, Rainy Ray. Just relax and go back to bed. It's been too much of an emotional day for all of us here. The image in the mirror was gone, but I was shaken to the core with the questions. Just who was Victor, anyway? I asked myself as I returned back to bed for the remainder of a sleepless night. And furthermore, who am I? Chapter 7 Nice job! I would be remiss if I left out another piece of information that substantiates the reason why the granddaddy was so popular. Admittedly, I must confess, that I'm embarrassed to even tell you about this cockeyed annual event which attracted people to Melrose like birdseed to bears. Let me first reference Tryon, our most sophisticated town to the south of us. There once was a wealthy man from the Midwest by the name of Carter Brown, who visited Tryon in its infancy, and was later credited by many to have invented Tryon. Mr. Brown was an architect, innkeeper, horseman, and visionary. Prior to Brown's arrival, and before the railroad, Tryon was as boring as we were. 
But through Brown's efforts, Tryon became a cultural equestrian mecca and a hangout for fancy people like F. Scott Fitzgerald, David Nivid, and Lefty Flynn. Mr. Brown was also extremely connected to some of the most wealthiest people in the country. These people came to Tryon in droves and stayed in this fancy hotel. Fox hunting became a sport of choice and the most sophisticated pastime to the elegant people of Tryon. Fox hunting was characterized as a group of haughty horse people, spending their days on horseback, some being overly juiced by cognac and bourbon as they chased after a helpless fox. I'll spare you the details on what happened after they caught that poor fox. Now, to be fair, Melrose had one famous star by the name of Perry Como, who lived here part-time. The famous singer loved the privacy he had in Melrose, because most everyone here didn't even know who the hell he was. Now, by contrast, Melrose had its own pastime sport, but without expensive horses and sophisticated people. The activity was simply called coon hunting. The drink of choice from our town heathens was not expensive cognac or bourbon, but moonshine. While most raccoons were left to rot, they were hunted for their fur, and the vast majority were eaten. It was also most common that if the hunt was unsuccessful, they would settle for squirrel. In the mid-60s, hunters actually killed off all of the raccoons in and around Melrose, causing coon hunting to come to a halt. What in the world would our town ever do? Well, our esteemed sheriff, Gudger Knowles, came up with a brilliant idea that would both revitalize the coon population in our area and put cash into his own pocket. Gudger had a similarly stumpy cousin living on the panhandle of Florida by the name of Howitt, Howitt Knowles. Howitt was an active coon hunter in a state that was overrun by raccoons. That's when a light bulb switched off at his ingenious head of trapping and transporting coons from Florida to North Carolina. Howitt was aware of the coon shortage in Melrose and also the Grand Daddy annual dance. He thought square dancing, food, parades, cash, hmm. Howitt concocted an idea that Gudger would create an annual town holiday on the exact same day as the granddaddy that would be called Coon Dog Day. Funding generated from the festival would be enough for Howitt and his buddies to trap as many coons as possible in Florida and transport the little friskies to Melrose. After one close call by Gudger's nephew, who was caught driving a truck full of raccoons through southern Georgia one year before it became a federal offense, the Knowles clan found another ingenious way to smuggle the trapped animals in the belly of an old orange juice truck, and Coon Dog Day was born. Most people loved the event, even though they had no idea what was going on. I thought the entire thing was stupid and cruel to those poor raccoons. They concocted some sort of a hillbilly parade where all the coon hunters drove through town with their prized coon dogs on the back of their truck. Some went so far as to tie a terrified raccoon on the top of a pole mounted in the back of their truck. They'd taunt the dogs to jump up and try to grab the coon. Finally, someone from the government toned down this sort of activity after they found out about a contest where they would float a raccoon on a raft in the middle of a lake and send a pack of coon dogs after the lone raccoon. Coon Dog Day took on a tacky character of its own, complete with a hillbilly parade and disgusting coon dog competitions, which were later banned by the North Carolina legislature. While many people thought the redneck holiday was stupid, myself included, it proved to be a huge moneymaker for not only Gudger, but the town and my parents as well. Bill Ragg at the packing house in Hendersonville was also happy in the boosting of my father's meat orders. In preparation of the huge event, Mom and I drove up to Hendersonville for a large load of beef. But instead of going straight to the packing house, we made a surprise visit to an old friend. Pepper's Deli and Tavern was owned by Bill Ragg's closest friend, Jerry Pepper. Jerry was also from Brooklyn and had the accent to prove it. He was a stout man with a huge neck and thick arms. At 5'4 and about 185 pounds, Mr. Pepper had the presence and charisma of a man twice his size. He loved my mother and highly respected my father. 
My father respected Jerry for obvious reasons and had stories to prove it. First off, my dad said that Jerry Pepper was one of the toughest sons of bitches he's ever met. Secondly, one thing Jerry Pepper was not affiliated with was the mob. He was a full-fledged member of the Mafia. Jerry Pepper was an alias name, and my father thought his real name was Luchasi, but didn't know for sure. My mother told me that the one thing you should never do is ever call Jerry Pepper Dr. Pepper after the soda pop. That would be a huge mistake. When we walked in, we were eagerly welcomed by both Bill Ragg and Mr. Pepper and highly entertained by his antics. Jerry was a trickster and had a way of making money by daring big, tough men to pick him up off the floor. I bet you five dollars that I can put two fingers on you and you'll not be able to pick me up off the floor. Jerry said to a man much larger that took his bet. Jerry would place one finger on the edge of the man's shoulders, halfway between the shoulder point and the other at the base of the man's ear. One by one, the brutes failed to lift Jerry Pepper off the floor. And in a space of five minutes, I watched Jerry Pepper stuff 20 bucks in his pocket. Rainy Ray, come on over here, big man, and lift me up. Do you want to make an easy fin? At 17, I felt I was much stronger than most kids my size. Because every two weeks, we'd come up and pick up at least one cow that was divided into four pieces. I'd sling those heavy slabs of beef over my back and take them out to our pickup truck. Then we'd get back to the store. I'd carry those heavy slabs of meat from the truck into the cooler and hang them up on hooks. So how hard could it be, I thought. As I studied the size of this relatively small man. Get on over here, Rainy Ray, and pick me up. I dare you. Ah, what the hell, I mumbled as I approached Jerry Pepper, who just lit up a camel non-filter and stuck it between his lips. You ready, Rainy Ray? Go ahead, big man. Give it all you got. I did not feel the pressure of his finger on my shoulder on my neck until I struggled to lift Mr. Pepper as he laughed out loud with a cigarette stuck between his teeth. Oh, come on, boy. You can do much better than that. Sharp pain shot through my neck and shoulders as I reached around and gave Jerry a huge bear hug. I glanced over at my mother, who was standing next to Mr. Rag, smiling at me. She seemed so out of place, being the only woman in this bar. It was then a vision of Victor that popped into my mind, and his haunting threat fired up my protective instincts. You're looking good, Elaine. Damn good. You'll see me again, maybe sooner than you expect, girly girl. More than ever, I wanted to crush Victor and protect my mother from this despicable man as adrenaline surged through my body. This one's for you, you son of a bitch. I gave it all I had as I fought through the pressure points and lifted Jerry off his feet by at least a foot off the floor. My mother... The patrons and even Jerry Pepper cheered as the force of my anger blew the cigarette out of Jerry's mouth and across the room. Once on his feet, Jerry Pepper gave me a kiss on the cheek as he stuffed all of his winnings in my pocket. Now what's this about this, uh, Victor Rathers? The four of us had lunch and talked about the store, our summer girlfriends, and then finally Victor. I knew that Jerry Pepper had a special fondness for my mother, but his concern for her well-being was surprising to me. It was almost as if he dealt with Victor, and maybe even Gudger, before in the past. Elaine, you tell Wilfred that if any one of those Jim Bonies give you any trouble at all, I want you to pick up the phone and give me a call. I'll come down there personally and give them the what for. After we loaded up the meat and drove down the mountain towards Melrose, I could hear my mother humming a tune and smiling for the first time in what seemed like a while. As we passed Lake Summit, I looked off and noticed the people on the shoreline. The kids were going down the slides, and the lifeguards were on the diving boards. I wondered if Miss Martha and those pretty girls were there enjoying the sun. I wished that I could have been there with them, but I had a truckload of meat and a full day of work ahead of me. I also thought about Victor Rathers and Gudger again and wondered what might happen next. My mother scooted next to me, kissed me on my cheek, and rested her head on my shoulder. I took my time driving back to the store that day, savoring the warmth I had with my mother's sweet soul. It was a memory that I'll never forget as my mom and I moved down that wonderful highway on that gorgeous summer day. I could tell that my mother felt more secure after talking with Jerry Pepper, even though I 
would never expect my parents to ask Jerry Pepper for anything, especially protection. Even though Jerry Pepper was a nice man to my parents, it was quietly rumored that he would kill a man for $500. I also remember my father once saying that one should never call on the Mafia for a favor unless you have no other choice, because you would owe not only Jerry Pepper, but the Brooklyn-based family a favor in return for the rest of your life. The most unsettling thing about this entire situation with Victor Rathers was that I never witnessed my parents and myself being more threatened in my entire life. I thought anything was possible. A story came out in the Melrose Monitor stating that Larson Darnell and three other men had the crap kicked out of them and were all arrested for the beating of Victor Rathers. Larson and his buddies spent 19 hours in the vault sleeping some of the time and crying out for help the rest of the time. Gudger waited a full week before arresting the foursome, giving each enough time to believe that they might have gotten away with cleaning Victor's clock. The police report claimed that Mr. Darnell, a lifelong painter, fell from his own ladder while painting a second-story window casing at the Melrose Inn. Gudger told the monitor that he had plenty of evidence to charge Mr. Darnell and the others with attempted murder, even though he didn't have a single witness that saw the beating. Clearly, Larson's injuries were not even comparable to Victor's bloody nose. Dr. Roy examined Darnell in his cell and reported that he was missing a front tooth, had a broken nose, a black eye, and was suffering from a severely bruised scrotum. It also seemed hugely unlikely that one person could cause that much damage, especially given the fact that Larson was one of the biggest guys in town. The fact that the Melrose Monitor didn't write a single word about the assault on the Summer Girl was a point of contention with my mother. As she stormed through the doors of the Melrose Monitor and straight into the publisher's office, she slammed a copy of the Monitor on the desk and read him the riot act. Kevin, you write only what you want to write in this town, but you never write about anything that really matters to anyone. It seems all you want to do is sell advertising. Kevin Powers was considered by many to be the ruination of the Melrose Monitor because the town commissioners and the police department appeared to have way too much control over what was and what was not printed. How can you expect our town to even be aware of the dangers in our own midst when you print more about poor, defenseless Victor Rathers than the people hurting? Kevin, I was once proud of our local paper and considered it to be a real partner in our town, but you've turned it into a worthless rag. Since Kevin fired his editor and retained only a single reporter, to write only about nonsensical news like a local beekeeper losing her bees because of a bear or some redneck losing his prize coon dog, circulation had dropped steeply. Also, because the paper was so thin, most of the people in town didn't even know about Victor's alleged rape of the summer girl, while others took the same position as Gudger did, that the summer girls were just plain flirts out for a good time. Truth be known, it was the Melrose boys who were the real flirts, and adults like Victor, they were the ones looking for a good time. It wasn't until word got out that Victor had beaten up his wife, Amy, and that he was staying at Gudger's house when people were about to string Victor up by his ankles. While Victor was barely tolerated by the community, people adored Amy and were very concerned about her absence from the tax office. Things got so intense that Victor couldn't even set foot in his own diner for fear of being chased out. He left the daily operations entirely of the hands of K.C. It was amazing how this totally blind man could run the entire diner by himself. Now that Victor had lost his footing in the community, he switched into Mr. Bad Cop, a pushy, 
angry policeman with no knowledge of police work at all. He also crowned himself a full-fledged cop with Gudger and his cronies allowing it. Victor was also coming down on the black community like there was no tomorrow, arresting them for jaywalking, loitering, or even looking at him the wrong way. Gudger even made Victor his top deputy and allowed Victor to activate his own squad of bully cops any time he wanted with a single order. <sighs> Thankfully, the more the townspeople learned about Amy, the more they came to believe that maybe just Victor might have actually assaulted and possibly even raped Miss Martha. The more the community saw Victor bullying everyone in town, the more they wanted to complain to the mayor, who was still out of town. Having dinner at Miss Martha's house for the next several nights was more acceptable to my parents than ever, because they had become quite fond of her. They felt that it was also safer for Miss Martha and the girls to have us around, just in case Victor resurfaced. Pearlie May and her daughter spent there about as much time as John and I did, and I thought it was kind of odd. It was almost as if they were keeping watch over us, while Pearlie May tended to her chores as normal. Hattie May seemed rather strange and anxious. Several times I noticed her watching me and appearing as if she wanted to come up and talk to me. It was the Wednesday night before the granddaddy that Victor broke silence and ran his police car over Miss Martha's mailbox. He was drunk and heading straight for the front door. Miss Martha, I'm so sorry about hitting your mailbox. If you just come out and let me in your garage, I could borrow your shovel and fix it right up. Not a word from inside the house as Carol desperately called the sheriff's office with no answer. Again and again she tried to call the sheriff. I was hoping to see you again, Miss Martha. I feel so bad about not being able to see you now for several days. But this town has gone so gall darn crazy. All the men are so nutsy about all y'all leaving soon and the big dance on Friday. Miss Martha just stood there in the foyer saying nothing as the six of us, including Pearlie May and Hattie May, held our breath in silence. You're going to the granddaddy this Friday night, Miss Martha, ain't you? God, girly girl, I sure hope so. I can't wait to see you again. I miss your pretty face, Miss Martha. I really do. I've been so depressed lately because of this whole town thinking I've done something wrong to you. Now, you might not know this by now, but my crazy wife's done left me. <laughs> yep, she's gone. Fact is, she never loved me anyway. She thought she was so much more educated than me with that dang college degree and some French thing called a resume. Holy shit, Amy left town, I whispered in John's ear. I'm afraid she's found out about us, Martha. And she's done left town. She was a crazy bitch anyway. But she's right about one thing, Miss Martha. And you want to know what that is? I'm in love with another woman. And that other woman's you. Still silence as he rapped harder on the door with what sounded like a beer bottle. Oh, come on, Martha. Open up the dang door. Victor was becoming frustrated. Ah, heck with this, he said as he walked back out to the squad car and retrieved another bottle of beer. He lit up a cigarette and sat down on the steps on the front porch. Screw them. After a few minutes of mumbling obscenities, he got up and hurled his beer bottle into the neighbor's yard, then staggered back to his car. Sons of a bitch, God dang it. Shit. Hey, Rainy Ray, <laughs> I know you're in there with Doc's boy. You boys had better keep your dang hands off those pretty ladies. <laughs> because I'm going to be looking for them at the big dance on Friday. You remember what I told you, Rainy Ray? I'm sure you do. Oh, I know that Miss Pearlie May and her pretty little daughter is in there, too. I hope that they know that I love them just as much as I love my own kin. But I don't want them to tell anybody about me being there the other night. <laughs> ah, hell. I don't care. They can tell whoever they want to. After Victor left, John and I pleaded with Miss Martha to please cut her vacation short and take the girls back to Charleston. But she wouldn't hear of it. She was also defiant about taking her pretty girls to the dance. After the girls went to bed, and we felt that they were safe, John and I decided to pay another visit on top of the jail. At about 1.15 a.m., 
Victor drove into town and pulled up to the sheriff's office. He got out of his car and staggered in to have a chat with Gudger. I bet Gudger called him in from his drunken patrol, said John. We quietly made our way back to the roof of the police station and very carefully moved our access panel just a crack so we could listen in. Gudger was sitting at his desk, appearing as if he had summoned Victor in to talk. But Victor looked far from having a sober conversation with anybody. Victor, your drinking is really getting out of hand. Now just how much have you had tonight? Oh, not enough, I expect. In order to come over here and see you, why'd you call me over here anyway? But before we go any further, why don't we have a few shots of your swamp grass? You look like you could need some, too. No way, Victor. Someone's got to keep on this damn town, and you're not making things much easier. Now, you told me you were going to tie up some loose ends, but this whole thing's just flaring up in my face. This whole dang town thinks you had your way with that summer girl out there on Lake Summit. Yeah, well, so what? You said you were going to shut this whole dang thing down for me. I think you're losing your effectivity, cousin. Damn it, Victor. I've been covering for your whole damn life, but this time I think you've really done it. Why can't you ever take no for an answer with these women? Now I'm even learning that you roughed up your own wife, Amy. Ah, uh, that woman's a bitch. I still can't find my own pistol. But that's okay, because I got my own issue right here on my hip. Ah, uh, that damn woman's driving me crazy lately. All about my drinking, too. Her problem is she don't drink a damn drop, Gudger. Stop your yammering, Victor. Don't screw it up. She's the best thing that's ever happened to you. Ah, don't worry about her. She adores me. She'd never leave me. I got full control over that little woman. <laughs> so what about the other night when you were having your way with that uh, bleach blonde? Who in the hell called Dr. Roy in for a house call? It wasn't her daughter and her little friend because I saw them at the dance while you were over there loving up with that summer thing. Oh, it's just this little damn nig... Oh, uh, never you mind, Sheriff. I'll take care of that situation shortly. Now hit me up for some of that homebrew and let's forget about this whole dang thing. Not so fast, Victor. You better find out who that was because I can't keep covering for your ass. Gudger got out of the chair and walked over to a mounted picture on the wall next to the gun rack and slid it to the side, revealing a large supply of bottles. Moving the picture back in place, he sat back down with Victor and the two of them began to slam them down. Mmm, mmm, Sheriff, you make some of the best hooch in this county. I think you've got this shit down to a science, said Victor as he stared through the clear booze in his glass. Mmm, mmm. What's your production volume now, cousin? Why do you ask? Well, let's just say, uh, I've got to cover your butt, too, if you know what I mean. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about now, Victor? Well, Gudger, you know, people, more often than not, been asking me how the hell you would afford in this old big old mansion up there on Greenville Street on a sheriff's salary. <laughs> oh, come on now, Gudger. You know as well as I do that we both have been living pretty high on the hog due to your, uh, operation. It wouldn't sit too well if Mr. and Mrs. Uh, John Q. Melrose learned just how much whiskey you're producing up there in Holbert Cove. It'd be even worse if the county were to find out exactly where your operation is. Are you with me on that, cousin? Are you following me? Are you threatening me, Victor? Because it sure sounds like you're up to something here. I'm just saying... You better watch my ass just as much as I'm watching yours. Well, Victor, I think you're digging yourself into a deeper hole than I may be able to pull you out of. The two were now several shots into their conversation when Gudger looked as if he was about ready to explode. Gudger, <laughs> and now that I'm no longer a member of that old fancy church, I really don't care what the pastor and all them fat congregation people might think of me anymore. Ah, now shut up, Victor. You're really starting to piss me off now. You ain't seen pissed off, Gudger. Now I want you to keep the heat off me with all this silly rape garbage, or I'll blow a hole in your world. You've got more riding on my well-being than you ever really know. At that exact moment, our little party on the rooftop above the sheriff's office became shocked. Gudger finally lost his cool and let the booze control his emotion when he revealed a forty-four Magnum long barrel and pointed it right at Victor's head. Now you listen to me, 
asshole. If I ever hear any mention of Holbert Cove or anything about my business, I'll burn you down, cousin. I mean, you're dying or and all. You got that, Victor? Right now, you're nothing but a bum with a badge. There was a long pause as the two drunks stared at each other and waited for the other to blink. <laughs> oh, come on now, cousin. Calm the heck down. I was just yanking your chain. I'd never turn on my own blood. I mean, we're family, Gudger. Hey, my mama, your mama, hell, we just one tight-knit little family, ain't we? <laughs> I'd never do anything to break their hearts. More silence as Gudger pulled back the hammer on his pistol. Wrong, Victor. Guess what? My mama hates your mama's guts more than you'll ever know. Now get out there and fix things, Victor, and get the hell out of my sight. I hadn't recognized the full weight of stress on me until I noticed just how much time I was spending on the rooftops of downtown. I was spending all night up there, often falling asleep under the stars. Alone I sat into the wee hours of the morning, right above Western Auto, watching the town below, worrying about my parents, Miss Martha, the girls, and especially myself. My mother was a wreck. My father lost his smile, and I was suffering from a constant upset stomach. I was steeply falling into an identity crisis, often looking at my reflection in the mirror or a passing window and seeing less and less resemblance of my father and more and more of Victor Rathers. I no longer felt like a cool, reasonably good-looking young product of a wonderful family but a gross byproduct mini version of Victor Rathers. Everything happens for a reason, they often say. But what if I become a duplicate of Victor? I shuddered as I touched my face and measured the length of my nose. Was I destined to become a balloon in the wind as my mother often coined the half-witted idiot Victor? I even went so far as to worry that my mother might look at me and see only Victor's face. How could she continue to love me and stand by me and even feel close to me anymore? Finally, a brief intermission saved me. A small amount of humor popped into my mind and caused me to giggle under my breath when an image of the hunchback of Notre Dame visited me. Comedy relief, I thought. At least I can still smile. Keep your shit together, Rainy Ray. I mumbled under my breath. Things are going to get better soon. I hope. I'd wait for the last commuter train from New York City to Jacksonville, Florida to buzz through our town, never even bothering to stop. I thought my life was passing me by, just like that train, and Melrose was nothing more than a forgotten little town. I was so close to jumping on that doubleheader, clinging for my dear life, and riding that monster the hell out of here. As the train rumbled and approached, the ground began to shake. I imagined the rooftops as my own private train, with the jail being the caboose and the locomotive way up front. My train was now in serious competition with the next train coming, and a training ground for my future jump to freedom. As the rumbling train approached and the ground began to shake, off I dashed like a wild stallion. My adrenaline soared as I leaped from peak to peak in an all-out race against the massive machine. I became so proficient at running on those rooftops that I often ran faster than the passing train. How dare you, you filthy son of a bitch! How dare you spreading your smelly black soot all over our shabby little town! Shame on you for taking those pretty girls away from us every damn summer, and shame on you for leaving me here to rot! I yelled as I took my final flying leap forward. I'm going to jump that southern creeper one day soon and ship my ugly ass down the grade and the hell away from here. I promised as I tearfully watched the last car fade off into the darkness. I tell you what, I'll buy a spot not very far from town. If you'll agree to marry me, you both will settle down. Where the wild honey is a clue and bring flowers to grow. So lay it upon that garden gate and say hello. Hello, 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 our voice and music ring. Sweet 
Chapter 9. Melrose had a funny way with visitors. For the most part, all of the men and boys loved the summer girls, for obvious reasons. But also, for obvious reasons, the entire female population of Melrose, except for my mother, felt threatened by the female invaders. Now most of our loving little town hardly tolerated any visitors at all. Well, if there was a way of making money off the visiting intruders during Coon Day or the Granddaddy, well then, by all means, come on in, y'all. But still, most did not like outsiders buying up our homes, then moving into our town and trying to change things. Our town didn't like change of any kind, unless the change was in the form of cash. People would say, they move in here into our town, claiming like they like Melrose more than where they come from. But as soon as they move in, all they want to do is change things. If they don't like the way we do things here in our town, then they might as well just leave. My father welcomed change because it meant growth. And it appeared that we would need growth badly and real soon because of a new interstate that was about to be completed just outside of town. It was expected that people were bound to shop more at those big department stores up in Hendersonville or down in Spartanburg instead of our podunk little out-of-the-way town. Oh, here's another thing. It wasn't until I reached my ninth grade that I noticed that the retailers loved to play a silly little joke on the visitors who were gaily strolling along the sidewalks licking their ice cream cones or sipping on their root beer floats. The locals would suddenly duck into their stores when a loud train passed through town, depositing a thick coating of soot all over anybody who was standing near the tracks. Women in their fancy sundresses or men in their seersucker suits and hats suddenly became filthy, while the men in the barber shop just sat there and laughed. Other times, tricksters at the depot would quietly nudge some rich person's luggage just a little too close to the train, only to be picked up by a cow catcher on an incoming locomotive. Often we'd see underwear from an open suitcase scatter like hens across the rails and onto the main street below. On Thursday morning, before the Grand Daddy, the fire department began marking staging locations for the Coon Dog Day Parade. I could hear them hammering the wooden stakes on our tree lawns up and down the street. The parade was scheduled to start at 11 a.m. Friday morning, and everyone in the parade had to be at their assigned location by 9 a.m. We could expect a large custom-made float, a classic car, dressed-up tractor, horses, or a pack of coon hounds sitting in the street right in front of our house. Jeff Tennant, our fire chief, would be directing the entire operation on the corner, while his volunteers happily followed his orders. As expected, Victor Rathers took this opportunity to stage himself right outside of our house, as if he was the parade commander. My mother was about to blow her top again as she looked through the living room window at Victor, standing in the street, making himself look all big and important. Would you look at that idiot standing out there thinking he's the real thing? My mother whispered as she peeked out from behind the curtain. Victor stood out there all puffed up like a tom turkey, strutting his stuff in his stupid police uniform. He even took a step further wearing mirror sunglasses. Reluctantly, Mom and I were forced to leave the house and walk right past Victor to our truck. Well, looky there! There's Rainy Ray and his gorgeous mother. Hey, Elaine, you're sure looking fine this morning. I swear you're looking younger every single day. That reminds me when you first moved here. Remember them days, Lane? I sure do. I'm going to do my best to make sure we put the prettiest float right in front of your house tomorrow morning. Don't you worry about a thing, pretty lady. <laughs> Again, my mother didn't say a word until I dropped her off in town to help the other volunteers set up the greeting tables for the following morning. I had three meat deliveries to make that day, with the Railhouse Diner being the last one. I was not too concerned about stopping in because I was confident that Victor would not be there. I backed my truck up to the loading dock, got out of the truck, and climbed the steps to the back of the kitchen. Brian Osborne, their main chef, slapped me on my back and said, Hey, Rainy Ray, I'll go ahead and take it from here. KC wants to see you in the office. He's got something for you. I found my way back to Victor's dreary office in the back of the kitchen and saw KC sitting at a desk in the darkness. The office was cramped with cinder block walls, a cement floor, and a thick smell of mold. 
The walls were covered with half-nude calendar girls, past orders and receipts. Victor's such a pig, I thought. Hey there, Rainy Ray. I'm glad to see you today. Casey was busy writing out checks and listening to the activity in the kitchen. Close the door, son, and pull up a chair. Oh, and turn a light on. I keep forgetting to do that for visitors. KC was signing invoices and moving papers around as if he had 20-20 vision. Here, he said as he tore a check out of a large checkbook and handed it to me. Take this to your daddy, Rainy Ray. Victor ain't paid you all for a long time, but we're paid up now. And tell your mom I'm sorry about that, too. Yes, sir, I said, looking down at a check for more than $1,100. Never had I picked up a check from a customer before. That was always my mom's job, and I had no idea that the rail house was that far in arrears. I didn't know that Victor owed us that much, Casey. Wow. I thought of my dad, and I wondered why he never even mentioned that Victor wasn't paying his bills. How's Elaine doing, son? I heard Victor's been badgering your mom and daddy in a bad way. I don't like it. No, sir. I don't like that whatsoever. Yeah, he's really got our family upset in a big way. My mom is awfully tired of Victor. And he's got my dad really angry, too. That man's in a bad way these days. I mean, a bad way, Rainy Ray. I ain't never seen him this bad before. With his drinking, cavorting with that stubborn girl, and poor Amy. Mm, mm, mm. I think refusing to pay your daddy was some form of payback or spite. What for? Why would he do that? I had considered not commenting about my family situation at first. But the more I saw just how much K.C. knew about the whole situation, the more I thought he needed some more answers. K.C. reached under the desk and pulled out a burlap bag stuffed with newspaper and something else inside. Rainy Ray, I want you to take this before somebody does something real terrible with it. I felt the weight of the bag as he handed it over to me. I loosened the opening and moved the papers around until I noticed a pistol. It was Amy's gun and it was fully loaded. Holy shit! What the heck am I supposed to do with this thing, Casey? To my knowledge, we did not even have a gun in our house, and my dad refused to even buy me a BB gun for fear I'd shoot my eye out. The only experience I had with a weapon was a squirt gun. Well, that's not entirely true. John had several BB guns, including a CO2 pellet gun, which we would shoot at passing boxcars. But a loaded gun? Where would I put it? What if Victor found out that I had it? It's okay, Rainy Ray. Neither one of them know where that gun is. Because if they did, I have a feeling they might use it on each other. So take it with you, Rainy Ray, and get it out of here. What's wrong with Victor, KC? Do you have any idea what's going on in his head? I think he's lost his mind. Well, I think it goes back a long way, Rainy Ray. Victor's father was a good man. I mean, he was a good, good man. Now I'm going to tell you something you might not know. But Victor's daddy raised me up ever since I was a little child. He took me off the street and raised me like I was his own son. Wow, I didn't know that, Casey. That man sent me to school for the deaf and blind and paid for everything. He gave me a job in this here store. Who would do that, Rainy Ray? I was nothing more than a poor, blind, black boy. And that man gave me everything. But what about Victor? Why did he turn out to be such a mess? Well... <laughs> Victor's always been a mess, Rainy Ray. Some people are just born that way. But as a child, white folks used to tease him about me, saying he had a nappy-headed brother and all. Even though Victor thought he could fight, he finally realized he wasn't as good as the other boys at it. Then he started resenting me for his problems, until his daddy stepped in and straightened him out. Casey... I said as I lodged my first question, What went on between Victor and my mother? Well, Victor fell for your mother in a big way. I mean, a big, big way. And that's before your parents were married. They carried on as a couple for a little while. Well, there it was, I thought, as I felt my face getting flushed. Well, then what happened? Rainy Ray, Victor's never been the kind to take no for an answer. That's the way he's always been, with everything. I mean, he was that way with his daddy. He was that way with his teachers and most of all the girls. He always wanted his way with the women. I sent off my second question. Well, did he have his way with my mother, Casey? Son, that's not for me to tell you anything about. 
That's your mama's business. Did Victor rape my mom? Well, I can tell you he troubled her in a big way. And he even stalked her, too. Well, how did it stop, KC? Come on, you have to tell me more. I can't, Rainy Ray. That's your mother's business. But I will tell you that it all came to a stop where Dr. Pepper came down from Hendersonville and changed Victor's thought processes. What do you mean? Victor got beat up so bad he didn't even know what hit him. He didn't even know who he was for almost ten days. He became goofy after that incident, sporting that silly laugh and claiming that he met God himself. He said that God Almighty told him he needed to make things right with his life and leave your mother alone. And he did, Rainy Ray. He did for a long time. Mary and Amy and working hard, up until they got kicked out of that church. That's when he started drinking again, acting like a fool. Now he's hooked up with our drunk sheriff, sporting a badge and acting like a lone ranger. So keep an eye out for Victor and his fat deputies, Rainy Ray. Ain't no telling what that fool might do next. I thanked KC for the information, stood up, and headed for the door. Come over here, son. KC got up out of his chair and met me halfway. Before I knew it, he had his arms around me and was giving me a big hug. You're a good boy, Rainy Ray. You'll be fine. Just be good to your mother and father and keep smart. You need to be smarter than Victor and his clowns. He released his embrace and turned me to face him. How do you know all this, KC? I raised my head and pretended to look at him in his face. I said, look at me, Rainy Ray. Look me in the eyes. I looked at his blank and glossed over eyes and felt that he could see me better than I could see him. You might not understand this, Rainy Ray, but for some damn reason, most folks think that a blind person is deaf, too. They always talk louder as if we can't hear a damn thing. Well, it ain't true, Rainy Ray. It ain't true at all. I believe I can hear better than any human or animal in this town. I can even hear through brick walls, Rainy Ray. And because of that, I know more about what's going on in this diner in this here town than most anybody can ever imagine. You know why, Rainy Ray? No, why? Because I listen. I listen to everything, Rainy Ray. You gotta watch yourself in life. You gotta listen, too. You gotta keep yourself safe. You understand what I'm telling you, boy? Yes, sir. I said with a larger-than-life degree of respect for this blind man, who was mostly considered by many as a deaf, dumb black man. I also felt honored that he appreciated me so much to confide in me as much as he did, even though he wouldn't tell me what I really wanted to know about my mother and then me. After three loving taps on my back by Casey's strong black hands, I was on my way out the door into the already blisteringly hot summer afternoon for another full day of work. Chapter 10 Back then, I never thought about my buddy John's level of intelligence. I always figured that we had about the same number of brain cells, but was I ever wrong about that? As we grew older, it became obvious that John wasn't just smart. He was smart as hell and destined to cram even more knowledge into his bald head. I, on the other hand, sucked at school, and was lucky to even advance from one grade to the next. I think school for me was nothing more than a lesson in socialization, and because of that, I got along with most everybody and was never threatened by anybody, until now. I remember John telling me when we were in about the sixth grade that he read all 20 of his world book encyclopedias. Who would do anything like that, I thought, and furthermore, who would want to? He could also fix anything. He could change out a transmission on his car, weld things together, and make things out of wood and metal. While I was training to be a butcher, 
John was already working with people twice his age remodeling homes. So when I showed John the gun I received from KC, the first words out of his mouth were, Oh my, if you don't want that gun, I'll surely take it off your hands. That's a real beauty. And with that, my long lesson in firearms began. It's a Beretta, Rainy Ray, and one of the most reliable semi-automatic handguns available today. That is if you can find one. It has an effective firing range of 50 meters. This one was made in Italy around 1955 and replaces the 1934 Beretta Modello. I bet it belonged to Victor's father when he was in the army. Most of these babies were made for the military. It has short recoil action and is made up of a lightweight alloy. Okay, John, stop with the history lesson and unload that damn thing before you blow somebody's head off. He was making me nervous with the gun and embellishing himself even more just to make me even more crazy. You just pop the cartridge out like so and here are the bullets. John was demonstrating the weapon as if he was reciting a nursery rhyme. Here's the church and there's the steeple. Open the door and see all the people. It's got a 10 round magazine and each one of these 9 millimeter bullets will blow a hole the size of a corridor through any attacker. Well, how do you shoot the damn thing, I asked, hoping he would explain it in theory and not throw caution to the wind. Well, you just pop this baby in like so, pull the trigger, and boom, 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 boom. boom, boom. boom. The gun went off as John fired three rounds into the base of the waterfall. My nostrils burned at the smell of gunpowder, and my ears were ringing as I found myself at least three paces behind John. Holy shit, John! Be careful with that damn thing! You just can't fire off shots like that! What if someone hears us? Come on, Rainy Ray! Get back up here and grow some balls, will ya? If you're gonna have this damn gun in your possession, then you're gonna have to know how to fire it. You don't just stash these things under your bed and hide from them. You need to know how to use it. Now here, let me show you how to fire the damn thing. Listen. And learn, Junior. Not now, John. What if I miss or someone hears us? If you miss that damn waterfall, then there's more reason for you to give me that gun. Now, don't be such a pussy, Rainy Ray. People fire guns out here all the time. Now, go ahead. Pinch off a few rounds. The pistol was still warm as John placed the heavy weapon in my hands. Carefully, I stood up, copied John's stance, and took aim at the rushing water flowing over the rocks. That's good, Rainy Ray. Now, take in a deep breath and slowly let it out while gently squeezing the trigger. Boom, 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 boom. Holy shit, this is one hell of a gun. I only meant to shoot it off one time and it fired off four rounds. You're damn right it's one hell of a gun, Rainy Ray. Now don't you feel better? Don't you feel more like a man now? I did feel better. Almost as if I'd crossed some sort of machoistic threshold. I looked over at John with a newly charged respect for him and asked, How do you know all these things? John chortled and said, Well... Let's just say I do a lot of reading. Then I remembered all the magazines he had stacked up in front of his toilet at home. We hung around there for a while, trading off a number of rounds at the waterfalls, trees, and, of course, the no hunting sign. Earlier in the day, I picked John up at his job site and told him I wanted to show him something. I was also so turned around over my conversation with KC about my mother, Victor, the gun, that I completely forgot about the check I was supposed to give to my dad. We headed south down 176 towards Tryon and turned off in the direction of Pearson Falls, a gorgeous and remote setting about halfway down the grade. John and I spent many days at those falls discussing private things like girls, nature, food, and sex. But the discussion on this day was the most painful conversation I think I ever had with him. John was the only person in my life that I could confide in. I could tell him anything that ever concerned me. But when I felt the need to tell him about my mother and Victor, I could hardly get the words out of my mouth. Up until then, those thoughts were trapped in my mind and never to come out of my mouth. After each sentence, John would respectfully respond with a simple acknowledgement of okay or yeah, with never any shock or judgment. So what if Victor got my mom pregnant, John? What would I ever do? That would make Victor my real father. Don't go there, Rainy Ray. The likelihood of Victor being your father is remote. Don't even think that way, Rainy Ray, because it can't be true. Why would you say that, John? How can you be so sure? Because if Victor was your father, you'd know it by now. You just can't hide something like that from someone. But what if my mother kept it from me, John, and never told me? Because your parents are not like that. They're not the sort of people who would keep something like that from you. Plus, if Victor was your father, he'd be the first one to tell you. For the first time in a while, I felt as if I could breathe as my best friend pulled me back down to earth. 
Okay, now it's my turn to give you some news, Rainy Ray. So what's the big news? Well, my dad examined Miss Martha and finally got the full story. Okay, I said, mimicking John's normal response. Victor forced himself on Miss Martha in a big way. And he also got very violent, too. Did he actually rape her? Well, he certainly tried to, tearing her shirt off and pinning her to the floor. She tried to fight him off with all she had until Victor saw or heard something. What'd he hear? Whatever it was caused him to stop and get the hell out of there, okay? It's possible that he heard the girls or someone on the front porch trying to get in. Whatever it was, Miss Martha said that Victor got scared and ran out of the back door. Did the girls see him? I don't even think that they were even there. I think that they were still at the dance when all this was going on. Well, then who scared him off, John? I have no idea, and Miss Martha doesn't either. She fainted over the whole ordeal. When Carol and Jane got to the house, my dad was already there helping Miss Martha. From there, my dad took them all to our house because Miss Martha refused to be taken to the hospital. The Melrose Sheriff's Office had a grand total of one squad car, which Gudger was very proud of. But ever since Victor joined the force, the once pristine cruiser became Victor's primary mode of transportation. The automobile had suddenly lost its charm in a big way after Victor's many alcohol-related mishaps. It now only had one headlight, with the other one on back order, no side mirrors since both had been sheared off, and a cracked rear window due to a few concerned citizens throwing rocks at Victor as he drove through town. That's right. Victor, who threw rocks at so many people over the years, was now being pelted by rocks by anyone who could pick up a stone. My timing could not have been any worse when Victor pulled us over on 176, just as John and I crossed into the town limits. On the floor by John's feet was a burlap bag which contained a check for $1,100 made out to my father from Victor, nine spent bullet shells, three dozen live rounds of ammunition, and a fully loaded Beretta. Victor appeared at my window, while another fine officer peeked through the passenger's window at the bag by John's feet. Victor didn't look jovial at all, appearing as if he was sporting a massive hangover. Was that you boys shooting down there at the falls, Rainy Ray? No, sir. Now, don't lie to me, son. I'm in no mood to play around here today. Now, answer me, son. Was that you? And furthermore, what makes you think you can drive this truck all the way down to Tryon when you ain't got no license? Now, I'm going to ask you boys once again. Was that y'all shooting down there at Pearson Falls? No, sir. Ah, shit. Get out of the truck now, son, and step around the back of the truck. You too, boy. Larry, snatch that bag off the floor and bring that kid around back, too. Reluctantly, I got out of the car and met John, who was being yanked out of the car by another one of Melrose's finest. Now, I'm getting really suspicious of you boys spending all your time down there at the summer girl's house. And don't act like you don't know what I'm speaking about. You boys are about there every dang night, probably having a whole lot of fun with them two little hotties. And I bet her mother too, Rainy Ray. The thought of that image took me off base because it was so completely bizarre. I was amazed that Victor was clearly trying to pin that heinous crime on me. Ain't you, son? I said, ain't you, son? I think you like Miss Martha more than you'd even admit. Hell, I can relate to you, son. I had a huge crush on my sixth grade teacher one time in a big way. I even went so far as to ask her out on a date, and she'd probably have gone out with me if it weren't for that dang principal. My guess it was you, son, that tried to have your way with her. Dax boy doesn't even look like he's got it in him. <laughs> but you, son, I think we might be both cut from the same cloth. Both men laughed out loud at John's expense as we stood with our hands on the hot tailgate under the blazing sun. Now give me that bag, Larry. I want to see what we got here. Both men were acting like super cops as Victor struggled to loosen the twine on the burlap bag. Dang it, son. You tied a big old knot in this dang string. What'd you do that for? Victor's constant reference to me as son was now making me angry. Just as Victor was about to undo the knot and open the bag, Gudger pulled up in his pickup truck behind the squad car. He got out of his truck and stormed up to Victor and let him have it. Shut off those damn flashing lights, Larry, and put your ass in the car, too. What? 
said Victor with a surprised look on his face. We've just pulled these boys over for shooting guns off down there at the falls. And also Rainy Ray drove almost all the way down to Tryon without his dang driver's license. Give that boy back his bag and stop this nonsense with Doc's boy. But he's got a gun in that bag, Gudger. We've got evidence here that proves that these boys are up to no good. I don't care if he's got a bomb in that bag, Victor. Now give that boy back his bag and let him go. What? Do as I say, Victor. Give that back to Rainy Ray this instance, and I want you to get in the patrol car and get the hell out of here. Why, Gudger? Tell me why you ain't doing anything about these boys, you know, uh, with the summer girls and all. Because that boy's Dr. Roy's son, Victor. Don't you get it? Don't you have any damn brains in your head at all? If you mess with Doc's boy, his daddy will let you bleed out the next time you go into the hospital for help. If you give that boy any trouble... His father won't lend a hand to either one of us the next time we need him. Do you understand me, Victor? Now get the hell out of here, Gudger said as he snatched the bag from Victor's hands. Victor appeared angry, embarrassed, and defeated as he skulked back to his patrol car and pulled back onto the highway. As he passed by me, he slowed down and leered at me and said, I'll be watching you, Sonny. I'll be watching you boys really close now. I had just as much as I could take with Victor calling me son, the heat, my mother, and the girls. Anger took over my mind and body, and I exploded. On response, I viciously raised my hand and shot Victor the bird. F*** you, Victor! F*** off and go to hell! And stay away from my mother, you asshole! Neither Gudger, John, or I could believe what I had just done, as both held me back from running after the police cruiser and beating the hell out of Victor. At that moment... I firmly believe that I could have physically beat the ever-living shit out of Victor. Calm down, Rainy Ray. Cool it down and never do that sort of thing again. You know you can't threaten an officer of the law. He ain't no officer of the law, Gudger. You know it and I know it. He's done some bad things to that poor woman at the lake. And I believe that he might have done some horrible things to my own mother, too. There was a long pause in the conversation as Gudger appeared to be at a loss for words. I'm sorry about that, son. Now, why don't you just get back on your way and let's forget about this whole thing. And that goes for you, Gudger. Don't you ever call me son. Okay, Rainy Ray, okay. I'm sorry about that. Let me deal with Victor. Now, let's just get on with our day. We have a huge day tomorrow. We don't need to make things any worse than they already are. Okay, boys? Are we okay here now? Yes, yes sir. sir. John and I said in unison. At about a quarter to six, John and I pulled up in front of our store. I saw my dad hard at work at his office above the registers. I left John in the truck, grabbed the check, and entered the store. The store was busy with three girls working the registers and Billy, our bagman, helping customers out the door to the parking lot. People were stocking their carts in preparation for Coon Dog Day, as several said hello to me as I passed by. I eased by the potatoes and onions and up to the side of the office. What you got there, son? My dad asked, glancing down at me. It's a check from KC. He wanted me to tell you that he was sorry about the railhouse being so past due. He opened the envelope, scratched the side of his head, and looked up at the ceiling. So KC gave this to you? Hmm. Yes, sir. Dad, you never told me that Victor was holding out on you like this. Well, I can't talk to you now, but the short answer is, I didn't know he wasn't paying his bills either. Your mom keeps up with all this. I was now thinking that my mom might be keeping things from my dad and trying to deal with Victor by herself. As I was leaving the store, I ran almost directly into Hattie Mae, who seemed anxious to see me. Rainy, I was hoping to see you. I need to talk to you real soon, but I've got to get something over to my mama. Come find me tomorrow, Hattie. I'll be running around like an idiot between here and Coon Dog Day. Just come find me. She appeared distracted, and justifiably so by the people in the store watching us talking to one another with such interest. Townspeople couldn't deal with an attractive black girl having what looked like a private conversation with a white boy in public. As people rushed by us and blocked each other's view, I glanced over and whispered, Come find me tomorrow, Hattie. Come find me. I examined myself as I got back into the truck, wondering why I was so anxious to see Hattie, just as much as she seemed anxious to see me. I remember making a mental note to talk to her the next day. 
I had to get the damn gun out of the truck and into a safe place as we swung by my house and pulled up to the side of the garage. All right, let me go in there and find some place to hide this damn thing. I left John in the truck with the engine running and went into the garage and searched for a place to put the gun. My father had an old set of golf clubs that he hadn't touched in years. I stuffed the gun to the bottom of the golf bag and was about to leave when the phone rang on the garage wall. Thinking that my mom was downtown, I answered the phone just as my mom did. Holford's residence. This is Elaine. My mother was in the kitchen on the main line. Hello? Who's calling? Hello, Elaine. It's me, Victor. What do you want, Victor? I told you never to call me again. At first, I had no idea what was happening and was so close to saying hello. My mother must have picked up the phone at the exact same time I did. Oh, come on now, Elaine. That's no way for you to talk to an old flame. You know the way we used to get along back then. <laughs> Now don't hang up on me until you listen to what I got to say. My mother didn't say a word, but I could hear her softly breathing. Now you listen to me, Elaine. I've been trying to be so nice to you lately, but you ain't given me any chance to make amends with you. So I'm going to make myself crystal clear. Go ahead, Victor. Bring it on. My mom boldly responded. Now I need you to stop heating up this whole dang town and that little twerp down there at the monitor about me. I know you've been pushing that skinny-ass publisher to print some untruths about me and that summer girl up at the lake. But it ain't true, Elaine. It ain't true at all. That lady's been wanting me more than I've been wanting her. She's just a dang tease. Just the way all y'all are. Oh, I'm sure it ain't true, Victor. I'm sure it ain't true at all. If that queer newspaper boy so much as prints one thing about me in that paper... I'm going to run him into the vault and sue the paper for slander. Are you listening to me, Elaine? I'm hanging on every word, Victor. Hanging on every word. I also know that you've been pushing Gudger to set me in order. He told me everything about what you said the other day. I don't like it, Elaine. No, little lady, I don't appreciate that one bit. You've got me shaking in my boots, Victor. I, I told Wilford the other day that I wanted you to cease and desist. But did he tell you? <laughs> nah. I don't guess he would, because you've got that little man wrapped around your dang finger. But he did try to get a little rough with me, with his nightstick and all, until I rearranged his thought process. <laughs> what do they call that? Uh, the, the power of suggestion. I believe my power of suggestion caused your husband to cease and desist. <laughs> I'm needing for you to begin making things right for me. With Amy, the town, that stupid paper boy, the mayor, and the sheriff. Can you do that for me, Elaine? Are you hearing me, little lady? Oh, I know you can. I also know you will. You want to know why I know you're going to make things right for me? No, why? Because if you don't fix things, two things are going to happen in unison. You know what that word unison means, don't you, Elaine? Tell me, Victor. It means at the exact same time, I'm going to tell your boy who the hell I really am while I'm arresting that little bastard for raping that summer lady. If you don't think I will, Elaine, then you just push me to the test. Now, the mayor just got back into town last night. I want you to hunt that fat idiot down and tell him to get to the county and clear my name. Mm-hmm. I want to see some action from you, Elaine, or else. Mm-hmm. Or else what? Because if I don't see any action from you, well, then I'm going to have to hunt you down and get my own kind of action from you, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Victor, if you think for one minute that you're frightening me, think again. You might have scared me back then, but not now. And furthermore... I meant everything I said to you the other day. I know what the hell you did, you bastard. And if you ever threaten those girls or my son again, I swear to God, Victor, I will kill you. My mother slammed the phone down so hard that I could hear it hit the receiver from the garage. I was now on the phone alone with Victor as he began breathing hard and seemed stunned. Is someone else on this line? Is that you, Randy Ray? Hello? <laughs> John was in the driver's seat when I finally made it back to the truck. What happened in there, Rainy Ray? What are you doing with that gun? I thought you were going to stash it. Get me out of here, John. What? 
Where? Just drive, John. Anywhere. Just drive and get me out of here now. Chapter 11 If there was ever a totally imbalanced hunt which was completely unfair to the prey, coon hunting took the cake. First off, raccoon fur was an extremely profitable commodity, especially for mountain people who could make more money on a drunk Saturday evening than an entire week at work. Secondly, many people who lived on the outskirts of Melrose ate raccoon, squirrel, and deer on a regular basis. One year, some idiot thought it would be totally acceptable to serve barbecued raccoon with maple glaze as a festival item until some woman from Greenville found out about it and nearly vomited. Coon Dog Day brought as many as 1,000 coon hounds to the area trained since puppyhood to develop a hot scent and the ability to tree terrified coons. A hot scent was defined as a new scent versus a cold scent being an old scent, if that makes any sense. All day long, especially in the evening, you could hear those animals off in the distance howling. Most coon hunters used their coon hounds to legitimately hunt down wild raccoons in specific areas while the lazier and more inebriated hunters cheated, like Gudger and Victor, who began coon hunting at the tender age of four. They'd even their odds by secretly releasing their prized raccoons from traps that they had set weeks prior. The hunters would begin by shaking the caged raccoons under the nose of the hounds until they wanted to bite their little heads off. Then... Out of the cage, the terrified coons ran as minutes later several coon hounds were sent off to chase them down and up a tree for a ritualistic execution. The hunters would yell, Go, 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 go! Get on it! Get on it! Drunk hunters wearing their coal miner lights on their heads, bursting with pride in their silly sport, would stand silently and listen to the braying coon hounds off in the distance. Oh my, these finely tuned hunters were a sight to see as they honed their highly skilled craft. The hunters could tell when the hounds had been treed by the raccoons, then off they went with their flashlights, chewing tobacco, pistols, and moonshine. Once the men reached the cornered raccoons, they would collar their dogs and move them away from the base of the tree to prevent them from tearing the dead creatures completely apart. Then came the marksmanship phase of the sport, as they shined their lights up at the terrified raccoon and lit up their eyes. I'll spare you the rest of the story. Coon hunting was a nocturnal, mostly male sport, with a clothing style that matched the mentality of the hunters. Some of the best hunters wore t-shirts, shorts, and tennis shoes all year long. They claimed that the corn liquor kept them warm and toasty. The top prize-winning hunters claimed stupid names like Duck Assassin, Speed Beef, and Woods Monster, while the coon hounds sported names like Rover, Copper, and Rusty. Occasionally, a girlfriend or wife would come along to see what coon hunting was all about and to watch the blood smearing, which was a ritualistic initiation of the newest hunters into the ranks. Gudger was known to be one of the best coon hunters and had the bragging rights to prove it, and hunting with a sheriff was a type of honor for the men. As expected, most hunters hated to include Victor, mainly because he'd never shut the hell up. Ignorance is bliss for a kid growing up in a remote, insulated town. But for me, the loss of ignorance meant misery. At the age of 17, during the summer after my ninth grade year, I had heard the word rape, but never could fully identify with its meaning. I knew that that sort of crime happened in large cities like Charlotte, Atlanta, but never in Melrose, North Carolina. 
Sure, we had our share of quirky old men in the community who my parents warned me to steer clear of, but a rapist? What in the hell was that? My father referred to people with deviated sexual motivations as perverts, and the townspeople minimized it even more, referring to them as, ah, he's just a dirty old man. The act of rape always seemed so foreign to me. I mean, who would do such a thing like that to another human being? And never was the subject of rape discussed from the pulpit, or in Sunday school for that matter. That would be a crime of the highest order. But after learning about Dr. Roy's examination of Miss Martha, and then listening to my mother and Victor on the phone, the definition of rape hit me dead in the face. I was now convinced that Victor was, in fact, my real father, and I was a mere product of rape. For a short period of time, I was angry at my parents for keeping something like that from me, but straying off in that direction was not where I needed to go. I knew it was going to be hard enough for me to even sit in the same room with either one of my parents. I now had a different face, different parents, and different soul. I don't remember reaching back down to the bottom of that golf bag and grabbing the gun, or even getting back on the truck with John, but what I do know was that gun had suddenly become the most important possession in my life. I was no longer frightened by the pistol, but strongly empowered by it. It felt good to hold the well-crafted firearm in my hand as we parked the truck by the shop at John's house and hiked through the woods to the old train trestle behind John's property. The train trestle was yet another place where John and I spent much of our time together. It was also a place where either one of us could have easily lost our lives. It was a concrete bridge about 120 feet above a shallow river with an extremely narrow edge for us to walk and run and even ride our bikes on. We had no fear of heights in those days, as we tossed rocks and firecrackers over the side of the bridge. There was no protection, no gates on either side of the bridge that could prevent a child or kid from going over. If anyone fell over the side of that train trestle, they'd be dead. John and I sat on the edge of that bridge and stared down at the river far below. Tears filled my eyes as I thought about my poor mother and that horribly selfish man. As I told John about the conversation between my mom and Victor, I came so close to exploding into tears. But instead of breaking down entirely, I handed the gun to John, laid back on the hard ballast stones by the rails, and stared up at the late afternoon sky. The sun felt comforting on my face as I closed my eyes and breathed in the pungent scent of the creosote-treated railroad ties. After several minutes of silence, John confidently said, I've got an idea, Rainy Ray, and a plan that should even things out a bit. John's plan was that we were to meet above the Western Auto at about 10 p.m. He was confident that both Gudger and Victor, if he was sober, would be off on the traditional night hunt the evening before Coondog Day. Gudger always claimed that he and a select few of his officers would be on the hunt to supervise and make sure that things didn't get out of hand like years before, back when Dacus Pace stepped on a rattlesnake and accidentally shot his nephew Klein in the butt. Dacus never lived that incident down. Based on tradition, John was sure that Gudger would leave the patrol car in the hands of one of his prized deputies while he stayed in contact with his brand new federal signal voice patrol radio. When I asked John what his plan was, he said, just meet me up there at 10 Rainy Ray and bring your balls. My buddy was suddenly turning into some kind of tough guy, and I think he didn't want to tell me what his plans were because he thought I'd chicken out. He would be correct on that assumption, because if I knew what we were going to be doing later that evening, I'm sure it would have never happened. I fell asleep on the roof of the Western Auto at about 9 p.m. as the heat of the day warmed the rooftop and lured me off to slumber. Most of the festival tents were erected, and all of the volunteers had gone home for the day. A huge sign had been installed just above the playground by a group of Bible-thumping fanatics that read, You can't hold hands with God and dance with Satan at the same time. But even they had left for the day. I'm sure that both God and Satan had had enough of the dreadful heat and sent their disciples on their way, as the thermometer during the day surpassed 104 degrees. Mayor White was back in town, warning festival-goers that an intense thunderstorm was forecasted to arrive just after sundown the next day. 
while Doc Jones told the mayor to pipe down. Everything is just going to be perfect on Coon Dog Day. The Beretta was in my lap and the burlap bag was under my head serving as one of my makeshift pillows as I slept under the stars. Wake up, sir. Rise and shine, Rainy Ray. I opened my eyes to the sight of John standing above me with a coiled rope over his neck and shoulders and a large wicker clothes hamper at the base of his feet. What are you doing with all that stuff, John? Just come with me and keep quiet. We crossed over to the jail and moved the service panel. Grab that side, Rainy Ray, and let's move the whole thing off to the side. Only one time before we opened the hatch that far, and that was the time we climbed down a water pipe and into the sheriff's office. You can't go down there now, John. It's way too early. What if someone comes? Rainy Ray, now we're going to do this thing, and you're going to do this thing with me, okay? Handing me the coil of rope, he tied a special kind of knot around the handles of the clothes hamper and gently lowered the basket to the floor of the sheriff's office. What are you doing with that? We're going to cause a little future disturbance between Victor and Gudger, John said as he eased over the opening, lowered his legs, and grabbed a hold of the water pipe, and then shimmied his way down to the floor. All right now, Rainy Ray, give me some slack on that rope and be ready to pull up your first delivery. What was he doing now, I wondered, as I watched him move over to the side of the room where the picture was on the wall and where Gudger stashed his corn liquor. Are you crazy, John? You just can't steal that stuff. If we get caught, we'll both be dead. Work with me, Rainy Ray. Shut up. Just work with me. Before I knew it, John and I were committing a felony. Or were we? We were breaking into the sheriff's office and sort of stealing town property. Or were we, I thought, as I lifted my first load of more than a dozen mason jars of Gudger's precious moonshine through the opening and onto the roof. Never had I feared more for my life and smiled so much as we emptied Gudger's entire stash of booze. Just as John was leaving, I watched him load a sheet of stationery into the typewriter on Gudger's desk and start typing away. When he was done, he placed the note where the corn liquor was, moved the painting back in place, and then climbed back up to the top of the roof. I was laughing so hard that I think I wet my pants. What did the note say, John? I asked as I sat down on the roof and looked up at him. Well, it said, Gudger, you should have never embarrassed me that way in front of them boys. Now I'm going to make it crystal clear to you that you'd better keep the heat off me or else. <laughs> yodley, yodley, yodley. I went out last Tuesday. I met a sweet little girl named Susie. And I guess she was the sweetest thing in town She started calling me honey And I began to spend my money And we got drunk and thought we owned the town We're in the jail Come for house, come for house, heads up on hill Won't you come join us sometime, Leslie, will you? You know where it is We'll eat cornbread, taters, get the ground up, Lord Chapter 12 while my father was not a mason, his father was, up until the day he passed away from a stroke at the ripe old age of 74. And like my grandfather did in the past, my father contributed all of the food for the annual benefit breakfast at the Melrose Masonic Lodge. Now that I was a full-fledged, unlicensed driver, I was given the duty to deliver all of the food to the lodge by 5.30 in the morning. It was still dark when I pulled out of my driveway and drove down to the store. I was to pick up 10 pounds of bacon, 10 pounds of stone ground grits, and 5 pounds of butter. Many of the floats and parade participants were already parked in their assigned locations in front of everyone's house, including ours. Some people spent the night in their cars while others slept in sleeping bags under their floats. I thought these people were really taking this way too seriously. There was no fancy float in front of our house, as Victor promised but only a dressed-up Volkswagen microbus, which was owned by a local real estate agent. A few volunteer firefighters were already directing incoming traffic up the hill to the ball field, while other cars were being told to park down 176 at the elementary school. And since East Main Street was to be closed for the day, festival parking was going to be extremely limited. Added detours were in place to direct general traffic up to Flat Rock, the benefit breakfast would begin serving at 6.30 and be over at 
The first band was scheduled to start at 8.30 a.m., and the parade was ordered to roll out at 11 and be done by noon. Square dancing for the kids would begin immediately after the parade. Cloggers were scheduled to compete throughout the entire day, while the granddaddy would begin at 8 p.m. and run until 11. I wondered if Gudger had discovered that every bit of his moonshine had been stolen. But I knew an explosion was imminent. Last night, there was no way that John and I could have moved eight cases of booze from the roof of the jail to the streets below. So we stowed it all under a tarp in the corner of the building. Earlier in the day, Miss Martha called my mother and told her that she and the girls had not seen John and I for a while, and they were concerned. So we were told to join the girls in the park. Behind the railroad tracks, they were sitting on a blanket having lunch. A pretty girl with a cute figure and long pants wearing a pink sailor outfit ambled above us on stilts, while a gathering of elderly women sat nearby playing guitars, violins, and auto harps. The music was stuttered and out of tune, but it felt so soothing to my anxious mind. By noon, the temperature was spiking 89 degrees and was expected to soar over 100 by 4 p.m. Main Street was loaded with food vendors serving deep-fried carnival food, candied apples, funnel cakes, and fresh-squeezed lemonade. Miss Martha and the girls each wore cut-off jean shorts and tank tops and looked so pretty as we sat on the blanket and watched the parade pass through town. Any other year, I would have been so excited to be in the company of these beautiful girls, but on this day, I was consumed with thoughts of Victor and my parents, and the girls could sense it. As much as I wanted to enjoy my time with the girls, I simply could not relax. Especially when I noticed Victor and his fellow deputies watching us from the distance. Then I started thinking of Hattie Mae and decided to leave right after the parade and go back to the store and hang out until she came by. A red-faced, overweight man wearing a white Oxford shirt, khaki pants, and loafers was standing next to the mayor and my father in the back of the store as I walked in. Well, here he comes now. Hello there, Rainy Ray. We've been hoping to see you, said the jovial mayor as my father had a concerned look on his face. Say hello to Hayden Lake, son. He's an attorney from the low country of South Carolina. Mr. Lake just arrived from Charleston and wants to ask you a few questions about that little incident with a summer girl a few weeks back. Hello, son, the visitor said. Why in the hell was everyone around me suddenly calling me son? I felt like saying, hello, dad, but I held my tongue. Hello, sir, I said as I shook his hand. Now, son, your sheriff notified my client who just happens to be Mrs. Smith's husband, about an attempted rape that happened here during one of your little uh, street dances. Now, I'm here to find out what in the sham hell happened. Miss Martha's husband, I thought. There must be some kind of confusion here. <laughs> now, that must be a square dance, uh, Hayden. Have you ever been to one? Said the mayor, trying to lighten the mood. I'm sure they're wonderful, Mr. Mayor, but I don't really care about any of your silly dances you have in this hillbilly mountain town. I don't even think I'm going to like your Sheriff Knowles much either. Talking like there's something funny about this whole uh, incident with his silly laugh and all. Hold on there a minute, Mr. Lake. Are you sure that Gudger Knowles was the one that called you? Because I don't think he'd think any of this is funny in the least, said the mayor. I thought, might it be possible that Victor was the one who called Miss Martha's husband? Or ex-husband? Or, or whoever he was, pretending to be Gudger? That would be crazy. Now, gentlemen, Sheriff Knowles told my client that this boy here has been spending quite a bit of time at their house and that he believes that he had something to do with whatever occurred there that Wait day. just a minute. Now, what's going on here? Now, Mr. Lake, I hope you don't have any reason to believe that my boy had anything to do with that assault. Because if that's the case, then I might have to call my brother up on the phone and bring him down here from Asheville to listen to this whole conversation in person. Don't say anything to this man, Rainy Ray. That's right, Hayden. I can assure you that this boy had nothing to do with that, that summer girl. I mean, uh, Miss Martha, said the mayor. Now listen, y'all. I'm only doing what I was instructed to do by my client. Now you might not be aware of this, but Mrs. Smith is a very wealthy woman, and her husband wants to protect her interests. I just stopped in here to see y'all first before I go over and ask your silly sheriff what he thinks is so funny about this very serious situation. I was stunned by the bravado of Victor as I stood there studying the situation. 
when once again anger charged through my body and I lost my emotions. That son of a bitch! How dare that man for doing this shit! I would never do anything to Miss Martha. She's a friend of mine, and all we were doing was trying to protect her. Now, who is we, son? Was there another person with you in that house that night? I want his name. No, 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 you're getting it all wrong. It was Victor. Victor who, son? Stop calling me son, you jerk. All three men took a step backwards as they witnessed my rage. Calm down, son, the mayor said while he was retracting his verbiage. That nice woman and those pretty girls come up here to paradise, and this is what happens to them? Now Victor and our drunk sheriff and you are coming up here to pin the shit on me. Are you kidding me? Give me a damn break. Now son, I want you to calm down right now and remember yourself. The family sent me up here to check things out and report back. My mother rushed around the aisle like a bull in a china shop. What in the holy hell is going on here? They can hear y'all way up front by the doors. Mom, Victor's trying to frame me for what happened to Miss Martha. He's called up this, this man's client pretending to be Gudger, and now this guy wants to arrest me. What the hell? Sir, are you a cop or something? Wolford, what's going on here? I want you to call your brother and get him down here in short order. It's all right, Elaine, my dad said. No one is blaming anyone for what happened to Miss Martha. Well, it sure sounds like this guy is dead. Now settle down, Rainy Ray, ejected my mom. Let me handle this. Mr. Mayor, my son had nothing to do with Miss Martha's attack. You know it, and I know it's it. It's Mrs. Martha Middleton Smith, Mom. What do you mean, Mrs.? She told us that she was divorced. Well, that's not completely true, ma'am. After her court date, she and her daughter caught the first train out of Charleston to come up here. Now, what she doesn't know is that her husband refused to sign his side of the agreement. So she thinks she's divorced, but she's not. Oh, my God, that poor woman. Well, that's another reason why I came up here is to tell her that she's technically not divorced and that her husband wants this boy here locked up and his wife home in short order where she belongs. Is that right? Well, what sort of authority do you think you have, sir, to come up here and try to place my son under arrest when you're nothing but a two-bit divorce attorney from Charleston? Now, how about you and I go find Gudger right now, and then we can stop this madness before it goes any further. Then we can hunt down the real criminal. Now, who might that be, Elaine, said the mayor. Well, Mr. Mayor, welcome back to town. A lot has happened around here since you've been gone. Were you even aware of the fact that Victor Rathers is now on the police force? Why, no. Yep, he's a Melrose public servant, even though he tried to rape Miss Martha. Now. If Gudger doesn't put Victor in jail, I sure as hell will. Don't you ever mess with my boy, Counselor. My mother turned on her knees and marched off. In a blink of an eye, she was gone. My father calmly went after her out of the store and into the parking lot. Now, try not to worry too much about this, son. I'm sure we can get it all sorted out one way or another. But you need to know you are in a bit of trouble. Stop calling me son, asshole. I've got to go after my mother before she kills someone. I ran to the front of the store just as my father was coming back in from the parking lot. Where's mom? She's on her way down to the sheriff's office to set Gudger straight. Well, can't you stop her, dad? She might wind up being thrown in the vault. Randy Ray, I learned a long time ago. Never to stop your mother from doing anything. When she turns into a ball of fire, <laughs> I stand aside. I was quite sure that Gudger would not be in the jail. Because regardless of the laws, the sidewalks in front of the jail would be slammed with people walking by, standing around, sitting on the curb. During Coon Dog Day, Gudger just became more or less a symbol of law enforcement. No one ever expected one person to police such a huge crowd. Polk County provided most of the law enforcement. If you were arrested during Coon Dog Day, it would be by the county, and you'd be taken down to Tryon or to the Rutherford County Jail. Still, I followed my mother, if only to keep a protective eye on her. As I got near the park, I saw my mother greeting Miss Martha, as John and the girls sat on a blanket below her. John seemed to be in his element with Carol. Miss Martha seemed very distraught as she looked at me and said, How dare Gudger for dragging you into this whole mess? Don't you worry about a thing, Rainy Ray. No one will ever blame you for what Victor did to me that night. Martha, I hate to tell you this, my mom said as she held Martha's hands, but there's a man in town from Charleston. He said he's been sent up here to take you back to Charleston. What? Who? 
What for? Why? The man said his name was, what was his name, Rainy Ray? He said his name was Hayden something. Are you telling me that Hayden Lake is in Melrose now? What the hell is he here for? Do you know him, Martha? My mother asked. Sadly, I do. He was my ex-husband's divorce attorney. Well, now, Martha, I want you to take in a deep breath and hold my hands tightly. Okay. Well, I hate to tell you this, but apparently your divorce didn't go through. Your husband is fighting it. What? And he wants you and the girls back home as soon as possible. He also wants my son placed under arrest for attacking you. Can you believe all of this, Martha? Oh, my God in heaven. What in the hell else is going to happen to me today? Miss Martha dropped down on her knees, buried her hands in her face, and began to cry. My mother tried desperately to take the girls back over to our house, but Miss Martha wouldn't hear of it. We are not going to Charleston, Elaine. We are staying right here, and we are going to have a damn good time, even if it kills me. By 3 p.m., the temperature was over 100 degrees, and the town was cranking with activity. My mother returned to the store and said that the sheriff's office was locked, and that Hayden Lake and the fire chief were calling on the county to track Gudger down. My mother was sitting in her office with a wet towel on her forehead, whispering to my father, Wilfred, it's as hot as the devil outside. Some idiot from Charleston wants to arrest our son for attempted rape, and Gudger Knowles is missing in action. Something is going on here, Wilfred, and I think this whole town is about to explode. <laughs> Chapter 13 At 5 p.m., Kevin Powers burst out of the front door of the Melrose Monitor and pushed his way through the large and densely populated crowd on East Main Street. He was in a state of panic and in a desperate search of the mayor, the sheriff, the fire chief, or anyone he could talk to about the severe weather warning he'd just received over his telex machine. Spotting Doc, he made a beeline for the main stage. Doc was standing at his throne wearing a crown and holding a huge gavel in his hand. He was formally kicking off the start of the Granddaddy Dance Competition. Earlier in the day, Dr. Jones was coronated the Coon Dog Day Grand King, a title that he proudly absorbed into his ego. His Majesty also relished the distinct honor of crowning his longtime lady friend, Mary Margaret Blackford, as the Festival Queen. From there, the King and Queen formally recognized their royal court, which included a princess, prince, junior princess, junior prince, baby princess, and baby prince. Everyone but Doc and Queen had been given their royal positions weeks earlier by the result of penny votes. Each year, young boys and girls collected pennies from the townspeople, weeks prior to Coon Dog Day. The money raised would flow back into the budget to cover expenses for the following year's festival. Kevin pleaded with Doc to make an announcement over his microphone about the terrible storm that was tracking our way. But Doc rudely ignored Kevin because he was too caught up in the moment. Doc, you need to read this report from the National Weather Service to everyone here. This thing on? Ladies and gentlemen, in 1963, we inaugurated our very first Coon Dog Day celebration. And today, I can only say thank you to the wonderful members of our beloved Melrose community and to all of you wonderful people who have traveled here from so very far away. Doc, listen to me. There's a huge storm coming in, and we need to warn everyone to get the hell out of here. Shut up, Kevin, and don't interrupt me. Why, just this morning, I had the distinct pleasure of welcoming a Mr. Hayden Lake, who was a distinguished attorney who had just arrived by train all the way from Charleston, South Carolina, just to be part 
of our wonderful celebration. Doc, read this paper, please, Doc, and tell everyone they need to know about the storm and leave now. Powers, would you get the hell out of here? And so now, as, as we, we begin, begin our famous Granddaddy Grand Square Dance, we say in Melrose, the rest is history. So have fun, my wonderful friends, and dance, dance, dance. Doc, please, there's no time to waste. Stop this nonsense, Kevin, and go away. Don't put a damper on this fine day. So off Kevin ran, with his paper in hand, frantically trying to find anyone who would take him seriously. I was sitting on a wooden crate by the front door, drinking a bottle of yoo and eating a moon pie, when he burst through the front door of our store. Elaine, where's Gudger? I can't find anyone in this damn town. I have some bad news. Where's the mayor? Where's anybody? What's wrong, Kevin? Calm down. What's going on? There's a storm, Elaine, heading our way. I mean, a big storm, and we got to get the word out or we're going to have a disaster on our hands. When do they expect it to get here? My mom asked. Maybe in an hour or two. Who knows? No one knows. Soon, I expect. Hell, I don't know. Soon. Even the regional forecasters don't know what's going on. It just hit the wires just now. They say there's a heavy line of storms causing tornadoes, high winds, hail and rain, more rain and rain, all heading here. Well, when was the last time you saw a gudger? My mother asked. No one has seen him since last night at the hunt. They think he was at the jail last night. But today he's like gone. He's like AWOL. I remember the mayor saying something about the storm yesterday, Kevin. But everybody brushed him off as if he was some kind of a fear monger. Well, where is the mayor? Kevin asked. He's out looking for Gudger with the county police. Unknown to our region of the world, earlier in the week, Hurricane Camille made landfall near Waveland, Mississippi as a Category 5 storm with winds of 175 miles an hour and a 25-foot storm surge. Camille marched inland, destroying everything in its path. Since so many people in Mississippi were taken completely off guard, it stood to reason that we'd be the last to know. Further, since the center of the storm was expected to track off to the northwest, forecasters in our region considered it a non-event. But as the days since landfall clicked by, the storm developed a mind of its own, turning northeastward, and spawning off pop-up storms in all directions. I was never the sort of guy who tried to save mankind. But on that day, I jumped into action, especially when my mother was already out the door on her way to the center of town. Why was it I always felt the need to save my mother from everything, when my father never seemed to care? I guess he had blind faith in my mother's ability to take care of herself. The temperature was ridiculously hot, and the humidity was heavier than hell, with not a cloud in the sky. People were still trailing into town, despite the lack of parking or any knowledge of any impending storm. They lined the streets with lawn chairs and settled in for the long haul, waiting for the big dance to start. It was amazing to me how everyone seemed so oblivious to the horrid heat, crowded streets, insane chatter. If it were not for my mother rushing out to save mankind, I'd be far away from this temperature and stupid coon dog madness. By 6 p.m., there were three bands playing at once, in separate locations near the center of town, creating a cacophony of musical madness. A bluegrass band was performing on the main stage in front of the Western Auto, playing Red River Gal. A top 40 band was across the street from the Melrose Library, playing a song called Born to be Wild, while a church band playing gospel music was on the playground on the other side of the tracks playing a terrible version of Amazing Grace. More than three dozen tents were assembled, each doing their best to provide some semblance of protection against the blazing sun on the food vendors, artists, craftsmen, and face painters. I always noticed that when a town offers something for free, in this case, just to see everybody else, people came in from everywhere. It also seemed unlikely that any announcement of the upcoming storm could be done over any valid public address system. I imagined every single tent, chair, umbrella, and table being sucked into the sky and off to a southern version of Oz. The spot where the girl sat earlier was now standing room only. I expect that John and the girls had probably gone off to confront the mayor, Hayden Lake, and Gudger. On impulse, 
when I left the store earlier in pursuit of my mother. I grabbed my backpack and slung it over my back and ran into a thick wall of heat and humidity. It wasn't until I reached the main stage when I realized that not only did I pack a canteen of water, three Slim Jims, two large strips of beef jerky, but also a loaded pistol, which I had placed there earlier. I cringed when I realized that I was fully armed and dangerous in the center of the very town that I grew up in. If anybody knew that I had a gun in my possession, I would have been tackled by the nearest deputy. I was about to run back to the store and unload my firearm when I spotted Victor and two other officers pointing at the only black person in town, and then me. It was Hattie Mae, and she was running towards me with a look of terror in her face. Suddenly the gun in my backpack became valuable as I pushed my way through the crowd towards Hattie Mae. Over the years, Hattie Mae Wainwright softened her opinion of me as I punished myself for that terrible rocking incident so long ago. Maybe it was because of my constant prayers for forgiveness. Or maybe it was also because she could sense that I had difficulty keeping my eyes off her. Since a child, she had transformed from a quiet little black girl with big white eyes and short pigtails into a beautiful young woman with a bright, shiny smile, curly hair, twinkling eyes, and a beautiful figure. I transitioned as well, but not into a spectacular human being, but what I considered to be a semi-good-looking teenager with shoulder-length hair and a mild case of acne. Amazingly, the more we got to know each other, the more we appreciated each other, as if we were tied together by my horrible sin. The scar from my rock did not detract from her good looks in the least, but only enhanced her beauty. Though I never considered it, showing any interest in Hattie or any black girl in Melrose back then would have been considered a mortal sin. Further, Hattie may never address me as Rainy Ray, but simply Rainy. And I followed suit, addressing her as Hattie. Hattie Mae Harris carried a large degree of charismatic energy, driven not only by her beauty, but her soul. When we approached each other on the crowded Main Street, her lovely smile and positive energy was gone and replaced with raw terror. Hattie, what the hell's going on? I need to talk to you, Rainy, and I need to talk to you right now. Okay, Hattie, tell me what's going on. I know what happened, Rainy. I know what happened to Miss Martha the night she got beat up by Mr. Rathers. She glanced over her shoulder and seemed very nervous about being there. We can't talk here. Let's go somewhere where we can be alone. She took my hand and tugged me across the street, up the railroad track and out of view. Back then, never would a white boy run down the tracks holding the hands of a black girl, much less a 16-year-old black girl and a 17-year-old white boy. I could feel a community of eyes watching us as we ran down the tracks and out of sight. We disappeared deep into the woods when she turned around and faced me. She was shaking with fear as her eyes pooled with tears. I couldn't help but take her in my arms and try to protect her. Mr. Rathers told me something rainy. Okay, Hattie, tell me that if I told anyone about what I saw, he'd hunt me down and do me right, he told me. He told me that. Victor Rathers said that to you? Uh-huh, he said that. Well, what does that mean? Do you right. She was crying as she summoned the courage to say more. What, Hattie? Tell me. Mr. Rathers said that if I told anybody about what I saw, he'd hunt me down and do the same to me. Do what to you? What he did to Miss Martha, Rainey. What did he do to her? He was hitting her. And then he was trying to do something else to her. What was he trying to do? I don't know, Rainey. He looked like he was trying to hurt her. And he was trying to smother her with his body. I felt a flame build up in my chest as I soaked in Hattie's tearful eyes as she struggled to describe something for which she had no form of reference. For the next half hour, Hattie may describe a scene that must have been horrifying to witness and terrifying to recall. On the night of the first big dance, Hattie May was finishing up some last-minute chores and was about to leave Miss Martha's house and go home. Victor, on the other hand, had just been beat up by three Melrose boys and was making his way to Miss Martha's home. He was bloody, drunk, embarrassed, and determined to see Miss Martha again. I heard someone talking to himself outside on the steps of the front porch. 
He was talking gibberish. He was making no sense at all. At times, he would cuss out loud at someone in his imagination. I'm coming for you, Darnell. I'm going to get your friends, too. <laughs> and I'm going to see to it that you'll never be able to climb a ladder or paint another house in your dang life. <laughs> Holy shit. You saw all of this? I moved over to the living room window to get a closer look at Victor. When I noticed Miss Martha coming across the street towards the house, I was scared to death for both her and me, but I couldn't do anything to warn her away. She stopped when she saw Victor and turned the other direction and was about to walk away when she heard Victor crying and moaning as if he was in some kind of pain. I guess she felt sorry for him and just wanted to help him or something. You know the way some ladies do, always trying to help the injured. Victor, what happened to you? Did those boys do this to you? Oh, no worries, Martha. I'm okay. I probably deserved every bit of this for my crazy way I dance with you in town. Oh, Miss Martha, I feel so terrible about how you must have felt. But I just wanted to see you and be with you is all. Oh, Victor, you're bleeding. Come on inside and let me clean you up. I scooted back in the kitchen and hid in the broom closet while Miss Martha went in the hallway bathroom to get a warm washcloth and some cotton swabs. Victor had moved to the couch and continued to play the part of a pitiful man. She returned to the couch and began taking care of Mr. Rather. When she was finished, he started running his fingers through her hair and sniffing her neck. Mmm, Miss Martha, you smell so beautiful. I'm so glad you're not upset with me anymore. Thank you for being so kind to me. It looked to me as if Martha enjoyed being in Victor's company as they snuggled closer together. After a few minutes, things started to heat up and they kissed each other for a long time. I didn't want to see any more, so I began edging for the back door when I suddenly heard Miss Martha say, Slow down, Victor, and watch where you go with those hands. Oh, come on, Miss Martha. I can tell you like it. How much have you had to drink, Victor? You reek of alcohol. On his second attempt, Victor realized he had gone too far when Miss Martha grabbed his hand and pushed them away while noticing his wedding ring. Victor, what's this? Are you married? The true face of evil is unmistakable. While some people can hide their inner evil exceptionally well, Victor was one of those people. Most people were not threatened by Victor when they saw him on the street, in church, or when he was at the register of his diner. They considered him goofy and a bit sappy, but not me. I knew there was a dark side of Victor from the very first time I met him. Hattie Mae told me that she saw Victor's face of evil that evening, and I expect it was exactly how I imagined. Victor, I'm asking if you were a married man. Well, technically not. I, I, I'm, well, well, technically, I'm sorry to say that I am. But we've been separated for a very long time. But you're still married, aren't you? Well, yeah, I guess I am. You but... guess you are. Well, where do you live? Well, most of the time I live in the back of my diner. Most of the time? Well, where do you live the rest of the time? Well, I, well I'm still home with her. Well, who's her, Victor? What's her name? Do I know your wife, Victor? Victor was beginning to whimper and stumble on his words. No, I don't expect you do. Miss Martha was really getting upset. What's her name, Victor? Well, her, her name's Amy. Miss Martha stood up and marched over to the front door. Mrs. Rathers? Amy? Amy Rathers? Victor, I know her. I see her at the town hall when I go to pay my water bill. She's your wife? Miss Martha threw open the door and pointed into the darkness. Get out of here, Victor. Get out of my house at once. Oh, come on, Martha. Amy and I are done with each other. We're going to be divorced real soon. Mr. Rathers stood up and was very angry. His face became red. And then it turned black. Shut up, you selfish bitch. You people come here all the time from your rich houses on the coast and flirt with us like it's no tomorrow. I know you like it, and I know you like it a lot. I know you want it too, you selfish bitch. Now shut up and lay down. He was mad, Rainy. He turned into a monster that very second. I could not believe it. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> he was all over her, holding her down and kissing her like a, some kind of a wild man. I could hardly watch as he threw her on the couch and dropped his shorts and underwear and then dove on top of her. She was screaming, Rainy Ray. She was so scared. You witnessed this? Did Victor rape her? I don't know. I don't know. But he tore her shirt off and pulled it over her head. 
She was screaming her lungs out. And then she smacked him over the side of the head with one of her sandals. That's when he looked up and he saw me standing in the other room. So he saw you? He did, Rainy. I was so scared I couldn't move. I thought he was going to come after me. Then I ran out the back door like a frightened cat. Did he come after you? No. I don't think he's told a soul that he saw me. When I got home, I called the sheriff, but no one answered. He was probably drunk on corn liquor, I thought. So I called the hospital, and I told him to get Dr. Roy over there. So that was you that called in and didn't leave your name. I couldn't leave my name, Rainey. That man would have come over and killed me. I held her frightened body in my arms like a baby. After a few minutes, she finally looked up at me through her tearful eyes and said, Oh, Rainey. I'm so ashamed of myself for leaving that poor woman in that house alone to fend for herself. I was so scared, I had to try to call someone. Do your mom and dad know anything about this? Rainy, white people think they can do anything they want to a black person, and nothing will ever happen to them. I have no idea what my mama would have done if she knew anything about this. And daddy? Daddy's not been in good favor with the sheriff for years especially since one of his cousins came in and stole my daddy's property, which was rightfully his. Rainy, he's been following me around ever since that night. I think he's after me. I know he's after me. I felt a cool gust of wind and a slight pain in my sinuses that I always tagged to a drop in barometric pressure as Hattie and I made our way back up the tracks towards town. Most would consider the breeze as just welcome relief from the heat, but since I had advanced warning of the storm, I think that I was one of the few to know. Way off to the north, I noticed a wide curtain of darkness. The curtain of darkness contained an ecliptic character to it, with a frontal boundary that resembled a line that was cut by a straight razor. Little did anyone know, north of Lake Summit to Flat Rock and to Hendersonville, that they were in a severe state of damage and destruction. We picked up the pace and dashed towards East Main Street, where the festivities were at full throttle. People were dancing in the street, laughing, drinking, and having the time of their life. As the storm drew closer, it had a more mysterious look to it. One side of the margin of the storm was entirely black, while the other side was a beautiful shade of blue. Ironically, for such a huge amount of atmospheric intensity, there was no thunder, lightning, or any winds of any kind that could serve as any warning to the unsuspecting town. As we reached the back of the park and came up from the railroad tracks, I saw John and Jane running towards us with a look of alarm on their face. Rainy Ray, you won't believe this. Victor and some attorney from Charleston have detained Miss Martha at the sheriff's office. Victor has Carol by himself now in his car and is coming after you. He's taking Carol. He's got her with him. I can't believe it. I guess he thinks he's going to use her as some sort of hostage. They want to arrest you for the rape of Miss Martha. That fancy attorney from Charleston and Victor somehow obtained a warrant for your arrest. And your mother is madder than hell. And she's chasing after Victor right now. But where in the hell's Gutcher? No one knows. He's been missing all day long. He's been gone. All of his guns are gone. And his radio's missing. Get my breakfast here, my dinner in Tennessee. Get my breakfast here, my dinner in Tennessee. Get my breakfast here, and my dinner in Tennessee. 
I told you it was a coming, so you better wait for me. Russell Wilcox was massive in stature. At 26 years old, 6 feet 7, 243 pounds, Russell was a spectacle to behold. Russell was also what our community openly called a retard. Today we'd consider people with Russell's condition as autistic. Russell held many short-term jobs in town, including in our store, as an awkward stock boy who kept to himself until he couldn't stand it any longer, only to fail to show up and reappear as an employee somewhere else. Unfortunately for Russell, who was generally a decent guy, he could never keep a job because of his inability to stay interested in any one thing for any significant length of time. He lived with his great aunt over on Chestnut Street and would most likely stay there until she passed away. Then after that, he'd probably end up in what our town called a home for the feeble-minded. Russell, however, found one job that he absolutely loved, and that was as a volunteer firefighter at Melrose Fire and Rescue. The department valued Russell, but also took an unfair advantage of his disability and his sheer strength, giving him tasks that most firefighters either hated to do or could not do at all. Russell did exactly what he was told to do, and was often called a human robot. When Russell was given an order, he'd follow through with it, even if he was ordered to do something dangerous, illegal, or entirely wrong. And that was Russell's downfall. He didn't know the difference between right and wrong. Victor, on the other hand, knew the difference between right and wrong, but chose to ignore the consequences. And he used Russell for all of his heavy lifting. When Larson Darnell and his buddies were paid back for Victor's beating, I saw the signature of Russell on Darnell's injuries. I'm sure that Victor ordered Russell to kick the ladder out from beneath Larson Darnell and break several of his bones. Did I mention that Darnell was a big guy? Well, Russell was even bigger. Due to Victor's level of alcohol consumption, his window of sobriety had finally been closed, resulting in a constant level of inebriation. Victor was now a new man in the form of a mean drunk with his pet monster on a leash. So when Russell appeared at Miss Martha's front door with Victor and Carol, everyone in the house froze. Well, looky here. I'm so happy to see all y'all ladies sitting under the same roof. Russell, why don't we just go on in here and make ourselves at home here? and wait for Rainy Ray to get here, so we can place him under arrest. While all of this was going on, John and Jane went north to the jailhouse roof, while we slowly moved south to the store to find my father for help. Hattie never left my side as we pushed our way through the thick crowd. Hattie, you need to go on home now. It's not safe to be out here when that storm comes. I'm not going anywhere, Rainy, except with you. You can't come with me. That's stupid. Really, Hattie, you need to go home to your mom. I've got to figure this whole thing out. Get my father and try to go find my mother. And Stop, Rainy. I'm going with you. Her words were so strong that it did stop me. Dead in my tracks. I turned and faced her as the wind kicked up and blew her hair away from her face. Please, Hattie, you need to go home. I asked as if I was pulling rank, but she was determined to stay with me as she gripped both of my hands and charged, I've got to go with you, Rainy. I'm not going to abandon that poor woman again. The wind was elevated now with minor lightning and deep thunder in the distance as the bands downtown continued to play and the granddaddy continued on. The crowds saw no reason for alarm with not an umbrella coming down or a single person heading to their cars. Sitting ducks. I thought, as Hattie and I finally reached the parking lot of our store. Our bag man was still there as we entered the store. Hey, Billy, is Dad here? Nope. He's done left here about ten minutes ago to go try to find your mama. Oh, shit. And he took the truck, too. Now what am I going to do for transportation? The phone rang at my dad's desk as I raced around the registers, climbed up into the office, and grabbed the receiver. Holford's Grocers, Rainy Ray speaking. Guess who we found, Rainy Ray? Asked John. Who? And where are you? We're at the sheriff's office. Well, who'd you find? Gudger, John said after an extended pause. And guess where he was? Where? After another dramatic pause. He was locked in the vault. What? For how long? Oh, since about uh, 
2.30 in the morning. I looked at my watch and calculated that Gudger had been locked in the vault for 18 hours. Well, who found him? We did. Are you freaking kidding me? Nope. Jane and I were looking through the access panel of the jail when we heard some strange noise below our feet. Then I spotted Gudger's glasses on the floor by his desk. I thought, something's not right here. So I slid down the water pipe and went over by the vault door. And then I heard the noise again. It sounded like a faint moan. When I slid open the food tray slot, I almost fell back on my ass. There was Gudger's bloodshot eyes staring right back at me. Holy shit! That's what I said. He scared the crap out of me. So he told me how to unlock the vault door and let him out. And my God, you can't imagine how ready he was to be out of there. Well, how did he end up in the vault, John? Well, he didn't say. I bet Victor probably locked him up in there. I thought of the events of the day and the number of people who had been in the sheriff's office, never once thinking to check out the vault. But the vault was virtually soundproof, especially with all the people and noise outside on the street. Gudger could have been screaming his ass off and no one would have heard him. Listen to this. The mayor had the only keys to the office where he met with Hayden Lake and Victor. Can you even imagine this? The mayor, Hayden Lake, and Victor Rathers had a meeting in the sheriff's office with Gudger locked up in the vault. Victor's got some damn balls, I'll tell you. All of his guns were missing, too, and so is his dispatch radio. Did Gudger call the state police? No way. If the county had found him in the vault, they probably had thought he belonged in there because he looked like hell, and he smelled worse. He left, and he was madder than hell, and didn't even thank me. But he did look back at me with a confused look on his face as he unlocked the front door to leave. How'd you get in here, boy? Huh? Ah, uh, never mind. But he doesn't have a gun, does he, John? Oh, he found one, Rainy Ray, and he found one in short order. Yep, I bet Gudger was going to go try to find Victor and settle him down in his own way. Because Gudger knows his ass is also on the line with his Holbert Cove distilling operation. I've got to go find my mom, John. I think she might be over at Miss Martha's, but my dad took off in the truck. Was my mom over at your house? Nope. Well, then I'm sure she's over at Miss Martha's. But I don't have any wheels, John. What am I going to do? What about the Harley? I thought about it for a second and said, Damn, you're right. Hey, meet me at Miss Martha's. Behind the store, there was a storage shed. And the summer before, I borrowed John's 1950 Harley Davidson 125cc. It was one of the smallest Harley motorbikes ever made. But boy, it was a little tiger on the road. I once fell off the damn thing in the wet grass and burned the shit out of my legs. I still had that scar from that accident today. The Harley was still there, but it hadn't been started in months. Hattie helped me get it out from behind an old bed frame and a broken sink. On the third crank, that bike fired up like it was used yesterday. Between the excitement of getting that small motorbike started, and an ever-increasing appreciation of being with Hattie. An old Harley quote surfaced in my memory. Life is a journey, Hattie, so let's ride this journey on a Harley Davidson. Carol was visibly frightened as she stood by Russell's side under the grip of his huge hands. Russell! Take your hands off that young lady, and Victor, you get the hell out of this house right now, my mother ordered, as Victor moved to the center of the living room. Shut up, Elaine, Victor said as he pulled his gun out of his holster and pointed it at the ceiling. You think I'm playing around here, Elaine? Well, I ain't. Victor was brandishing his firearm just as Pearly entered the room with a pitcher of iced tea. The sight of Victor surprised her so much that the tea fell to the floor, crashing and shattering glass everywhere. Miss Martha advanced on Russell to drag her daughter away, but Victor met her halfway. Let go of my daughter, you brute! You'll have your daughter back as soon as Rainy Ray gets here, ladies. Until then, I want all y'all to get over on that couch, sit down, and shut up. I do hope I've got all y'all ladies' undivided attention by now. Because I'm here on official business. What the hell are you talking about, Victor? Have you lost your mind? Miss Martha charged. Now, my mind is quite sharp now, Mrs. Smith. Especially since I learned that you're a married woman. <laughs> hell, 
I at least wear my wedding ring on my finger, where it belongs. Shame on you, Mrs. Smith, for coming up your flirt with all our young boys, while all along claiming you was a divorcee. <laughs> no wonder you got old Rainy Ray so hot and bothered. He's probably thinking all y'all was hot to trot. Oh, Mrs. Smith, let me tell you one more thing Mr. Lake is planning to do to you because of your relations with Elaine's son. Are you listening to me, Mrs. Smith? Are you following me? Yes. Well, not only are you not divorced, Mrs. Smith, but your husband is now suing you for having adulterous relations with Rainy Ray. And with that, Miss Martha fell back and collapsed on the couch. I expect that you and your daughter here shouldn't have run out of Charleston until your divorce was uh, final and recorded. <laughs> now, back to business. Uh, late this afternoon, Mr. Lake acquired an arrest warrant for Rainy Ray. And so I'm here on behalf of the state of North Carolina to come pick him up and take him away. So when your boy shows up here, I'm going to place that little smart ass under arrest, and I'm going to take him to the Polk County Jail. Oh, and Elaine, <laughs> your boy has one filthy mouth. You should have heard the profanity spewing out of his mouth when I caught him and Doc's boy driving without a license all the way down to Tryon and shooting guns off at the falls. Fuck you, Victor. Fuck off and go to hell and stay away from my mother, you asshole. Oh, shut up, Victor, my mother shouted. Let me see the arrest warrant. Oh. So you want to see the arrest warrant? Well, how about I read it to all y'all, aloud? Uh, let me put my glasses on first. Uh, let's see here. Uh, warrant number uh, JS-4-10-17. Dash NC-1. Dash That's the warrant number. The state of North Carolina, County of Polk, to any peace officers of the state of North Carolina, uh, of which I am one of, the underlined magistrate uh, having heretofore found that probable cause exists for the issuance of this warrant, you are hereby commanded to arrest uh, Rainy Ray Holford, a white male born on May 20th, 1952. For the offense of rape. That's ridiculous, Victor. He did no such thing. Now you release my daughter and leave this home immediately. Martha, and this goes for everyone here. If any of y'all try to interfere with this lawful arrest, I'll be forced to place each one of you under arrest for obstruction. Victor, who the hell do you think you are? You're acting as if you've never seen me before, Miss Martha said. And you know what you did to me. Now stop this nonsense and get out of my house. Ma'am. Listen to me. I'm an officer of the law, simply doing my job here. Stop it, Victor. This minute. My mom demanded. Where's Gudger, Victor? What'd you do with him? <laughs> what did you do with him? Elaine, never you mind about Gudger. Let's just say uh, he's in a very safe place. Russell, my mother demanded. I want you to release Carol to her mother this instance or you are going to be charged for kidnapping. <laughs> now, Russell, you will do no such thing, because I'm an officer of the law, and you were my deputy. Russell stopped dead in his tracks, seemingly confused as to which order he should obey. Now, you know me, Russell, and you know that I care about your well-being, but you also need to know that this man is not your friend, and he's using you to do some very bad things. Now, that young lady did nothing to deserve you holding on to her like that. Shut up, Elaine. Russell, when I give you an order, I want you to do that dang order. Do you understand me? Russell, now you know who I am, and you also know that your aunt is a friend of mine. Now, I want you to listen to me. Do not do anything Victor tells you to do. He is a bad man. Again, while all this was going on, this time when I left the store, my backpack containing a gun, water, Slim Jims, and beef jerky was not on my back, but on Hattie's, as we left the store and headed north up Main Street towards Lake Summit. The wind was blowing hard, and the rain was falling, letting everyone know 
that it was closing time. A loud bang followed by a crack and a snap of thunder caused Hattie to grip my waist even harder now as we rode up East Main to Colfer Street, to Seminary Street, to Church Street, and then back down to West Main. We were able to avoid the mayhem on Main Street while people were running for cover. The wind was very strong as large raindrops pounded our bodies as our little motorbike fought through the storm. I thought of downtown Melrose and thought of everyone in town running for cover. The band on the stage, the tents, and the once happy crowd were no longer running to keep the game soaked, but they were running for their life as the massive storm pressed down upon them. I glanced down at my waist and saw Hattie's hands clinging to me and that little motorbike putting along. I also remember an unusual level of comfort protecting Hattie. A wall of water washed our bodies, stung our faces, and soaked our hair as I stared down at my little motorbike still sparking along. On we pushed up Spartanburg Highway to Lake Summit Road, then finally to Point of View Lane, where Miss Martha's house appeared in the rainy distance. We drove straight for the front porch, got off and ran for the tin roof, never once noticing any vehicles parked nearby. We dashed for the front entrance, fumbled for the doorknobs, and made our grand entrance. Well, look who's finally gotten home here safe and sound. It's Rainy Ray Holford, along with Hattie May, Wainwright. Hmm, don't you two look so cute together? We've been all so worried about you. But I must admit, I'm a bit surprised to see you here with Pearlie's youngin. Ain't you wondering what in the world this boy's been doing with your own blood? Why, there ain't no telling what these two teens been doing up there in the woods. You know, I saw y'all earlier, son, running up the railroad track, holding that little picking in his hand. <laughs> Almost everyone else in town saw you running up in the woods with her, too. I tell you, Rainy Ray, you must have one highly charged, uh, what's that word, a libido? <laughs> hey, Rainy Ray. What's it like? Uh, taste some of that brown sugar. Stop it, Victor. That is awful and disgusting, yelled my mother. Victor's demeanor suddenly switched from a silly and jovial person to a man clearly detached from reality. Now, son, I'm here to place you under arrest. And I don't want you to make things any worse than they really already are. Get out of here, Rainy Rain. Take Hattie Mae with you, my mother ordered. Stay put, son. Now, I'm warning you, boy. If you make one move, I'll be forced to have Russell here come take you by the arm. Now, I'm in charge here, and we're going to make ourselves a little uh, trade. It's going to be one for one, son. Hattie Mae for Carol. Now, Hattie Mae, I need for you to come over to me right now. You know I'm going to do you right. I had enough and shot forward. Well, that'd be over my dead body, Victor. Well, I'd hate to see a young boy like you arrange for his own death. I'd also hate it even more to have a reason to shoot my own son. Don't you let my good girl catch you here. Don't you let my good girl catch you here. Do she might kill you, come stomp you too. Ain't no telling what else she might do. Hey, <laughs> don't tell me your troubles, I got troubles of my own. Don't tell me your troubles. Mm -hmm. Leave me alone, leave me alone. Go on home, home. tell it to a friend. I got troubles of my own. Troubles of my own. Chapter 15. They say you good girl left you. Well, what you think about me? It's written all over your lonesome face and ain't heartbreak fool can see. Leave me alone. Go on home. Tell it to a friend. Troubles of my own. Troubles of my, own. my entire life, I was blessed with the gift of gab. From the moment I could speak, I possessed a unique power 
over the use of words. Earlier, I told you that my schooling was more of a study in socialization than history, math, or science. I got along with everybody and was never in a fight. Once, a bully punched me in the mouth because he thought his girlfriend had a crush on me. Rather than me seeking revenge, the entire school shunned him for hitting me. It was as if I was off limits to attacks from the kids in school who made it their life's objective to beat up other people. When others use stones, their fists, or even guns to press their points, I used my vocabulary to disarm others and change their perspective on the situation at hand. Looking back, I believe I had a wider vocabulary than most anyone in town, including my own parents. Even more, I had the ability to choose the right words at the right time. Timing is everything. I remember my father saying to me one day, Get back to work, Rainy Ray. You're a real joke cracker, you know that? Even though he was frustrated with me. I noticed him laughing at my joke as he walked away. I also always considered writing easy, until I realized it was difficult for everyone else in my class. I think it was a function of my constant reading that strengthened my brain, which I always considered to be akin to a verbal muscle. So, when Victor brought up the notion of killing me, his own son, I knew I needed to grab onto that topic and resort to the only weapon I had in my arsenal, which were words. The room went silent after Victor informed me that I was his own son. I didn't even dare to look at my mother's face after his acknowledgement, but I couldn't help but see the shock and disbelief on Miss Martha's face. What did he say, Elaine? Miss Martha said, Shh, quiet, Martha, my mother whispered. I felt Hattie Mae standing behind me, shivering, gripping my wet t-shirt, while I became a human shield to her. The world was now between me and Victor. And I was sick and tired of worrying about the possibility that Victor might be my father. And I also was sick and tired of him pushing us around and terrorizing my parents. So I put him to the test. My ability to keep things calm also became paramount. When I noticed the top of my father's head pass by the window outside towards the back of the house. Anything could happen, I thought as Victor stood there with an appearance that resembled a crazy man who just exposed himself in public. The notion of Victor shooting me seemed possible, but strangely improbable, as I collected myself. Now that I was the center of attention in Victor's eyes, it was now my job to protect everyone else in the room, including my now mislabeled father, who could come bounding into the room at any second. When I saw my father standing in the darkness of the dining room, I resorted to my only other form of communication that I often employed when trying to talk someone off the edge of a cliff, which was body language. I quickly pitched my first nonverbal command to my father as he stood in the darkness while I looked Victor dead in the eyes. Stop, Dad. I've got this. Please do not come into this room. I mean it, Dad. Just give me a chance to call this idiot down, I said through my mind, body, and soul. My father seemed to register my command as he moved back off into the darkness. It was now my time to control the room. Victor, could I ask you a question? I said as I carefully touched his arm. Victor leered down on my hand and slapped it away. Take your hand off me, son. You ain't got no questions from me. Now, Eddie May, I just gave you an order to come over here to me. Now, if you do what I say, then this boy here and I can go on with the due process of law. Hattie, stay exactly where you are, and I'd like everyone here to remain calm. While I have an overdue conversation with my real father. Shut up, Rainy Ray. This is not the time and place for that. What the hell do you think you're doing here, anyway? Be careful, son, my mother pleaded. He's crazy. Who you calling crazy, bitch? I just want some clarification on what you just said to me, Dad. Victor appeared even more agitated as he rose up on his haunches and leered down at me. You want clarification for what, son? Victor, now you just told me something that I'd never considered before in my entire life, and- Ah, uh, now shut up, son. Don't ask me any more questions about that. That's for another time. That is, if you live long enough to have another time. Well, you brought it up, Dad. So don't you think I have a right for a little explanation here? 
about my lineage? I mean, you just called me your son here again. Not now, Rainy Ray, my mother pleaded. He's speaking nonsense, and it's also not true. Now, Victor, please leave this house immediately before things go in the wrong direction for you. It's okay, Mom. I think Victor is a troubled person, but I also think he's been hiding something deep inside for a very long time. I just want to see if I can find some relief for my father's tension. Shut the hell up, son. And you too, Elaine. What do you mean the wrong direction? <laughs> my life went the wrong direction the day you walked away from me. Started your new life with Wilford. Well, now we're getting somewhere, aren't we, Dad? Mom, can I ask you to please calm down and let me try to help this tortured man as I trained my eyes on Victor? I just want to give you a little time to tell me why you never told me that you are my father. And why you're also trying to blame me for something that you did. Shut up, son. I mean, Rainy Ray. And I'd also like to give you the opportunity to tell me what happened between you and my mother. No, Rainy Ray. Not now, my mother pleaded. Shut up, you little brat. Well, Victor, you brought it up. And I believe there's never been a better time to put all this on the table. Son, I want you to stop asking me questions and hand over Hattie Mae. Don't you hurt my baby, Curly Ann cried. Shut up, Aunt Jemima, and go find me a damn drink. Oh, no, Dad, that's no way to speak to Pearly Ann. But it might be just what the doctor ordered. Pearly Ann, please excuse my father's prejudicial language. Why don't you go see if you can find my father a drink to calm his nerves? Stay put, Pearly Ann. What are you trying to do here, boy? Victor shook his head as if he was questioning reality. Suddenly, Victor snapped and advanced on me, holding his gun in the direction of my face. Are you trying to mess with my mind, boy? Now, son, do you know what the hell this thing is? He said as he pointed the gun directly into my eyes. Yes. Thick silence filled the room while harsh thunder, lightning, and rain pressed down on the house. I asked you a question, boy. And I said, yes, Dad. Stop calling me Dad, you little smartass. Now, do you know what I'm going to do with this gun if you don't hand over that little pickaninny? Hattie Mae, please excuse my father's use of prejudicial jargon, for I don't expect he knows any better. Now back to the gun. Yes, Father, I expect I do know what you think you might do with that gun if you have the courage to do so. Courage? What the hell are you talking about, courage? I have the courage right now to kill you, boy. My father became more prominent as he moved closer into the doorway. Again, I ordered non-verbally. Dad, stay away. I have this. Both Miss Martha and Pearly Ann were crying as they witnessed the strange dynamics in the room. Father, why would you keep all of this from me for all of these many years? Keep what from you, Rainy Ray, you little shit? Ah, now, Dad. Why would you call your own son a little shit? while at the same time you're also threatening to kill me, your own son. Now, does any of this make any sense to you, Dad? For the first time in probably Victor's entire life, he seemed cornered, Dad. I softly spoke as Victor studied my eyes. How can you live in the same town with me and never approach me about this? Never once did you confide in me and tell me that you are my real father. I'm almost wondering if it's really true. Well, it is true, boy. Well, then shame on you, Victor. You will never deserve the name Dad. Thunder hit so close to the house, knocking the power out and shaking the floor. When the lights returned, everyone but Victor and I changed their positions in the room, with my father no longer in the doorway, and my mother positioned directly next to Victor with a gun pointed directly at his head. Victor, my mother calmly said, now I'm going to give you one chance to live. Do you understand me? Now I want you to put the gun on the floor and back away from my son. Victor quickly turned and faced my mother and the barrel of her Smith & Wesson. She was holding the gun like a pro with both hands, as if she had received prior weapons training. But looky here, Elaine's got herself a gun and she's holding it against the head of an officer of the law. Now I want you to put that gun down and step away. My mother confidently cocked the gun and moved closer to Victor's head. Now, Elaine, I want you to look at the situation from my standpoint. All I'm doing is upholding the law. Wrong, Victor. All you're doing is threatening my son and everyone else in this room. Now drop the gun on the floor and step over to the fireplace. Oh, you ain't got the guts to shoot the real father of your boy here. Oh, on the contrary, Victor. I've got all the nerve in the world to shoot you dead right here and now. But I'm Rainy Ray's father. And Victor, 
I want you to listen to me right now. You are not my son's father. Oh, that's just a bunch of hogwash. You know it and I know it, Elaine. We was together a long time ago, remember? And we... And you raped me, Victor. Come on, Elaine, that wasn't rape. It was, a um, passion. You know you wanted me. And now look at what we created here, this beautiful boy, Rainy Ray. The conversation shook me as I felt Hattie Mae's fingers slip away from my shoulders. We made love, Elaine. Shut up. Victor, my mother calmly said. Anger was building in my chest. My mother took a deep breath and never took her eyes off Victor as she directed her words to everyone else in the room, most especially me. You loved it, Elaine, didn't you? You loved it. I know you did. Wrong, Victor. You loved it. Loved what? Having power over me, Martha, and God knows who else. What are you talking about, Elaine? Victor, there's not a day that goes by that I wish I wouldn't have killed you for what you did to me, but I didn't because I was a coward. Shut up, Elaine. You're still a coward and a selfish bitch, just like all y'all summer girls are. How many others have you raped, Victor? Mom, please stop. Quiet, son. I should have killed you then, Victor, but I didn't. Only for you to try to do the same to Martha and so many others, I'm sure. A huge crack of thunder as the power went out. And I went for it. I dove for Victor and wrapped my arms around his torso, slamming him to the wooden floor. I was squeezing the ever-living shit out of him, feeling his spine and joints crackle. But for a skinny man, Victor had a surprising amount of strength as he snaked around and pushed the barrel of the gun into my stomach. There we go, Rainy Ray. You're a spunky little shit, ain't you? But you're not as spunky as your own daddy. On came the lights again, as everyone in the room had changed their positions, including my father, who was now standing above Victor, coming down with his nightstick right towards Victor's head. The nightstick was on target, as Victor suddenly ducked, causing the stick to miss. Russell, capture that man at once. On order, Russell released Carol. My father was now in the arms of Russell, while Victor rose to his feet. Now all y'all are in a big amount of trouble. Especially you, Wilfred. No, we're not, Victor. You are, my mother screamed, with the gun still trained on Victor's head. Russell, let my husband go. You will do no such thing, deputy. Release him, Russell. Hold on to him, Russell. Hold on to him, Russell. A stalemate situation was in play, as all activity stalled when... Boom, 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 boom. boom, boom. Three deafening gunshots went off leaving everyone in the room wondering who was now dead. Hattie Mae was standing near the front door, aiming the discharged gun directly at Victor. She had just shot three holes into the ceiling. I saw what you did, Mr. Victor, to Miss Martha. And I'm going to tell everyone. Well, there's my damn gun. How'd you, how'd you get that? Lights out again. Get out of here, son, my mother ordered. Take Hattie and get her out of here now. I've got this. Hattie threw open the door grabbed my hand and yanked me out of the house into the storm. Victor had other plans and was too quick for my mother as he bolted out of the house after us. The rain was coming down in sheets as Hattie and I ran straight for our little Harley. The waterlogged motorbike struggled to start, but upon the third crank, the little engine fired up and we were off. Out of the drive and onto the road we raced as I glanced back at the house, noticing the lights from Victor's squad car illuminating through the storm charged after us. Lake Summit covered 324 acres with 10 miles of shoreline. There was only one way in and one way out. Lake Summit Road was then, and today still is, a poorly maintained gravel road. Under normal conditions, much of the gravel is usually gone with deep dips and holes in the road, making navigating it challenging. But on that evening, the storm had turned the road into a treacherous mess with mud, standing water, and down trees and branches. We bumped along the one-way road in pouring rain, which also included hail, hitting our obstacles surprisingly well due to the motorcycle's mountain bike suspension and the knobby tire tracks. For a moment, I felt a level of confidence that we might be able to make it around the lake much better than Victor. But my confidence diminished. I saw Victor's squad hitting the pot in narrow turns, like a car in a demolition derby. Victor's nuts, I thought as I saw him throw caution to the wind. He had abandoned any semblance of a person pretending to carry out the duties of a lawman. Victor was after us for other reasons, most likely filled with anger 
rage and all-out sanity. He passed the point of no return, with no way to return back to any semblance of a normal life in Melrose. He lost his wife, his church, his business, his town, and his dignity. He also realized that he was at a mortal impasse with Gudger, which up until the night before was his only savior. That's what they always say Take it more like a man Don't stand in my way Tell me shit, she's no good She's as mean as she can be It's written all over your lonesome face And a heartbreak fool can see Leave me alone Go on home Tell it to a friend I got troubles of my own Troubles of my own Howdy, Chuck Walking boss Walking boss, yes, you're the boss. But I don't belong to you. I belong, I belong, and I get along with that steel driving crew. Chapter 16. Ask that boss man for a job. Said I want a job. He said, son, what can you do? I can line track, I can line up track, and I can pull a jack, and I can pick and shovel too. As kids, John and I spent a lot of time together on the railroad tracks. You might say that we had an up-close and personal relationship with trains. Because back in the woods, directly behind John's property, was a trestle. And that was our own private playground. We spent hours on those tracks, days and nights soaking in the mysteries of the railroad. We flattened countless pennies under the wheels of those heavy trains. Quarters, dimes, and nickels were way too expensive to waste in those days. We threw rocks at the boxcars, shot pellet guns at the wheels of the trains and ran like hell when those oncoming trains took us by surprise. I remember looking way down the tracks in the distance and seeing that single headlight from a train making its way up the tracks towards us. Then we'd place our ears on the warm rails and listen to the vibrations of those mighty wheels over a mile away. It was amazing how quickly those trains came upon us as we ran for a safe spot to sit and watch those cars go by. I mentioned earlier that we were fearless of the heights of that concrete trestle. Never even imagined falling over the edge. But we feared those trains all right. Because every single piece and part of a train is huge. The sound was amazing as we stood in awe, feeling the rumbling vibrations and the wind from those cars blasting past us. We appreciated the size and power of those amazing trains which some measured a mile long. When those trains approached us, we instantly realized that the tracks were theirs and not ours. We also became well aware of the fact that we were trespassing on Southern Railway's land. And if the railroad police ever caught us on their land, we'd be in trouble. Surprisingly, we never saw the railroad police, but we did keep an eye out for the men in the caboose that could come after us. John had an older brother who played center for the high school football team. He was popular as hell, but a bit odd. But he had a couple of crazy friends who lacked any respect for the railroad. They threw anything they could on those tracks just to see what happened. Once, one of the idiots laid railroad ties up the rails and down the tracks. John and I found them and tossed them aside, mainly because we gave a damn. Another dumbass thought it'd be fun to rearrange the lights on the railroad traffic signal. For a period of time, red meant proceed, green meant stop, and yellow meant nothing at all. Other kids in town came upon halted trains containing automobiles. Each one of the cars had keys in the ignition, and often the kids would start the engines, blare the radios, and steal the batteries from under the hoods. John and I never did anything like that, because we were good boys. However, while John and I respected the rules of the tracks, 
We did something we didn't believe anyone else did in the town of Melrose. We surfed those trains all the way down the grade. Those other boys bragged about how they jumped the trains too. But no other kids ran across the top of those trains, jumping from car to car like we did. Yep, we were good boys, all right. Fearless, strong, and nuts. The first train car we climbed to the top of was a stock car, completely stuffed with pigs. And that was the most terrifying experience of my life. It was amazing how loud it was on the top of those trains with the rattling, banging, and screeching those wheels. The first time up, I gripped a stationary rail with all my might, crouched on all fours, and prayed for enough courage to look ahead down the line for the engine, which was completely out of sight. After many minutes of trying to gain my composure, I carefully rose to my feet and stood there hyperventilating. I was about to drop back down to my knees when I saw John standing in front of me with a big old smile on his face. Come on, Rainy Ray, don't be such a wimp. Stand up and relax and enjoy the view. John was one of those people who cared less about high speeds, heights, centrifugal force. He was not afraid of any ride at the amusement park and probably would be the first kid in North Carolina to sign up for a rocket ride to the moon. I was not wired that way at all. But after several rides, I finally received my sea legs, and the rest was history. The highest crest of the mountain was at Pace's Crossing in the center of Melrose. The trains crawled into the depot to pick up a road foreman of engines from Hendersonville, who would take over the controls and guide the engines down the grade. Those guys had it made, too. They had one short job to do, and that was it and they were paid more than anyone else who worked on the railroad, each only working about three days a week. Well, I guess they were due the money they were paid because they had special training on safely driving a train up and down the grade. They adjusted pressure valves, set their dynamic brakes at precise points along the grade to prevent the train from going more than eight miles an hour around the curves at Sand Cut. If the train was one mile over maximum speed, Automatic switches would divert the train to safety tracks. Now, the maximum limit was 35 miles an hour. Now, that might sound slow to you, but let me tell you something. It was fast as hell, especially when you're standing on top of one of those damn things. The wind blew against our entire bodies as the train banged along and jagged from left to right through the woods, around the curves, and over the bridges. When we approached Sand Cut, the engineer would slow down to eight miles an hour, and that's when John and I had the most fun. We performed science experiments on top of those moving trains as we traveled down the grade and around the curve. We played catch with baseballs just to see what happened. And yep, the ball stayed with us. We'd jump high into the air just to see if we landed in the same spot, and we found that we did. After we became fully competent upon one car at varying speeds, we decided to take our daredevil stunts to the next level and traverse from one car to the next. The only time I ever thought I was going to fall off a train car was when I found myself gripping the top of a passenger car. The tops of those cars were slick, curved, and provided nothing to hold on to. That time, there were three of them in the center of a mile-long train, and each car was packed with people. I knew this because as I was sliding off the edge to my death, I grabbed onto a huge pipe and slipped down to the back door. John was on a boxcar laughing his ass off at me as I sat on a platform below a window all the way down to the Tryon Depot. For the record, there was only one train car that John and I never attempted to stand on, and that was a tank car. Those cars were like huge, slick sausages with nothing to hold on to at all. Many of those cars carried about 23,000 gallons of fuel, so we didn't even dare to get near them. Okay, so that's the setup. Now back to our mad dash around Lake Summit on our motorcycle, with a crazy lunatic barreling after us in a terrible rainstorm. If it were not for Victor's headlights being less than a foot away from the back of my motorcycle, I would not have been able to see the road in front of us. I hugged the inside curve of the muddy road in front of us, while Victor's police cruiser slid to the right, hitting a low-hanging tree branch and knocking out his right headlight. 
That mishap provided me enough access to a narrow, bumpy straightaway, which I took full advantage of as I pushed that little Harley to the max. Victor's spinning police light and single muddy headlight was all I could see as he accelerated to his max. The rain was slowing down and I was able to focus on the obstacles further down the road while making better strategic moves. Hattie had her arms completely wrapped around my torso. And she called out orders like my personal navigator. Stump ahead! Just to the left! Now to the right, Rainy! Watch that pothole! To the right! Okay, Rainy, now go, go, go! At that final pothole and a surge up a gentle upward slope, we went airborne, gaining even more distance. I was amazed by Hattie's confidence and presence of mind as we reached the paved portion of Lake Summit Road. We were on our way to Spartanburg Highway when I felt the engine stutter, and I realized at once that we were running out of gas. That last surge, we were done. We dumped the bike and ran down the road under the trestle above us. Victor's car charged around the corner, lost control, flipped sideways and slammed into a ditch. The car was now demolished as he emerged from the vehicle, seemingly unhurt, and ran after us. Norfolk Southern, train 1612 out of New York City, was slowly passing over the tracks above us as Hattie and I climbed up the hill towards the side of the moving train. Hattie climbed the hill much faster than I did as I fell on the rocks below me and grabbed for the poison ivy and kudzu. Victor was on me like an animal lunging at my legs. He was out of his mind with anger. Come here, you little son of a bitch. You and that little bitch are coming with me to jail for attacking me, an officer of the dang law. He grabbed my right foot, twisted me around, and flipped me on my back. I was sliding down the hill towards Victor while Hattie stood at the top of it, Stop it, Mr. pelting Victor, Victor with Stop rocks. It, Stop it, you little nigger bitch. I'll be after you once I take care of this little bastard. And if you tell anybody about what you saw the other night, I swear I'm going to kill your mother and burn your daddy's church down. And with that, I sprung forward and punched yeah. Victor so hard in the mouth with every bit of adrenaline I had in my body. How do you love me now, Dad? Victor's jaw was now clearly out of whack and blood was flowing out of his mouth oh! as he pounced on me like a wild animal. I hate you, Rainy Ray. I've always hated you since you've been born, he said as he sprayed spit and blood all over my face. I've always hated you, Rainy Ray, because every time I look at you, all I see is Elaine. She was the only woman I ever really wanted to have. Well, too bad for you, Victor, because you are nothing more than a rapist and a monster. How many more were there, Victor? How many more women have you raped and had your way with, Victor? Tell me, you miserable man. Oh, you act like you don't know. You know, you're part of me, Rainy Ray. You got it in you too, Rainy Ray. No, I don't. Something in me clicked when I realized that I was not at all born from this demon. Call it a message from God or Mother Earth that suddenly convinced me that Victor was no relation to me. He was from another planet probably called hell. The lights from an automobile illuminated the road below us while Victor wrapped his gnarly hands around my neck and started choking me. I could no longer breathe as his thumbs pressed through the center of my throat. I was just about to pass out when Victor was pulled off me by two men in black hats and raincoats. Down they drug Victor towards a black car in the distance, kicking and screaming the whole way. In what seems like an instance, he was in the black car and they were gone. My knuckles on my right hand were sore and bleeding, or I'm sure I knocked at least two of Victor's teeth out. But the pain felt rewarding and comforting for injuring that terrible man. I watched through the rain as the car drove way down the muddy road and out of sight. Most likely plain clothesmen from Hendersonville or Rutherfordton, called in by my parents, Gudger, or maybe even John, I thought. Come on, Rainy Ray, get up here. Let's get out of here. Hattie's voice gave me a boost of enthusiasm as I put Victor out of my mind, climbed up the hill towards Hattie and the moving train. Let's catch this thing, Rainy. Come on. Down the road, she ran as I struggled to keep up with her. Before I realized it, Hattie was safely on a ladder, clinging to the side of a flat car, reaching out for me. She looked entirely confident, as if jumping a moving train was all but routine. As I was chasing after her, I realized that I was running out of room as the front of the flat car reached the edge of the trestle. From that point on, there would be no place for me to run. Grab my hand, Rainy! 
Now, Rainy! Grab my hand, Rainy! Now! Grab my hand! He said as I dove towards her. I felt the power of Hattie's formidable strength slap the palm of my hand against the edge of the ladder. I was now swinging for my life as we moved over the edge of the trestle, stirring down at my feet and the forest far below. Again, Hattie surprised me as she grabbed my neck and wrapped her arms around me, pulling my body against hers, then to safety. Seconds later, I found myself lying on my back with my head in Hattie's lap in the center of an empty flat car. I was coming to my senses, staring up at the sky as the train picked up speed and moved on to try on. I soon realized that Hattie was holding me in her arms like a baby, just as I had done earlier in the day in the woods. Tears of joy surprised me as I buried my face against Hattie's chest and cried. I was so overcome with emotion that I emptied my entire summer of pent-up fear and frustration into her loving embrace. As we approached the Melrose Depot, I saw only a torchlight from a signalman directing the train as we passed through our dark and quiet town. I looked up at Hattie's face and just took a look at her as she studied my emotions. I thought to myself, this woman just saved my life. I also realized one more thing at that very moment that I was falling in love with Hattie Mae Harris. Due to the weather and the severity of damage in the towns to the north of us, the road formative engines must have taken the controls in Hendersonville with no plans to stop in Melrose on their way down the grade. The wind had died down and the stars were out as we got to our feet and walked towards the boxcar in front of us. So, I guess you think you boys are the only ones that can surf these trains. Well, follow me, Hattie said with a huge smile and inviting eyes. I sprang into action and followed her to the top of the train car as we moved faster and faster down the grade. I was amazed how Hattie moved across the boxcars and jumped from one to the next. We both felt at liberty as we took a seat under the light of a full moon, holding hands and looking into each other's eyes. All we could do was take in each other's excitement and smile at one another. Kiss me, Rainy. I could not believe what I was hearing. I said, kiss me, Rainy Ray Holford. I know you want to. I said to myself, am I that transparent? How can she tell that I wanted to kiss her? I stared at her like a stupid adolescent on a first date with a girl. Oh, for God's sakes, Rainy, if you won't kiss me, then I guess it's up to me. And with that, she reached over and gently pressed my face against hers and gave me the most tender kiss I'd ever received in my entire life. I thought about giving her a second kiss, but paused for a single second. I welcomed her again with my own kiss, which seemed to last a month as the valley floor passed by us and the moon further ignited our feelings for one another. I asked her, how in the world has she learned to do what I thought no one else could do except for John and myself? She told me that since every time she and her friends passed by our school on the way to the bus station, they were rocked by us Melrose boys. And with that statement, I felt terrible. So the only way we could get to our school in Hendersonville was by train. So we hopped those trains every single day to school in all types of weather. At about 11.30 p.m., we closed in on Sand Cut as the train slowed down and the wheels began to squeal and stutter. So at about five miles an hour, we hopped off the train and walked towards an old water tank and an abandoned watchman shanty. The second story of the structure was thankfully open and would serve as a great place for us to rest and wait for a morning ride back up the grade. Hattie removed my backpack from her shoulders as I spread out several burlap bags in the center of the floor. Neither Hattie or I had anything to eat since morning, so we shared my canteen of water and ate all of the beef jerky and Slim Jims. We were completely worn out from the day and too exhausted to discuss any details as we laid next to one another on our makeshift burlap pad and fell asleep. We soundly slept together in each other's arms until the break of day. 
it was a perfect ending to one of the most terrifying days of my entire life. And it was on the eve of a completely new and unimaginable next couple of days. Work one day, one hard day, I didn't draw no pain. Just lay down in a shanty too. Walking on, walking on, I hear the boss. But I don't, but I don't belong to you. Chapter 17 Sunday, August 24th, 1969, was just another day I deposited into my bank of milestone events. It seemed that I was building a large balance of circumstantial nightmares in my life that will remain in my account forever. It was now one week after Hurricane Camille scooped up over a billion gallons of ocean and dumped it directly into my own backyard. It was also just two days after my cousin Dickie and his hippie girlfriend returned home from Woodstock, a music and art fair that was held on a dairy farm in Bethel, New York. At first, no one in Polk County paid much attention when the rain set in at about 9.30 on the night of Coondog Day. But after 12 inches of rain fell over our region over a six-hour period, our Christian community became convinced that God was on a warpath to punish us for our sinful square dances with Satan, selfish treatment of the summer girls, and the inhumane treatment of those innocent raccoons. Residents were numb with disbelief at our situation around us, including my own parents who worked an entire week with as little as two hours of sleep a night. The rain was so intense that some rock outcrops of vegetation were completely erased from the face of the earth and never to return due to the vengeance of the storm. The Pakalit River became six feet wider immediately after the storm with many homes, barns, cars, tractors, and wildlife washed away. Everyone pitched in to restore the town back to life except for Victor, who had not been seen since Saturday evening after he nearly strangled me to death and was pulled off by two men in trench coats. Half of the people who attended Coon Dog Day remained in Melrose for at least three days after landslides and down trees blocked several points up and down Highway 176. The only way in and out of town was by rail, and those trains were mostly sold out because of surviving travelers from cities to the north of us. It was reported that Nelson County, Virginia, took the biggest brunt of the storm. That town was swallowed up by the remnants of Camille, with an estimated 630 million tons of water dumped over them over a two-day period. It was said that people could neither see nor breathe in the massive storm. There were even reports of jewelry being washed off people's bodies and all of their money being rinsed away from their homes. Dozens of people, along with their dogs, cats, and livestock, were unaccounted for. Many festival-goers ate leftover food, slept under tattered tents, bathed in the high school gymnasium showers, and escaped the heat of the day on the library floor. Surprisingly, the only buildings that were off-limit to the people in real need were the many churches in our town, which further reinforced my frustration with organized religion. For a noticeable but brief period of time, race, age, political differences no longer mattered. 
everyone realized that we were in this mess together. Blacks stayed in white homes, and whites sheltered together in black homes. Ironically, Gudger Knowles was quoted in the Melrose Monitor as saying, We feel so weak against the magnitude of an event like this. But we're a resilient community and once again a loving family. I only hope that we can just stay that way for just a little while longer. Hattie Mae safely returned home to the relief of her entire family. Both parents held me in their arms and embraced me as if I were one of their own children. Pearly Ann and Reverend Harris fervently claimed that I had saved their precious daughter's life despite my insistence that Hattie had saved mine. My parents and I worked in our store supporting the community as much as we could, never once talking about the events with Victor. In our minds, he was history, probably being held behind bars somewhere in either Henderson, Polk, or Rutherford County. On three occasions, I had dinner with Miss Martha, Carol, and Jane, all saying our final goodbyes, except for John, who seemed in no hurry to part with Jane. While he was enamored with Jane, my attraction to Carol had waned, despite how truly lovely Carol was and how much fun it was to be in her company. I never felt the chemical attraction that I received every single time I was in the company of Hattie Mae. It also became blatantly awkward for me to be served dinner by Hattie Mae and her mother Pearly Ann Harris. Through the balance of time we had left with the girls, until the day they rolled out of town on the Carolina Special, Hattie Mae looked upon me with a confident smile and an occasional wink. It was as if she knew we had something very special together. The skies were clear again, and the town was slowly coming back to life, up until this morning, when my mother was arrested and taken here to the Henderson County Courthouse and charged with the murder of Victor Rathers. Because Victor's body was found in Polk County, my mother would have been under the jurisdiction of Polk County. But since the roads were damaged so badly to the south of us, Henderson County law enforcement took over. A tap on the door behind me broke my concentration as a police officer poked his head into the dimly lit room and asked, They're ready for you, sir. He's asking if y'all are about done. Give me about ten minutes, Officer Smith. And tell him we'll be in there shortly, replied Detective Kenneth Downs of the Hendersonville Sheriff's Office. For at least five hours I provided a testimony that seemed like my entire life story, with all of the events leading up to this very moment. In the room with me was my Uncle Bud, a homicide detective by the name of Kenneth Downs, and a subordinate officer who appeared to be there only for training purposes. Every word of the story that I just told you was recorded onto a slowly moving reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder as my long narrative came to an end. Detective Downs cracked his knuckles, slowly stood up, yawned and stretched out his shoulders back and forth. My uncle smiled at me from across the table and winked. You did good, son, he whispered, not realizing how comical his use of the word son was. Everyone in the room caught the irony, including the young lawyer in training as we all chuckled. Feeling a huge weight off my shoulders, I threw up my own humorous anecdote. Well, Uncle Bud, after much deliberation and forethought, I finally made a decision to change my birth name to Sonny. That comment brought us all to laughter as we rose to our feet and walked towards the door. Detective Downs patted me on my back and said, I'm in full agreement with your uncle on that comment, Rainy Ray. You did good, young man. You did really good. You are one stand-up kind of guy, you know that? And anyone in the world would be honored to call you their own son. My Uncle Bud showed little resemblance to my father, with a lifestyle that was completely different as well. While my father spent his entire life within the confines of a grocery store, Walter or Bud, as he was called, spent most of his off hours fishing the lakes of America. When in court, he was a clean-cut, striking wit with the looks to match. He wore custom-tailored suits, crisp laundered shirts, and expensive ties and shoes. He usually defended high-profile murder cases, celebrity clients, and legal situations that only he could unravel. 
when he was not litigating cases. He could only be described as a lonesome fisherman with an overgrown beard, dusty cowboy boots, sweaty hats, and a strong desire to be alone with the fish. He rolled his own cigarettes and drove around the country in a late model station wagon, keeping an extremely low profile. He was an avid fisherman who fished every major fishing spot in the United States and Canada before the age of 45. While being one of the brightest criminal defense attorneys in North Carolina, I could tell that this case challenged him. And after talking with my mother, who had been quietly relaxing in a jail cell since early this morning, and listening to my entire testimony, he was now even more befuddled as to exactly how Victor wound up not only dead, but really dead. Following my interrogation, which I was asked to explain the cut on my chin, gashes on my knuckles, and the numerous death threats which people reportedly witnessed coming from my mouth as I angrily pedaled my bicycle through our quiet town. That son of a bitch. I'll kill that bastard. That pretty woman and those pretty girls come up here to paradise to relax and this is what happened to them? I hate this damn town. Adding to the confusion surrounding this case was the fact that there was a total of five people, including myself, that had publicly threatened Victor Rathers at one time or another, including my own parents, my mother. I know what the hell you did, you bastard. And if you ever threaten those girls or my son again, I swear to God, Victor, I will kill you. My father. That's enough, Victor. If you ever threaten my boy or wife again, I'll bury this stick in the center of your brain. Amy Rathers. Take this, Elaine, before I kill Victor. And Sheriff Gudger Knowles. Now you listen to me, asshole. If I ever hear any mention of Holbert Cole or anything about my business, I'll burn you down, cousin. I mean, you're dying or all. You got that, Victor? Right now, you're nothing but a bum with a badge. After dinner, I was led into a large meeting room where I was shocked to find everyone involved with Victor, except for my mother and father, sitting in various locations in the room. Hattie Mae was quietly sitting with her parents in the back of the room while Amy Rathers sat in the second row, tenderly holding the hands of Miss Martha. Carol and Jane were positioned directly behind Amy and Miss Martha, each glancing my way. John, along with his mother and father, were sitting in the center of the room, watching as my uncle and I walked from the back of the room to the very front row. After sitting quietly for several awkward moments, a door opened in the front of the room, and an officer stepped in and announced, Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. As we all rose to our feet, a bristly-looking portly man wearing suspenders, a cheap tie, round glasses, and a walrus mustache entered the room with an appearance of purpose. Following him were Detective Downs, his young attorney in training, my mother and father, Debbie Wilson, a stenographer, and Sheriff Gudger Knowles. My parents walked over and joined Uncle Bud and me on the front row as the stenographer took a seat behind the man in suspenders. Gudger strolled to the back of the room with a smirk on his face and stood in the corner, casually leaning against a window. He was rotating a thick rubber band on the outside of his index fingers on both hands, probably trying to suppress his anxiety. My mother reached over and squeezed my hand and gave me a kiss on the cheek. She appeared fresh, upbeat and confident, as if she were aware of something I was not. Have a seat, folks, the man said as he sat down and placed his thick leather briefcase and a copy of the Citizen Times on the table in front of him. Well, now, let the records show that my name is E.L. Wells, the Assistant Attorney General for the state of North Carolina. And, well, hell, I expect some of you may know Debbie here behind me taking notes. Let the records also note that I've had no conversations with any of you all here prior to the beginning of this uh, record, except for Detective Downs and his young assistant. Also let the record note that right now I need to inform most of everyone in this room, and I expect you know who you are, that you have the right to remain silent and retain counsel. You should also know that whatever you say here tonight will be taken down and may be used against you, in the court of law. Few people seemed impacted by that statement, 
except for Gudger, who appeared to be perspiring. Mr. Holford, do you have an attorney, sir? No, my father quietly answered. How about you, Mrs. Rathers? Have you hired an attorney? No, Amy Rathers quietly answered. Mrs. Smith, I understand that a Mr. Hayden Lake from the state of South Carolina has offered to help assist you in this case as well. Is that true, ma'am? Oh, Lord, no, Miss Martha said as my mother giggled under her breath. Mrs. Holford, I'm fully aware that you've retained Mr. Walter Bud Holford here as your counsel. How about you, young lady? Miss Harris, have you retained an attorney? No, sir, Hattie May quietly answered. Sir, my mother asked, would you please excuse me? Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Please let the record note that Bud Holford will be assisting not only Hattie May Harris, but anyone else in this room who finds it necessary for the need of an attorney. Uh, with the exception of our Sheriff Gudger Knowles, of course. Well, ma'am, I expect that Bud is quite capable of handling this case, but I hardly think that will be necessary, given the complexities of this case. I also didn't expect that any of y'all would have enough time to consider an attorney either, because this case is just one big old tangled mess. Folks, when I first read this story in this paper, I said to myself, what in the name of good Christ, excuse my language, Debbie, is going on in your little town to the south of us. And I was prepared to sit right here and talk about what happened to this man who was assaulting women and impersonating an officer until sunup tomorrow morning. But what I'm realizing now is there's just no way your solicitor down there in Polk County will ever have enough material to go on to successfully prosecute this case. Now, after talking to Detective Downs here and listening to much of the testimony by this young man sitting down here on the front row, I've come to the conclusion that the only person in the room that could be remotely responsible for the death of Mr. Rathers would be this boy right here, <gasps> Rainy Ray Holford. Why? What? Who? Now, settle down, people. No We're not going that far. Because even he would have a very tough time convincing anyone that he ended Mr. Rather's life, even though Mr. Holford and Miss Harris could have been the last people to see Mr. Rather's alive. You see, folks, we still can't determine a time and a place of death, and we're still waiting to see if we can even identify this man's body. Nothing here adds up, especially when four out of five of you people sitting in this room, including our local sheriff over there, casually standing next to the window with a grin on his face, are claiming responsibility for the death of Victor Rather's. The only person in this room who's not confessed to killing Mr. Rathers is this boy right here in front of me. Bud, your client, Elaine Holford, is the only person in this entire room who seems the most passionate that she is the one responsible for the death of Mr. Rathers. But even her story doesn't even hold any water, sir. But she will look me dead in the eye with so much conviction and say that she is responsible for Victor Rathers' death. Really? Sure. Uh-huh. Right. How can that be, folks? When even she knows, she couldn't have been in two places at once. A man entered the room behind the stenographer and handed the assistant attorney general what appeared to be a report of some sort. He whispered something in E.L.'s ear and stepped to the side. Bud, could you come up here, sir, just for a moment so I can have a sidebar with you? Absolutely, sir. Both spoke quietly together for a few minutes. Thank you, George, Yell said, nodding with approval. My uncle returned to his seat and pondered the situation as everyone sat quietly. Hmm. Yell quietly put the paper down and stared at the entire crowd. Folks, George Counts here is our deputy coroner. And he's just provided me with a report that states that they slash we are unable to determine the exact identity and cause of death of who we all believe is Mr. Rathers. Now, Debbie, and all you ladies here, I'm going to ask that you brace yourself for what I'm about to tell you next. You see, the reason George here was unable to fully identify the body of who we all believe is Mr. Rathers is because every single finger on both of his hands are missing, oh, Lord. Oh, along Lord. with all of his teeth. Oh, oh. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, my God. Oh, Lord. Oh. It's the damnedest thing I've ever seen in my entire career. A mangled body found at the bottom of the Saluda grade, 
and no way to determine who in the Sam hell he is. I have my suspicions as to what's going on here, and I expect y'all might as well. But we're not going to be able to determine what happened to this man anytime soon. And I also expect that we may never find out exactly what happened to our Victor Rathers. Because of the fact that we have several of you folks in this room claiming the responsibility for the death of Mr. Rathers, no body, no time and place of the crime, and an overwhelming possibility that Mr. Rathers might have even died as a result of being struck by a train. I'm not going to pass this down to your solicitor down in Polk County. Why? Because he, or she, sorry, Debbie, will have nothing but horse crap to work with, and I'll be damned if I want to see your county spend so much time and resources trying to piece this mess together. Now, people, I want to warn you about something. Falsely admitting a high crime of murder to gain some sort of notoriety for yourself like perhaps your local sheriff over there standing next to the window might be trying to do. Or even if your motivations are to protect the well-being of this young man right here, you need to take a step back right now, because if you continue this nonsense, you will be charged with obstruction of justice. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, with the exception of Elaine Holford, Rainy Ray Holford, and Gudger Knowles, you're all free to go. I felt a huge sigh of relief in the entire room as a police officer opened two large doors in the back of the meeting room and tried to issue everyone out. But to my surprise, everyone in the room remained seated, with all eyes pinned on E.L. and myself. Well, now, I had planned to talk to these individuals in more of a private setting, but it appears that that's not going to be possible. Sheriff Knowles, please approach the bench. Slowly, Gudger walked up to the center aisle of the room and stood before E.L., still fidgeting with his rubber band around his fingers. Mr. Knowles, I seem to want to know if you know more about Victor Rathers and the numerous assaults on the ladies in your community. But you're not going to tell me, are you? Gudger stood silently, not wanting to look at E.L., my mother, or Miss Martha. Well, I didn't think so. Now, you might find it interesting to know that on the night your drunk deputy locked your drunk butt in your own jail cell. He was doing everything in his power to have you removed as sheriff and sent to jail on the grounds of malfeasance. Were you even aware of that, sir? Gudger stood still, fumbling with a rubber band in his hands, and said nothing. And I believe he might have been successful had he not met with his untimely death. Now, I don't have the authority to remove you as sheriff, but I do have the authority to direct the North Carolina Division of Alcohol Beverage Control and the Department of Revenue to keep an eye on you, sir. And I have the authority to ask them to look into your behavior and exactly how you've earned all your money over the last six years. I tell you, Sheriff, you're a smart fella. Don't get too smart. I'm a smart fella, too. You understand me, Mr. Knowles? Yes, sir. Gudger stood in silence. For the first time in my life, I saw him look humbled as he stared down at the floor. E.L. just sat there looking at Gudger, tapping the tips of his fingers together on both hands. He then looked down at my mother, Miss Martha, and then Hattie Mae, as if he wanted to hang Gudger Knowles right there in the room. Sir... For all the innocent women in your town who fell victim to Mr. Rathers, I can only say this to you, sir. Shame on you, Sheriff. You're excused, sir. And with that, Gudger left the room. And now to you, Elaine. I know full well how much you feel the need to protect your boy. But admitting to a crime you did not commit would be the wrong way to help him. And that goes for your husband and others in this room. Your actions are dishonest, self-serving, and wrong. You make my job and everyone's job in law enforcement that much more difficult. Now, can I get an agreement here? I noticed everyone in the room, most especially my mother, nodding their heads in agreement. 
He then directed his attention towards me. Rainy Ray, after reviewing your testimony and having a long conversation with Detective Downs, I feel the need to tell you that I'm impressed with you, sir. To the extent you've gone to protect your mother here and the other women in your town is nothing short of astounding. Now, I can only hope that you and everyone else in this room can get back to the business of the world and move on with your lives. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, you're all now excused. After we returned home from Hendersonville, we shared the last of our three-layer Neapolitan ice cream. My father conveniently disappeared to their bedroom, leaving my mother and I in the kitchen together alone. We were putting up the last of the dishes when my mother turned to me and said, Come over here, Rainy Ray. Come over here, boy, now. She pulled my body against hers and held me tight. Oh, my God, Rainy Ray, she said, pressing her fingers into my scalp as she wept. Her embrace grew stronger as her tears exploded against my face. Rainy Ray, I'm so glad you're safe. I thought I was going to lose my mind when you left that house with Hattie May. I still have nightmares of Victor killing you. Her embrace continued, as if she had much more to share with me. Rainy Ray, you need to know something, and you need to know this right now. Your father is that man in my bedroom. Do you understand me, Rainy Ray? For a few seconds, I couldn't even look her in the face. Look at me, son. You were conceived. You were formed. And you were born through the love, soul, and spirit of me. And that man in the other room, right here, Rainy Ray, in this very home. Mom, why was Victor so convinced that he was my father? Because as much of a selfish and evil person he was, he was a stupid person too, and a fool. What do you mean? I mean that he was ignorant, son. He was untaught, unschooled, untutored, and untrained on the very basics of life. Rainy Ray, Victor never even finished the ninth grade and was functionally illiterate. Really? Son, how long do you think it takes from conception to delivery to birth a human being? What do you mean? When a woman becomes pregnant, how many months does it take for that child to be born? Even though I was a virgin, I knew the answer to that question. Nine months? Precisely, son. Forty weeks, Rainy Ray. Forty weeks. Now, I'm going to tell you something. But I've only told your father. I'm thinking, what in the world is she going to shock me with now? Victor raped me on, of all days, my birthday, August 25th, 1949. Upon that recollection, she winced and choked up. It's all right, Mom. You don't need to tell me anymore. I tried to give her a hug, but she was too deep into her story to have any extra stimulation. Rainy Ray... When were you born? May 20th, 1952. Now, do those numbers add up to you, Rainy Ray? Well, no, Mom. Well, neither did they add up for Victor Rathers, who had no concept of human development or how long it takes to develop a full-term baby in a woman's womb. As wrong as he was, he was convinced that he got me pregnant and gave birth to you, even though that was impossible. Mom? What, Rainy Ray? Why did you never tell me any of this? Well, I should have, son. In fact, I should have told everyone in this damn town, but I didn't. Maybe if I had, at least three other women might have not been raped by that man. And with that, she collapsed in my arms. I was a coward, Rainy Ray. But even more, I didn't want everyone in this community to look at me and say, Oh, look. There's the woman who was raped by Victor Rathers. After a long pause, my mother looked at me. She appeared as if she was asking me for forgiveness. My strong, beautiful mother was finally at a loss for words. I know, Mom. And I understand. I so love you, son. And I so much love you, Mom. Stars look down 
and laugh at me I ought to take a bow Don't have to tell them Life's hard sometimes There's one falling now Nobody here beside me I can talk about it too All the way You've got that cool waters When the fever runs high You've got that look of love light in your eyes Chapter 18 And I was in strange emotion Until you call me down Took a little time, but you calm me down. Wilfred Holford was third generation Melrose, North Carolina, making me a fourth generation citizen of a town I had become thoroughly disgusted with. I knew a lot about the history of Melrose, only because I had a habit of reading anything that was put before my nose, and also because most of the stores in our town plastered pictures of our past everywhere. Our town's historic appetite was so profound that it prevented us from moving forward into a new era. I was forced to examine scrapbooks of the old-timers in town who hoarded them as if they were made of gold. On and on I listened to the exaggerated stories of our white ancestors who built the railroad and forged our town by their own hands. But with all of the knowledge I gained from my constant history lessons on land grants, drunk law enforcement officials, religious bigotry, and family squabbling, I finally reached the conclusion that I didn't give a damn about Melrose. I mean, just how exciting can a town be with nothing more than churches, a candy store, and a western auto? I considered our community as a group of mountain people who came out of the woods only because a train depot was built here. If it were not for the railroad, I think our ancestors would have remained in the woods sipping on their corn liquor and eating raccoon. While we were a friendly community and a religiously blind town as well, Melrose was also a highly segregated and prejudicial town, dating back far before the construction of the railroad. So prejudiced were we that black people were not accepted into our hospitals or laid to rest in our local cemeteries. Blacks could not buy milkshakes in our soda shops, check out books in our public libraries, or set foot into any of our restaurants unless they worked there as a waiter, cook, busboy, or dishwasher. We were a law-abiding citizenry that happily complied with the Jim Crow laws of the day, which were a set of constitutional provisions that mandated segregation. Wealthy Caucasians like Charles Pearson and Thad Coleman were given all the credit for building the steep tracks that soared up the grade through our town and beyond. When it was the black folks that lifted the heavy railroad ties and pounded the thick spikes through the wood and into the ground, nearly all of the workforce working their bodies to death were comprised of black convict labor deployed from prisons in Columbus, North Carolina, and elsewhere. Most of the money that was meant to go to them went back to the prisons from where they came, yielding them close to nothing. Between 1876 and 1878, the 10% of the workforce who perished on the job were black, with only a single white casualty. Black convict labor was one step away from slavery. Blacks were killed by nitroglycerin blasts, shot while trying to escape, or taken by disease. 
Others were killed by being caught in the middle of labor disputes between the prisons and the railroad. We've come a long way since then, but we still have an awfully long way to go, as far as I'm concerned. Even today, black people appear remarkably out of place as they walk through our tiny town, appearing as if they have some sort of contagious disease. To be brutally honest with you, all I ever yearned for was leaving Melrose for destinations unknown. Any place would be better than here. I had a few black friends back then, with many I've come to love, even though there was no way I could associate with them within the town limits of Melrose. In fact, one of the reasons Reverend Harris was so fond of me, even though I hit his daughter in the head with a rock, was because I spent a lot of time over on their side of the tracks. I had, and continue to have, a deep appreciation for black people, not because of sympathy, but because I connected with them, even more than the white kids in our town. I had one male friend growing up, Jonathan Roy. My shortage of companionship was not because I was shy or unfriendly, but because I worked all of the time. We had two black kids who worked in our store who were Hattie Mae's brother, and we got along well. Fred Harris was the taller of the two, and the shorter one was a kid named Clifford. He was nothing but cool. These guys had cool written all over them in the way they walked, talked, and lived their lives. And even though our town treated blacks like subhumans, they still loved to work in our store and I'd often go over to their house and hang out with them. While the sheriff and the townspeople did much cotton to me spending my time in colored town, I didn't give a damn. Can you even imagine? Black people were relegated to their own geography, known as colored town. Not Melrose, colored town. But did we white folks stop there? No! Many proud black landowners lost their land to selfish town officials, most notably Reverend Harris, who came very close to losing the land that he was to build his church upon. Colored Town always welcomed me in with no questions asked. They loved me and I loved them. Why? Because they treated me like I was somebody. They cooked the best food, sang and danced, and just loved one another. Oh, and if you want to talk about faith, <laughs> their churches swelled with the Holy Spirit. On a few occasions, I went to church with Fred and Clifford and loved every second of it. I was amazed with their powerful connection with the Almighty, regardless the color of the Almighty. While John and I shot spitballs from the balcony of our church and fell asleep during the sermon, I considered it entirely possible that God was shining down upon their church. Even though the white churches in our community claim to have invented gospel music, the churches in Colored Town owned gospel music. It was on those streets in Colored Town I noticed Hattie Mae changing from a skinny, shy girl in pigtails into something completely amazing. It was as if overnight she exploded into Haley's Comet right before my eyes. I thought, who in the hell is she? Is that Hattie Mae Harris? Wow. Every time I played ball with those kids, I'd keep my eyes open for Hattie Mae, hoping to God that I would have a chance to see her, but never admitting the slightest interest in her. Fred and Clifford knew about the horrible rocking incident because they were standing right there when it all happened, but for some damn reason they forgave me. But oh my God, Hattie Mae. I could not get over her. She was like one huge smile emanating from a striking figure that was charged with so much energy that I felt nervous to even stand near her. And she knew the impact that she had on me. Oh boy, did she ever know it. Often, I'm sure she flirted with me just to make me squirm. And wow, did I ever squirm with both excitement and confusion because I knew there was going to be no way in hell that we would ever have a public friendship, much less one of a romantic nature. I related so much to the black community that one night I had a dream that I, in fact, was black. In my dream, I gazed down at my hands and felt so proud of them. I savored the color of my skin so much 
that I was disappointed to wake up and find them white again. I tried in vain to reclaim those black hands in another dream, but never could. Another reason I couldn't really connect with Milrose may have been because of the fact that my mother was a summer girl who came from a wealthy family. My mother never talked about money at all. To her, wealth was something that she never disclosed to anyone, most especially me. She once told me that any tiny inheritance she might receive would be only used for emergency money for when my mother and father reached their golden years. I once asked my mother how much money she had, thinking that she was the sole beneficiary of her parents' wealth. And that was a mistake. None of your business, son. Now get back to work. I never asked her again. During the three years following the death of Victor, I constantly wondered how Victor was killed. Often I experienced nightmares of Victor choking the life out of me, and the many other women who had been raped by the same hands that were wrapped around my neck. I could never get myself to imagine the actions Victor took upon my mother, nor could I let myself go there when the activity of rape was something I could never visualize. My inability to not even imagine it might have saved my sanity. But who were those dark men in trench coats that appeared out of nowhere, yanking Victor's rabid madness off my suffocating body, down the hill, and away to that black automobile? Were they law enforcement officials? Random thieves in the darkness? Or people even more evil than Victor was? The tracks were known to attract goons any day or night. Organized thieves murderers and all-out crazies lived on the tracks just waiting for anyone to pass by. While Victor's death was gruesome, it was curious as well. He'd not been robbed or beaten to death out of rage, but merely terminated in a semi-surgical way and meant to be found clinically unidentifiable. After Victor's passing, three other women came forward and confided in my mother about being raped by Victor. They each ventilated their nightmares around our kitchen table as my mother, Amy Rathers, and Miss Martha quietly listened. Our home became a sounding board for the victims of rape. They met at our house on a weekly basis while developing a strong kinship. Even though they appeared to be on the road to recovery, my mother included, they all seemed to have a distance to go. I witnessed a tight-knit group of survivors becoming soul sisters. Miss Martha returned to Charleston only briefly to terminate her marriage to her selfish husband and bury her mother who'd finally passed away. She was now back in town and actively dating, of all people, Larson Darnell. Gudger Knowles resigned from his position as sheriff after being convicted of tax evasion. He lost his big house up on Greenville Street to the Department of Treasury and the North Carolina Department of Revenue. He was now working as a manager of a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Columbus, North Carolina. Carroll was off at Duke University studying to become a veterinarian. Casey and Amy Rathers joined forces to raise the Railhouse Diner into a new level of service and cleanliness. My mother gave every bit of the moonshine on the roof of the jail to Bill Rag to distribute as he saw fit. Both my parents and John's parents received a jar of corn liquor wrapped in a cute little gift bag every Christmas. The vault was permanently closed and never used after it was deemed inhumane by the United States Department of Justice. A safer, more suitable jail was constructed and the sheriff's office was reclassified as a medium-security police department jail. On the day I turned 21, Hattie and I walked through the front door of my home into a surprise birthday party, and the rusty old town that I disliked since childhood began to look golden. I felt like I was on cloud nine as I proudly walked through the front door, hand-in-hand hand with Hattie Mae Harris who I considered to be the most beautiful girl in the United States of America. It was as if everyone in the room thought I was the luckiest man in the world, including Hattie's parents, who were sharing a hearty laugh with my father, Dr. Roy, 
and John's mother. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, birthday dear Rainy Ray. 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 Happy birthday to you. The champagne was flowing in my home. It was filled with everyone who was important in my life. Most especially Hattie Mae, who I'd been dating since our night on the southbound train. Russell was in the backyard grilling ribs with Larson Darnell, who had since become friends and joined forces painting homes together in town. John was sitting with Jane on our backyard patio, sipping draft beer, which was provided by Dr. Roy. Cheers, my friend, John said, as he handed Hattie and I two cold mugs of beer. As the food was being served, everyone sat around our backyard, with their plates in their laps, enjoying the evening. It was now my time to make an announcement, as Hattie and I tapped our glasses together. Here, here, everyone. Can I please have your attention? To my mom and dad, and to everyone here on this momentous birthday, I guess I'm now a man, right? Hey, Rainy Ray, don't let it go to your head. I'm right behind you, buddy. I'll become a man on June 5th, so watch out, John said, as he raised his glass and pulled Jane closer into him. Not so fast, Junior. This is my toast, sir. But with all sincerity, folks, thanks so much for being here on this fine evening. You know, as I look around at your wonderful faces, I can only say thank you so much for being here tonight. Cheers. Now, to my mom and dad, I can only say thank you for bringing me into existence on that rainy day so long ago and bringing me home to live in this wonderful house 21 years ago today. Here, here. Hey, Dad, do you want me to tell everyone here why I was named Rainy? My mother turned to my father and kissed him on his cheek as my dad shook his head. And to this beautiful woman standing right next to me, I said as I held Hattie close to me, I'm so excited to tell everyone here tonight that Hattie Mae Harris and I are now officially engaged to be married. The crowd exploded with applause as my parents, along with Hattie's mother and father, moved in to embrace us. One year from today, we plan to be married at the St. Matthew's Church under the loving direction of Reverend Harris. It would be our pleasure to welcome you in as a member of our family, son. After which I choked up and could no longer speak. Hattie, would you please take it from here? I don't think I can come up with any more words. Well, I'm not going to tell y'all how this boy and I first met, but I will tell you he knocked me off my feet. She reached over and gave me a big hug and kissed me on my cheek while I turned a dark shade of red. But you know what, people? I knew even back then that I was somehow going to end up with this young man. Oh, y'all, he was so cute back then. He was and continues to be the most touching and beautiful young man I could ever dream of spending the rest of my life with. Thank you, Elaine and Wilfred, for creating this young man on that beautiful rainy day so long ago. Who would have ever dreamed the two babies born just a month apart on separate sides of the track would be standing here today announcing their plans to be married. I love you, Rainy Ray Holford. Oh my God, Hattie Mae Harris. Thank you so much for saying yes to being my wife. We held each other and kissed as I felt tears falling from Hattie's eyes. It was entirely so touching to me as I expected it would be for everyone watching that moment. The phone was ringing in the kitchen as my mother turned and ran into the garage to pick up the extension. Hello? Why, yes. Yes, he is. Would you like to speak with him? Hey, Rainy Ray, come over here, son. I've got an old friend on the phone who would like to wish you happy birthday. Hello? Hey, Rainy Ray, I understand you're a big man now. I'm waiting for you to come up here to see if you can pick me up off the floor. I bet you a $10 bill you can't. Hi, Mr. Pepper. I want to thank you for calling. It's Jerry to you, Rainy Ray. My father once told me that only a few people could call Jerry Pepper by his first name. I'm not sure why that was, but I felt honored to be a member of an elite club. Yes, sir, Mr. Pepper. I mean, Jerry. <laughs> hey. Hey, look here, Rainy Ray. Happy birthday to you. I hope you enjoy your big day. Oh, well, your mom tells me that you're now a betrothed to be married. Is that right? Yes, sir. Well, good for you. 
So you're now a uh, promised man, right? Yes, sir. I expect I am. Well, I'm sure she's a gem. You know, I'm friends with her mom and dad. Did you know that, Rainy Ray? No, Jerry, I didn't. The Reverend's a good man. He's a good, good man. I helped him out one time uh, with some uh, land issues back when he was building his church. The man upstairs don't make people like that man anymore. You know that? Yes, I agree with you, Jerry. And his wife. What a pearl she is. Thus the name. Pearly Ann. All right, I'm going to let you get back to your um, festive occasion. Thanks, Jerry. Hey, Rainy Ray, you need to bring your bride up here one day to see me. I'd love to see her again. The last time I remember seeing her, she was just a tiny thing. And hey, tell her I got ten bucks to say you can't pick me off the floor. So you better practice up, Rainy Ray. Now, go have fun and take care of your mom and dad. And you know what? I'm always looking after you people. I consider you part of my own family. Wow, I thought. Thinking about the extended family in Brooklyn. Thanks for calling, Jerry. Yeah, yeah. Now put your mom back on the phone and let me say goodbye to her. My mother was leaning against the garage door with what looked like an all-knowing smile. She took the phone, turned away, and quietly whispered something, and then said goodbye. Hey, Rainy Ray, come back here for a second, son. Sure, Mom, what's up? Go get us both a soda out of the icebox over there so we can have our own little private toast. Why a soda, Mom, when we could have a glass of champagne? Because I think soda is much more fitting for this moment, son. I thought, okay, this is weird. I went back into the garage and opened up the door of our old refrigerator. It was an old Frigidaire that was probably the first appliance my parents ever bought once they got married. It was at least as old as I was, maybe even older. It stopped working one time a long time ago until my father kicked the hell out of it. The damn thing started back up and hasn't stopped since. I think it's afraid of being kicked again. Okay, what do you want, Mom? We got Coke, Pepsi, uh, we only have one root beer, forget Orange Crush, and I'm sure you don't want a Yoo-Hoo. None of those. Take a look way in the back of the bottom shelf on the left. Right, I thought, dropping down to my knees. It was at that second... I put it all together about Victor. Placed side by side in the back of the refrigerator were two bottles of Dr. Pepper. Never do I ever remember having a Dr. Pepper in our house, much less in the refrigerator. I looked back at my mother, who was standing in the doorway with her arms crossed, smiling. Now what's this about this, uh, Victor Rathers? Elaine, you tell Wilfred. And if any one of those Jim Bonas give you any trouble at all, I want you to pick up the phone and give me a call. I'll come down there personally and give them the what for. Yep, that's what I'm waiting for right about now, Rainy Ray. I opened both bottles and walked back over to my mother who was leaning against the door jamb. She was smiling and looking at all the activity in the backyard. Did you call him, Mom, that night when all that stuff was going on? No, son, I did not. Well, then how did it happen, Mom? And why did you claim responsibility for Victor's death? Every one of us claimed responsibility for the death of Victor Rathers. Let's just say that the man upstairs was keeping a protective eye on us all that night. Happy birthday, Rainy Ray. Here's to Dr. Pepper. The end. Something goes wrong. The first to admit it, first to admit it, last one to know. Something goes right, I'm likely to lose it. It's apt to confuse me, it's such an unusual sign, I swear I can't. I can't get used to something so good, something so good. Epilogue. On March 4, 1974, my mother bought the Melrose Monitor and became the publishing editor. She was determined to bring it back to what she thought it should be. The circulation numbers for the Monitor went on to become the largest of any small-town newspaper in the state of North Carolina. Kevin Powers stayed on in sales. Selling advertising is what he should have been doing in the first place. Jonathan Roy married Jane Ann Holbrook exactly one year after we got married. 
He went on to become an OBGYN, while Jane became a registered nurse and worked in John's office. They had two children, and they live in Flat Rock, North Carolina. My father continued on as the owner of Holford Grocers, but eventually handed over all of the daily management to Hattie. Martha Middleton married Larson Darnell and became a successful real estate broker. She is still as beautiful as ever and is a constant fixture in our home. Carol Smith married an electrical engineer and moved to Newport, Rhode Island. She built a successful veterinary practice there and had five children. Rarely do I see her, but I often think about her and hope that she's happy. I became a full-time editor and feature writer for the Melrose Monitor. I was lucky to write one national bestseller. My Uncle Bud Holford lost my Aunt Doris to ovarian cancer when I was just a young child, and he lived the life of a single man for many years. After the events with Victor, he began dating Amy Rathers, and they planned to be married in the spring. I tried to return the Beretta to Amy, but she didn't want to have anything to do with it. I now keep it in a safe place, and I know how to use it now, thanks to John. A few days after the storm, John and I retrieved the old Harley, which is now sitting in the back of John's garage, wasting away. He swears he's going to tune it up one day, but I'll believe that when I see it. Coon Dog Day continues on, growing larger and larger every year. I don't swear dance anymore, nor will I ever again, but I've grown to enjoy Coon Dog Day. I've come to realize that it takes a lot less energy to love things than to hate and growl about things. Hattie and I now have two children, Amber May, a beautiful little girl with the same sparkling energy as her mom, and a feisty little boy who keeps us all on our toes. He's our little wild child who seems to be interested in everything. His full name is Stormy Harris Holford, and I expect you can guess how that name came about. Often when my kids fall asleep in my lap, late at night, I look over at Hattie and smile. When she's awake, she lovingly gazes back at me with pride and winks. And when she's asleep, I just sit there and admire her pretty face and think about just how magical it is to be married to her. I ask myself, did I win the lottery? Then I look down at both my kids, sleeping peacefully in my arms, and thank God and Mother Earth for placing these precious beings in our lives. I think about the world they will grow up in and the challenges they will face. I plan to teach them well and to try my very best to change our little slice of the world into a better place. And I believe that I will be able to do just that through the power of my own words. I look down at their pretty faces and their lovely little black hands and think back to that wonderful dream I once had. I can't help but to whisper aloud, Oh, those beautiful black hands. They're now part of me. Once again. They got a wall in China That's a thousand miles long To keep out the foreigners that made it strong And I got a wall around me That you can't even see Took a little time to get next to me when Something goes wrong, I'm the first to admit it First to admit it, the last one to know when Something goes right, I'm likely to miss it It's apt to confuse me Cause it's such an unusual sight I swear I can't I can't get used to something so good Something so good Something so good 